all right so before we learn about let's get the context right so we are trying to learn about so what is abap abap stands for advanced business application programming abap so it's a programming language right <laughs> great what is a programming language if you are already aware of programming just skip this chapter but if you are not please stay and you'll understand some of the fundamentals of abap so we know that abap is a programming language and for those of you without programming background you have to first understand what is a programming language it's like any other language english german french spanish it mostly resembles english so if you are not from an english background you'll have a tough time doing abap and that's not a big deal if you know the basics of english that's more than enough now the question is if you know english is abap easy to learn i would say yes now what does abap stand for advanced business application programming the key is business application what do i mean by that 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 means that it's not a general purpose programming language like java or c for example java can be used to write games think of minecraft right that's written entirely in java or java can be used to write apps on android in fact the entire android operating system runs on java or take your c language the windows operating system that i'm running on it's built almost on c the c language your iphone is built on a language that's a variant of c objective c abap on the other hand cannot do any of that it's designed only to run in the confines of an sap environment and it's designed specifically to run business application programming once again i didn't answer the question business application programming w what is so special about or what is different about business application programming say a company like philips has implemented sap software to run their uh, internal operations right we all know philips imagine this scenario the regional manager in chicago philips chicago wants to know the total sales to date of a particular customer say how many light bulbs have been sold to a customer say walmart how does he do it so he logs on to the system go to logistics sales and distribution go to master data information systems business partner sales summary and then enter your customer number say 1400 whatever that customer is enter some other data that's related to the sales specific territory right assume 1400 is walmart here and we are trying to search uh, all the orders that he has placed ever since right do you get that this is the annual sales 50 million and uh, the total number of employees and the telephone number blah 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 it's called a fact sheet but do you get the point right this is an example of a business application let me take another example say the sales manager in novartis the pharma company wants to know all the sales of a particular drug from day 1 how does he do it so you go back and there is a program for that enter 1400 assume 1400 is walmart and click enter let's say the drug is uh, uh, a painkiller right 
it's coded as M01, just for example, right? And these are all the sales that have happened for that material M01, which is, let's say, a painkiller. You get the idea, right? Business application programming. The point that I'm trying to make here is ABAP is a business application programming language. Now, you might have a question here. If you do a transaction on, say, Amazon.com, isn't that an example of business? Can ABAP run behind the scenes to take that order? In all probability, not. To understand that, you have to orient your mindset to understand business-to-business -business scenarios. What do I mean by that? B2B as opposed to B2C. This is kind of diminishing fast, the difference between B2B and B2C. But SAP as a software is specifically built from the ground up for B2B transactions. There are specific versions of SAP that can run B2C, that can do B2C. It runs in banks, it runs in retail outlet. But for the most part, SAP is designed to be a B2B application. So you have to change your mindset to look at business and understand business from a B2B perspective. The reason why I say that is in your day-to-day -day life, you never do B2B, right? Unless you are a businessman, you never do B2B, right? You take your car, go to your office, work for eight hours, or go to your college, go to Starbucks, have a coffee, go buy a house, or go to a party, like a disco. None of this stuff is B2B. This is all B2C. Even the purchases that you make on Amazon are B2C. They are not B2B. So business to consumer. These are all retail end user transactions. It could be e-commerce. It could be retail. It could be uh, uh, you know, on the shop floor. All of these are retail transactions. Like I said, even buying a home is a retail transaction because you are an individual customer. You are not a business. Right? So, if you don't have any job experience, typically, you know, you wouldn't understand B2B. Now, does that mean that Starbucks does not implement SAP? I don't know specifically about Starbucks, but it could very well implement SAP. If it's not doing that on the counter, where you go place your order for a latte, where is it being implemented? An example of a B2B transaction for Starbucks could be something like this. So there is Starbucks and uh, there's Bank of America. And Starbucks uh, installs coffee machines in Chicago's Bank of America branches, right? They supply the coffee machines, they supply the inventory like coffee beans, creamers, so on and so forth. And it's not a B2C transaction. This is an example of a B2B transaction. You get the point? Starbucks is a business. Bank of America is a business. It's a bank. It's a business. So it's a transaction from one business to another. Or you can take the procurement of coffee by Starbucks. Say Starbucks needs coffee beans. Where does it get it from? It doesn't get it from the individual farmer in Kenya or India, right? It goes through cooperatives, it goes through bulk buying procedures. And ultimately, that's again business to business because Starbucks is buying coffee beans from some vendor who can supply coffee beans to Starbucks. And that is a business in itself. So business to business. So these are all examples of business to business transactions. And SAP, like I said, is specifically built to deal with B2B transactions. That doesn't mean you can't use SAP in a retail transaction. No, that's definitely not the case. For example, I have worked as an SD consultant in, in for an auto major in Germany where, you know, this, this car company, it's a major car company in Germany, and they have dealerships, right? So many different dealerships. Each dealership will have a counter, a computer thing that's connected to their main server and here is SAP and 
every time a customer like you and me go to the dealership car dealership place an order it goes and resides in sap that order is placed actually in sap but the front end the screen that you see doesn't look anything like what you have seen just now with in sap it's totally different it's all on the web so the interface is different but the data and processing still is done out of sap so what's the point i'm trying to make the point is erp software like sap it's not just sap in fact sap oracle apps jd edwards you know there are you know quite a number of erp softwares enterprise resource planning software all of them are designed specifically for b2b and it's not used typically to sell lattes or cappuccinos or sandwiches those are typically b2c if i can summarize all that's there in abap everything to learn in abap in one slide this would be it i know you are not in a mood to go through all these boxes at this point it's all greek and latin but this is the essence of everything that's there in abap different sections reports interfaces conversions enhancements forms workflows so on and so forth now the reason why i am showing you this slide is not to scare you but to tell you that it's a vast subject and we are not going to progress this in a linear fashion if you take a conventional abap course there is a particular sequence in which they go for example they start with the data dictionary don't worry about what it is at this point we're going to get to that the point i am trying to make is there is typically a certain sequence that a conventional abap training course goes through like starting with this and then they go here 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 right but that's not how this course does things this course does not take a linear route instead it goes in a random fashion or at least it seems so it's not a linear way of doing abap we'll roughly follow the pattern the pattern of learning abap in a conventional way but we're going to do something different here what do i mean by that for example starting with day 1 we're going to do we're going to start writing programs after all this is a programming language course right so we will start writing programs each program will teach you a certain amount of skills for example the first hello world program is going to teach you about the abap editor how to name your program how to do comments in your program so on and so forth and the stock list the second program on day 1 is going to talk about how to create horizontal and vertical lines using the right statement again the point being this course is designed to teach you abap in an incremental fashion using programs in a non linear format meaning it's not going to be a straight arrow it's going to be a bit twisted but the intention of doing this is to make learning easy and fun for example data dictionary this topic right here could take 3 uh, days let's say one hour a day or two hours a day three hours learning data dictionary for three hours in my opinion is very boring i don't like that instead what i'm going to do is teach you a bit of data dictionary a bit of operators a bit of variable types first and then we're going to go a little bit into programming flow and then internal tables maybe a bit of open sql and then once you have a framework laid we're going to again go to the data dictionary again go to operators again go to open sql depending on 
what makes things easy to learn. So that's the reason why the first five hours of this course is really left as a free preview. If you have time, please go through the first five hours. If you think this course is for you, take it. If not, I definitely understand. This course might not be cut out for everybody. So make your judgment. I don't want you to lose your money. Go through the first five hours. Decide for yourself if this course is for you or not. Now that we understand how the course is organized, let me give you a quick set of tips on how to make the best of this course. No amount of theory, no amount of videos is going to prepare you to learn about. Practice is the key. No practice, no learning. And typically at the end of every day, I'll put out some exercises. Make sure you do those exercises and take breaks. Don't worry about rushing into things. The reason why I've divided this course into days, day one, day two, day three, day four, is so that you get a perspective on what to learn each day. That doesn't mean that you don't take breaks between days. If you're feeling tired, just take a break. If you're feeling confused, take a break. Go back, practice certain programs, redo the exercises, revisit the videos, revisit the notes. All the notes should be posted at the end of every section. So make sure to rinse and repeat because that's the way you learn programming languages. And once again, like I said, no amount of theory, no amount of looking at the videos is going to make you good at ABAP or any language for that matter. Practice is the key. And in order to practice, make sure you get access to an SAP system. Now, I'm not authorized to provide you SAP access. I don't have the privileges. So that's up to you. You need to get your own SAP access. You can just Google SAP access. Uh, go to the SAP website, you can purchase SAP access for a fixed fee. Please do that and start practicing on the system. The more you practice, the more you get confident. And finally, before you decide on anything, I just want to give you one final word to check really if this course is for you. This course is designed with a fresher in mind just out of college. You know, it's not designed for those experienced consultants, either in SAP, non-SAP. It's not designed for them. It's designed for an absolute fresher. And that's why the course is titled In Plain English. I'll try to make this course as simple as possible and try to use as much English as I can as opposed to technical terms. The goal of this course is to create a learning environment where anybody can learn about. If you're an arts major, you don't know programming, that's fine. You should be able to just take this course because it's all plain English, right? You should be able to take this course and learn about. In order to achieve that, the course is going to be a bit slower. So, like I said, if you're experienced, this course might not be for you. It's going to be slow. There's going to be a lot of repetition. If you can bear with it, take this course. But for freshers just out of college or anybody who is new to IT, this course is going to be awesome because it has a very flat learning curve and you're going to learn really things one step at a time. How do you install the SAP GUI? Your access provider will give you a dump of the SAP GUI. It's just a piece of software that you use to connect to SAP. Think of it like a browser. A browser to the internet is what the SAP GUI is to SAP. Just open that folder, double click on it, go to this folder, Go to GUI, 
windows 32 then click setup click next for practicing SAP MM all you need is the SAP GUI click next if you're satisfied with the location click next again and it's gonna take a while and it should be done in like five minutes close this and your SAP GUI is ready so the next step is you want to get connected to SAP so like it's like clicking your browser opening it and then typing in an address right like Gmail or whatever so the service that you want to connect to will be entered in the browser right so similarly open the SAP GUI and click on this new icon click next and this is the screen where you specify the address of the service or the server that you want to connect to for example I for example I want to connect to an ECC server so just name it as ECC and the application server is the exact location that you want to connect to for example if, if you want to connect to gmail you connect mail.google.com or if you want to connect to cnn you say www.cnn.com right so if you want to connect to your sap server you can either use a domain or an ip address example in my case i'm going, I'm going to connect to a domain ecc6 dot domain dot com this is just an example so your service provider is going to give you the exact IP address of the domain and you have to enter an instance number and that will be given by your provider the ID will also be given by your provider so you need to enter these three pieces ID number and an address click next next and finish this is the simplest way to connect to SAP. So click on login, you put your user ID here and you put your password here. So that's my user ID and that's my password. Hit enter or click the green check mark. Okay, we are now logged on to SAP. Think of it, I don't want you to really understand everything about the SAP GUI at this point. As we start doing transactions, we'll start to know more about subtle things. Think of it like a browser. You move forward and backward in browser, right? You move forward in SAP GUI using transactions. And if you want to go back, there's a back button. The menu over here is very much like your Gmail list of links. You go to Gmail. and say click on circles anything with a hierarchical menu so under circles I have my family friends acquaintances and following if you want to if I want to see my circle of friends what do I do I go to circles and then inside that I click on friends right simple in the same way if you want to look at a transaction so this section here is called the menu path and it's hierarchical just like the way we have seen circles in Gmail so if you want to execute a transaction you got to first select what you're trying to do S say if you want to create a purchase order if you want to look at your circle of friends you go to circles and then friends right so if you want to execute a purchase order you want to go to logistics material management then go to purchasing purchase order and then create so this is the transaction that you execute it's just that there are more levels of hierarchy nothing different and don't worry about understanding all the levels right away it's just not possible you'll just see a pattern when you start doing things now if you go here click on extras and click on settings you'll see that each one of these transactions for example vendor supplying plan known or creation of purchase order there is a technical name associated with that it. it's also called 
as a transaction code. If you want to enable it, you go here and check on this option. So this is how you enable transaction codes or T codes. So check on that, click OK and everything is going to collapse and you start expanding the menu tree and you're going to see the transaction codes. You see the transaction code here? ME21N. So the transaction to execute a purchase order creation is ME21N. So this is an example of a transaction code or T code. So if you want to create a purchase order, there are two ways to do it. One is double click on this in the menu. The system will start to create the purchase order. You enter some details here. Another way to do the same thing is to go to this field over here. It's called the command field and enter the transaction code there. What is the transaction code for this? ME21N, right? So this window is where you're going to enter the transaction code. I'm going to enter ME21N here. Put your cursor there, type in ME21N hit OK. The same thing, right? You are again taken to the purchase order screen. So two ways to execute a transaction. One via the menu path and another via the transaction code. If you keep continuing to use the transaction again and again and again, you can drag the transaction to the favorites section. There are some other things that you need to know about the GUI. And we can learn about them as we go through the rest of the classes. So now that we got our context right, let's see how this course is organized. I'm happy you made it so far along. So let's start our first day in above. The first program that we're going to write is of course a hello world program. Traditionally, that's how things start off in programming languages. All right, so how do you write your about program, the hello world program? So go put your cursor here and type in SE 38. Hit enter or click this green check mark. And this screen is called ABAP Editor. So SAP provides its own editor to write ABAP programs. You can't write it on Notepad or you can't write it in any other environment. ABAP can only be written in ABAP Editor in SAP. And this is how the screen starts up. All right, and what do we do here? We create a program, right? Can we say, hello world? Could that be a name of a program? Let's try that. Click on create. You want to try to create a program called hello-world. And what does it say here? It says, use underscore as a separator meaning the program has a certain type of naming convention you can't have any kind of characters and any kind of it has certain rules that has to be followed don't worry i'm not going to talk about all the rules just two rules no special characters like dashes underscore is okay there are some other special characters that are acceptable, 
but most programs that users write typically either have an underscore or not even an underscore that's the first rule okay that sounds good can we try to create it now create then it says enter the key access key blah 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 do you have an access key you don't right instead of hello underscore world just type in z hello underscore world okay z start with the letter z okay and then click on create it says hello underscore world already exists so somebody has already created that program most of the time the system that you'll be working on is a shared system right sap gives you access to a system but it gives access to many other people to the same system so sap is a shared system many people access the same instance so there's something called as namespace because many people are writing programs simultaneously there can be only one unique name meaning in this case if somebody else writes a z underscore hello world it says it's already taken if you want to check it you can just go to display and as you can see this is already taken somebody has written some piece of code here now we're not going to bother about that program because we don't care we want to write our own hello world so go back click on this green arrow and instead of z hello world have your own little prefix so that nobody treads on your program so the prefix that i'm going to use for all my programs is z z siva and then i'm going to start with for the first day programs i'm going to say 0 1 and for second day programs i'm going to say 0 2 0 3 so that i can clearly pick out what is the program that i want to show you for day one what is the program that i want to show you for day two so on and so forth and zz siva the prefix here ensures that there could be many hello world programs starting with z but i don't think anybody is going to create st something starting with zz siva if your name is joe you can start with z joe and then anything else you want because the probability of somebody else creating the same program same program name is very remote right so i'm going to use this prefix and click on create okay it says i need to give it a title the title of the program is going to be hello world right and then you got to give it a programming type what kind of program is this there are many different kinds of programs and in this case we're going to choose an executable program don't worry about what it means just say executable program and click save and then it throws you another little pop-up and says enter package you don't have to worry about it just click local object okay and then it has written a couple of lines here like like something here and then it says report and then the name of the program that we have given right so go to the end of it hit enter go to the next line and type in write give a space and then use a single quote hello world and then end your single quote and that's it now let's try to execute this program how do you execute it or test it go here and click on this button the one that looks like a zip file click on that and it says something at the bottom what does it say pull this up it says the last statement is not complete it says period missing okay 
which line number is that row number 11 right so row number 11 is this right it's got a gutter here at the left where it shows you all the line numbers starting with one all the way up to whatever be the number of lines you write in this case the 11th line says you're missing a period now do you see a period here at the end so this is one of the rules of above every statement ends with a period okay let's try it again okay this time it works and it says hello world isn't that easy now how hard is this statement write hello world now if you are used to some other programming languages like c or java this should seem very trivial right the word right looks very much like an english word and then a string a statement the key thing to understand here is right is called as a keyword in abap it's part of abap's vocabulary the syntax if you might say now only right works if you want to do something like a print does it work print hello does it work let's try that whoops it says print is not defined check your spelling so meaning the point being sap is trying to say hey i don't understand the word print what are you trying to say because print is not part of abab's vocabulary and abab has a huge set of keywords the vocabulary is very large but not to worry we're going to go there step by step so i'm going to remove the statement just select it delete it and then execute it everything works fine okay that was easy right now can i say write double quote hello dot can i do that let's try it execute and it says the last statement is not complete period missing why does it say that you got a period there right well a double quote in above does not define a statement or, or 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 a sentence or a string everything after the first double quote becomes a comment a comment that above does not bother so if you put a dot here what happens try it execute and it says write statement must be followed by additions so you got to write something you can't just write a blank and if you try to write a hello using a double quote that doesn't work either because everything after a double quote is a comment so what's a comment it's not for sap or abap to interpret it it's for us programmers to make quick notes for example if you're doing a complicated piece of logic do a calculation you can write code for it and then do a little bit of footnotes there saying hey you know what this is the reason why i'm doing this logic or this is how i'm going to talk about this logic in english programmatically it's another story so comments are used extensively in any language the way to write a comment in abap is either start with a star at the very beginning so if you write just look at the way the 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 right statement goes here it's all in blue right now if i go here and put in a star you see it becomes gray all of it becomes gray that means abap is not going to bother about that statement it's not going to look at that statement it doesn't care about that statement because it's a comment it's not meant to be run by the system it's for the eyes of the programmer we'll talk more about comments later but one of the ways to write the comment is to put a star at the very beginning okay we're going to do extensive commenting anytime we start writing complicated logic 
we're going to do commenting because it's easy to do and it makes the life of you easy as a programmer and the programs that you write could be read by many other programmers and makes their life easy as well all right so i'm going to delete that so one way to write a comment is put a star at the very beginning of the line and then everything else in that line becomes a comment or you can do something like this what does this do just put a space put a double quote and say this line prints hello world you see that it's all grayed out right the entire line is grayed out that means ab app is only going to bother itself up until this point after the double quote it's useless for ab app it's just for human consumption right so if you want to start a comment at the very beginning of the line start with a star like this but if you want to put a comment at the middle of the line and then all the way to the end of the line start with a double quote okay these are the two ways in which you can do comment okay all right so let's execute that then we're going to talk about something else called as a syntax check now every time you hit on execute execute this program if there is a problem with the syntax with the language it throws up an error right at the bottom of the screen now you don't have to execute every time you want to check if the program is right syntactically speaking you could click on the syntax checker the one with the two boxes click on that and if everything is okay it says the program is syntactically correct if it's not for example let me do that this is not syntactically correct and if i do this it says okay i've got a problem the last statement is missing a period right okay i commented that again do another syntax check everything is good and the next thing that you do before running a program is to activate that program that button is right next to the syntax checker activate that program and it says which program do you want me to activate and it selects your program automatically you don't have to do anything just click continue if your program is syntactically correct your object or program is activated okay and you can hit execute and then you see that there is a title here called hello world and where does that come from If you go back, click on Go to Properties. You remember this screen, the first screen that we started with. This is where you have mentioned the title "Hello World." Now, now this is where you define the purpose of the program. Now, in this case, it's very simple, "Hello World." But imagine writing a program to show the list of materials that has been sold for the day, right? So, how would you want to put a title for that? material listing by day right that's a valid title typically your titles will be given by the user whatever the user gives you just take it and put it there okay so that's our hello world program so we've learned what is an abap editor how to get there we use se38 that's the transaction code it's called as a transaction code where do you put it you put it here right se38 We have talked a little bit about the naming convention. Your program always has to start with a Z or a Y. Any of those, Z or Y, and then enter a descriptive name like "Hello World," "List of Materials," or "List of Customers," "List of Employees," whatever. Make sure it doesn't have special characters like dash or ampersand. Underscore is allowed. use that to separate words we have seen how to comment code right star at the very beginning comments the entire line and double quotes is the beginning of a comment 
until the very end of the line. You typically use it to start a comment at the middle of the line. We have seen what is a write statement. Write is used to print something on the screen. We have seen what is a program title. Every program needs a title that shows the user what the program does. And then we have seen what is a syntax check. Every program needs to be checked for syntax before being executed. Because if it's syntactically incorrect, the program will fail. So make sure that you do a syntax check before you execute a program. If everything is okay with the syntax, then activate the program. Now the reason to activate a program is a bit involved. There is a lot of dependencies that you have to understand and we're not going to go there yet. Just make sure that you activate the program every time you make changes to the program or create the program the first time. Okay, and then we know how to execute the program. Okay, let's move on to our second program, the stock list. What is a stock list? Imagine a car dealer. The car dealer uh, at the end of the day wants to know how much stock of cars he has. Meaning, if it is a Ford dealer, how many Ford Tauruses do I have? How many Ford Endeavors do I have? How many Ford SUVs do I have? How many Ford whatever, right? So how is it going to look like? If you're going to look at the transaction MMBE underscore old, hit enter and enter a material, say M01. This could be, for example, the make of a car, Ford Taurus. Right? And hit execute. It's going to show you this report in a beautiful format. So this material, M01, has a stock of uh, 1,534, right? Now this is very elaborate, very fancy. We'll not be able to do it at this point. But what we're going to do is create something that's very, very simple, right? The stock list report is going to show a set of columns like this. And it's going to say material and quantity. That's all we need for now. And then material 1, material 2, material 3. And then material 1 quantity is 100, 200, 100, whatever. Right? You get the point. So how do we write this program? Go to SE38. And I'm going to start with ZZ Siba underscore. This is the second program. And then underscore stock underscore list. Okay. Click on create. Give a title stock list. And it's going to be an executable program. Click on save and click on local object. And there you go. Basically a blank screen. Okay. So here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create this section first. Okay. A box with a separator. And then the first box is going to say material. And the second box is going to say quantity. Now, in order to do that, we have to use the write statement. And how are you going to do that? It's not awfully difficult, but it involves a bit of patience in being able to deal with the write statement because the write statement has so many options, and building this box using the write statement is a bit tricky, but not very difficult. The vertical line will be created using the pipe character. Okay. This is typically right above your uh, enter key. Now, it depends on the type of keyboard that you have, but something that looks like 
a vertical pipe okay you might have to use your shift key for that and these horizontal lines are created by dashes or hyphens not underscores but hyphens so what we're going to do is step one write this line okay using you know let's say 20 dashes and then right underneath that in the next line put a pipe okay and then say material and then right after that put another pipe okay and then say quantity write in quantity and then when this ends put another pipe okay and then in the next line do the dashes that should complete your box and then the words inside it let's do it so write and then it's going to be single quote and then a bunch of dashes right and then single quote again dot now what's it going to do let's execute this you see it doesn't show you the, the dashes with breaks in it it shows you an entire line a seamless line right it's going to automatically do that conversion okay so now we know how to write a horizontal line go back then we got to put a pipe character right so this is our pipe character right and then we need a pipe this is a pipe and then and then say material right we want that now let's execute again what does it say it puts your material in the same line it doesn't come back to the next line right because we want the material somewhere here right we, we want that vertical line here not here so we got to force sap to move to the next line okay the way to do that is with a slash okay so you can do right slash dot okay so it moved to the next line right okay then okay we got the pipe here but these two things are not joined together right so we need the vertical line to join with the horizontal line so instead of doing this what you can do is you can put a line here like a slash there and it pushes this line to the next line so if you try to execute it like this you see that the line is going to be aligned properly with the, the horizontal line now don't worry if you don't understand this it's, it's all okay you know we're trying to just play with the right statement you know do horizontal lines type in characters so on and so forth okay then what else do we want to do we also want to write another pipe right so you can go there and put in some spaces and then put another pipe okay and then put in some spaces and you can say quantity and uh, some more spaces and then you can put another pipe and close that string right now let's execute that again okay it's getting close we just need to push this uh, pipe character or vertical line probably one more space right so let's do that just do another space try and execute it is it aligned yes it is right so go back and do another right statement i'm going to take this entire line control c go down and then control v okay execute and then of course we have to put the slash right so go back and then put a slash here like so and execute again did you get your box a box with a separator and then material to the left and quantity to the right okay and underneath that we need the list of materials and quantity here right how do we do that well 
you know how to create these vertical lines now, right? So I'm not going to bother too much about it. I'm just going to focus on how to write n number of materials. You can have 10 materials, you can have 100 materials. Now, we don't have a list of those materials, right, or the quantities yet. So what I'm going to do is, I'm just going to write something here, material 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then quantity 100, 100, 100, 100, all the way 20 times. How do I do that? Okay, go back. So you want to repeat an action 20 times or 30 times, 100 times. You can do it with something called as a do n number of times. In this case, we want to do 20 times. Okay, do 20 times. You're telling about to do something 20 times. What do you want to do? You want to say, right? Say one, just one, right? It doesn't matter. And then after a bunch of space, write, uh, say, 100. Or let's do something like this. Um, write one, and then this is the column on the left, and then write hundred. This is the column on the right. Okay. And then after you're done doing whatever logic you want to do twenty times, you got to end this do because it has to end somewhere. So for that, use what is called as an end do. Right. So SAP is prompting you. So when I type in END, you see this little pop-up here, END, right? You see this little pop-up? That's a suggestion. So ABAP editor is suggesting you, saying, hey, do you want to use this statement and do? Looks like you got to do upstairs here and you might want to end this. If not, you could be writing something else. It's just a suggestion. So what I'm going to do is end do, once that little pop-up comes up, you could type in your tab and then SAP automatically puts the suggestion right there without you having to type in. Okay? And then end do dot. The dot is going to end that statement. So do 20 times. What do I have to do? I have to write 1 and 100 and then end do. So the program is going to basically loop over these two statements 20 times. So anything between the do and end do will be looped over 20 times. Let's see if that works. Execute. Okay. It goes on in the horizontal direction. But at the end of every 1 on 100, you want to loop back to the next uh, line, right? So go back and then type in write slash, right? And let's try this again. Execute. Okay, it's not bad, right? But we don't want 100 here. I would rather have it here, right beneath quantity, right? So, so you want to push this 100 below quantity, a bit to the right. The way to do that, there are multiple ways to do it. But one way is like this, right? Okay, right? say 15 base and then the string 100 right let's see what happens execute you see that the 100 this column is being pushed to the right how much to the right 15 characters that's because we have mentioned 15 so using that write n number of columns and then something else you can write at a specific location right okay now, let's make this a little more interesting. Now, we don't want to just do 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, right? We want to say, at least say 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? We don't have the data for the materials yet, but we could at least do an iteration, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. How do you do that? Well, again, many ways to do it, but we're going to do it a very simple way. We're going to declare a variable. I'm going to talk about it. Don't worry. The way to do that is with the keyword data. So data, and then we're going to do an iteration, right? So we're going to say times, or you could do something like uh, d underscore times. 
just to make yourself clear that this is a data variable not a keyword like times although there is no collision it's easy to put d underscore or p underscore or something like that to differentiate the fact that this is a different kind of variable and then what is it going to hold we are defining a variable a variable is like a box that holds some data what kind of box is it you know not every box can hold everything right what we want to store here is something that denotes a number so we want to do one two three four five six seven eight nine ten right so that's numbers so this is of type this box is going to go and hold something of type integer and the way to declare that is by saying it's of type i i integer okay now instead of writing one let's write d underscore times whatever is in that box okay now execute it what happens it says zero right the reason is you have just declared a box d underscore times but it didn't put anything in it you did not initialize that variable or it did not put anything in that box so go back and say type i value of say one okay so the, you are giving it a value putting one in okay so if you don't put anything in an integer box or integer variable it's going to default to zero but you can put any default value in it value one execute it now everything is a one but that's not what we wanted right we want one and then two and then three and then four okay so all you have to do is increment this d underscore times equals d underscore times plus one simple enough right you're adding one to that and every time this loops through the second time right the second time it goes here the third time it goes here it's incremented by one let's see if that works okay execute it works one two three four five all the way up till 20 because we have asked it to do it just 20 times okay you could do the same for quantity the point being i want you to understand what is a variable how to define a particular kind of variable it could be an integer it could be a string of characters it could be a single character it could be a floating point we're going to talk about that later don't worry but essentially what a variable is how to do a write statement how to specifically write on a particular column and how to do things n number of times 50 times 100 times any number of times okay so we know how to write horizontal and vertical lines we know how to write at a specific location all you have to do is write 10 which starts writing at the 10th column and then whatever you want to write we know how to do a new line all you have to do is put a forward slash we know how to declare a variable as an integer a variable is like a box that can hold data in this case that box is holding an integer and you have to define that it's of type integer then we have seen how to repeat anything any number of times using the do and end do statement so everything you put in between do and end do gets repeated as many number of times and then we have seen how to do an addition right we have incremented the count of that variable a number of times now we're going to talk a little bit about statement chaining okay let's say you don't want it the the box so to start at zero right here this is zero right you want to start here right let's say at um, location 10 right everything should start at 10 okay so how do you do that Say for example, this is really broken down into two statements.
lines right material in one line and then put a dot there and then go to the next line right okay and then like that okay let's try to execute this more or less it should give you the same result okay now when you do two write statements here okay do you see the redundancy in write so you're saying in the first line write something dot and then in the second line you're saying write something else so the word write is being repeated twice right or in this case four times so instead of doing that there is something in above called statement chaining so what it does is it makes things easy like so you could do something like this right colon okay and then the horizontal line and instead of a dot here you can put a comma which is essentially saying i'm not just only going to write a horizontal line i'm just going to write something else as well and you could do away with the right right and then you're going to do that and put a dot there right now let's execute this okay it's essentially giving you the same result right if we go back what we have saved here is a word called right instead of typing it twice you're just doing it once so you could do the same thing for the third statement and fourth statement as well so as long as you put a colon before the keyword and then do n number of parameters here the first thing is it's a horizontal line and after that you put a comma which says i'm going to do something else as well associated with this right and then say that you're going to do a slash which is going to the next line and then write material and then stop right so this is called statement chaining so we're going to use it extensively don't worry if you don't understand it it's, it's relatively easy now do you see this do loop do and then this is what has to be done and the end do is you know indented a little bit to the right right that doesn't really represent things visually properly because this is what has to be done 20 times and that's indented automatically to the right to indicate that it's one block of code and end do should not be indented pushed to the right you know it doesn't make sense so what you can do is click on the pretty printer and then it will do that correction right do you see that end do is being pushed to the left and then end do was all in small letters now it's being capitalized so pretty printer does some nifty little things like making things beautiful keeping all the keywords and capital case it's all configurable but the point is it makes the code easy to look at right okay we're not going to talk about transaction codes at this point maybe at a later time so that completes our second program and we're going to move on to the third program the third program is about printing a list of countries well we know the list of countries right in for india us for united states ca canada so on and so forth and sap already has all of the data built in and we're going to find out where okay it's there in a table inside sap and i want to view the content of the table how do i do that well sc38 opened the abap editor we know that there is a transaction called se16 that can be used to browse data in tables we're going to talk about tables in a bit so go to se16 and put in t i think it's t005 t enter yep this is it and then hit execute it's all in a different language don't worry that's because we have to select the language english and hit execute this is more like it right 
AU for Australia, CA for Canada, DE for Germany, IN for India, US for United States, so on and so forth. We just need to look at these two columns, country key and name, and want to print it out on the report. Now, where is this data stored? This data is stored in a database table called T005T. What is a database table? We're going to talk more about database tables in um, the data dictionary section, maybe a little bit in the next program. But a table is basically like a grid of data, right? If you've worked on Excel, you would understand what grid of data means, right? Rows, columns, that's what a grid means. Database tables in SAP are essentially rows and columns. For example, look at this Excel, a snippet from the Excel. The first column shows you the material and the second column shows you a description of the material. Two columns and these are the rows. The first row, second row, third row, fourth row, fifth row. So rows and columns is a table. And just like every Excel has a name, you store it with a name, right? Data in tables is stored with a name. And in this case, the name of the table is T005T. A cryptic name, but doesn't matter, that's a name. And in that table, we want to pull out these two columns, country key and the name, right? How do you do that? First, we have to understand what are the names of these columns. CTY name are just, you know, what you see on the screen, but internally they have a name that's used to represent that column. In order to do that, we have to go to a transaction called SE11. SE11. Okay. SE11 is called ABAP dictionary. We're going to talk about in the next program in a bit more detail. So this is where the structure of that grid is defined. Okay. So if you click on display, put that table name in there, it says that country key is called land one. That's the name, technical name of that field or column. And country name is called land X. Okay. So these are the two columns from that table we want to show in the screen, right? Now, I want to stop here for a bit before I write the program and talk for a few minutes on the architecture of SAP. Now, SAP follows a three-tier architecture. In fact, because of that three-tier architecture that it follows, previously it used to be called R3, R slash 3. Now, before that, it used to follow a two-tier architecture, and it was called R2. But R2 is history, so we don't care. The present architecture of SAP is a three-tier architecture. What do I mean by that? Let me define three-tier architecture with, with a simple example. Okay, You log on to your Gmail on your computer. right? Go to your browser and type in gmail.com. Then, some magic is going to happen behind the scenes and you're going to get your mail. Or it asks you for a user ID password, you enter that and you get your email. And you get your email. What's happening behind the scenes is, your browser, I'm not going to go into the details of how this transaction happens, but from the perspective of the architecture, the three-tier architecture, the request is made to one of Google's email server. Right? which in turn is going to look at the Google's database, if at all email uses a relational database, but let's just assume that. Okay, So database, like so, and the data is all there, the user ID, password, my emails, all of that stuff is right there in the database. So this is the data store. This is where all the data is stored. This is where the logic is stored, you know, the data is stored in the database and the logic is stored in what is called as an application or app server, okay? 
and this browser is called as the client okay and that's why it's called as a client server architecture and it's three tier because the third tier is called the database so this is the first tier this is the second tier this is the third tier right three tiers essentially sap follows the same kind of architecture what you see on the user's desktop in this case this screen right here imagine this like a browser right this is sap's browser it's called the gui so the browser in this case is the gui sap gui this is where you execute transactions you view data you ask for data and then this goes to the sap application server and behind the scenes there's going to be a database a place where all the data is stored for example we have seen the list of countries right in for india us for united states all the data is actually stored in the database it's not, it's not stored here it's stored here right so it's stored here in a tabular format like so and what we're going to do is write a program that runs here right it runs here the program runs here the programs always run on the app server and it will go look at a table that we ask it to look in this case t005 t that's the name of the table brings up the data and then displays it on the user's desktop simple right this is a three tier architecture okay now let's write that program okay i'm going to keep the screen open and then open another screen okay and the way i'm going to do that is by and then i'm going to open another window right click on this button it creates a new session and we're going to push it to the right okay on the right we're going to write this program go to sc38 and then what's the name of the program let's say uh so the program name is going to be 03 that's the third program underscore countries underscore list so you're going to print out a list of countries right click on create okay give it a title list of countries and it's an executable program click okay save it as a local object and we are ready to go on the left screen i'm going to type in sc11 that's used to define the structure of a table t005 t okay and then click on display so we want to pull out land 1 the country key and land x the country name okay how do we do that first thing that we have to do is define this table in the program so which is essentially saying to the program that i'm going to look at this table the way to define that is by using the tables statement so tables t005 t and then a dot i'm going to look at this table that's what it says okay okay and then i'm going to select data from the table and write it onto the screen right the keyword is select select s e l e c t and what i'm going to select i'm going to select everything from the table put a star all the columns in that table okay from which table t005 t okay and put a dot and then what i'm going to do with this select once i select the data i'm going to write it onto the screen right and then what am i going to write t005 t dash what's the name of the first column that i want to write i want to put the key first the key is land one right that's the country key so i'm going to say 
land one yeah. and then I'm gonna also do right uh, t005 t dash land x right so that's our country name the second column country key country key and country name okay dot then if you write to select this way you have to write an end select don't worry about it there are many ways to write a select statement and we're gonna see all the variations as we go forward for now just like the way we have done a do and end do we're gonna do an end select and it's automatically suggesting it tab and your statement is complete do a pretty printer okay everything is good check for errors no errors activate the program okay and execute what have we got here we got all different kinds of languages right we don't want japanese chinese or italian we only want english how do you do that this column spras is going to contain the language key and we only want english right remember we have searched it previously so go back and enhance this select statement by saying so let's start from this table all right where sprs equals e n so essentially what you're seeing is you're filtering the rows and columns and saying i want this column select by this row with this condition right again i'm going to do a pretty printer check for syntax activate the program and hit execute this is better right we got everything in english but we want it in a list like just two columns not so many columns how do you do that you put a slash at the very beginning so that every time it loops through this select the first statement is going to be written on a separate line this is more like it right the first column is the key and the second column is the value of that country key okay let's go back and look at this select one more time now what's really happening here what this select statement is doing is let me let me go back to the powerpoint what this select statement is doing is it's running here and what you are saying to that select statement is select star meaning all the columns from the table t005 t right that's what we meant by select star from t005 t right and it pulled up everything but we wanted to only filter by english language so there is a column there called spras s p r a s right and we say where s p r a s equals english so anything that's not in english if for example this row is english this row is french this row is chinese this row is english again it's going to eliminate these rows and going to only pull up the first and fourth row for example now we're going to talk more about the select statement in a different chapter for now what i want to focus is how we're getting the data from some place in the database in some table doing some manipulation and then showing it to the user essentially most of the abap programs work in this model the user sends a request which is executing a program the app server runs the code behind that program which essentially gets data from the database one table 10 tables 100 tables depending on how complex the business is manipulates the data formats it in a particular way and sends it to the user if you come to think of it anything that runs from a remote machine it could be gmail 
See, your mail is not on your computer, your mail is in the database. Somewhere in Palo Alto or I don't know where. And I am sitting in India or I am sitting in San Francisco or I am sitting in China and using a browser, I can get that data, right? The way I got a list of countries is almost similar to the way I get my email. I have a request for a list of countries. I execute the program. The program is run on the SAP app server, which goes and fetches data from a particular table in the database. And it massages the data, does whatever is needed to be done, and then shows it to me in a list. Right? We can make that interface as simple or as complicated as we want. We can have colors, we can have bold letters, we can have all different kinds of things. But the point I want to make is essentially you have to understand this architecture before you move on to write more complicated about programs. A program typically pulls data from the table, massages it, shows it back to the user in a format that he wants. Right? There are different formats. And we're going to talk about all those formats as we go forward. All right. So that was the list of countries. It was easy, right? Okay. So in this chapter, um, we have seen what's a data browser. A data browser is used to view the data in the database. The transaction for that is a C16. Database definition can be found in SC11, the structure of the data, right? We have seen what's a three tier architecture. We have tried to compare it with apps like Gmail or anything that's popular like Facebook, Twitter. They all follow this kind of a three tier architecture where the user has the interface like a browser or an app. And then in the middle, there is an app server that has all the code. And it reaches out to a database, fetches the data, massages it, and shows it to the user in a nice format. It could be on the browser, it could be on the SAP GUI, it could be on an app, it could be in any format that the user wants. It's all coded in the logic of the program. And then you've seen what's a tables statement. It specifically declares to the program that it's that we're going to use a particular database table. It's going to do a bit more behind the scenes, but we're not going to worry about that at this point. And then we have seen a very, very bare bones example of a select statement. All we have done is selected all the columns from a table where the language is English. And then we have used the right statement to print out just two columns, country key, country value, right? That was the list of countries program. The next program is the list of materials. Okay, our fourth program, list of materials. So far, we have executed the program and the program brought us a set of results, right? Now, most of the time, the user is given a choice. For example, when we want to show the list of countries, we could give the user a choice saying, give me all the countries in English. Or, if he's a Chinese user, you could say, give me all the countries in Chinese. So we want to give that power to the user to choose the language in which the countries are displayed. But that was not how our list of countries program was done, right? It just shows the results in English. That's it. User doesn't have a choice. Now, we can give a choice to the user by dividing that program into two screens. The first screen is going to show the choice of selection. Okay, what do you want? For example, in this program, we can say, Okay, this program is going to show you the list of materials. What do you want to choose by? Do you want to choose all the materials? Do you want to choose only finished goods? Do you want to choose only electronic materials? You get the point, right? You're giving the user some choices. 
okay so let's write our fourth program sc38 instead of countries list we're gonna say materials list material underscore list okay click on create and put in a description material list and then it's an executable program click on save and local object okay let's write this program where is the list of materials stored first we have to get to understand the table where the data is stored so let's open another screen push it to the right and go to the transaction sc11 and the table where the materials list is stored is called mara m-a-r-a -A. click on display it says general material data okay sap already has thousands of tables built in in fact somewhere close to you know hundred thousand tables so that's a topic for another day so it has so many different columns like ERSDA, the date when that material was created, ERNAM, the name of the person who has created that material, the material number, MATNAR, right? So many different fields. We want to just show all the materials, just the material name, when it was created, who has created it, and we want to give the user a choice of selecting the user. Or filtering by the user who has created right okay so tables tab and Mara that's the only table we're going to okay and uh, you got to select data right select star of course we want to select everything from Mara okay how many materials do we want to select we don't want to select everything let's say we want to select just 100 rows okay or 20 rows you can just filter that by doing an up to 20 rows okay this keyword up to is not really used a lot you know it's just used in test programs because in a productive environment you would never have to do an up to because you would want to show everything and rather have the user filter them but in this case, we'll just show 20 rows, okay? Up to 20 rows. And then what are we trying to do? We are trying to write colon slash. And then instead of writing three select statements, we can just write one select statement and say uh, Mara dash Matner, the name of the material, okay? Matner comma in the same line we also want to write when it was created ERSDA Mara dash ERSDA comma and the person who has created it ERNAM right Mara ERNAM dot and then end select dot do a pretty printer and let's see if there is a syntax error nope activate sure then execute okay it's showing 20 rows the first 20 rows that it sees in the table okay but we want to really filter it by the user right let's pick an a morley okay m-o-r-l-e-y okay so go back and we want to give a chance to the user we could as well say where that username ernam equal to marley that's easy but we would want to give a chance to the user so the way to do that is one of the options is parameters colon you don't need to do a colon if you are just doing one keyword but i'm just putting a colon just in case if you want to use more parameters and what parameter do we want to search by we want to search for all the materials created by a particular person morally right and 
Ernam is the name of the person who has created that particular material. So parameters p underscore e r n a m p underscore tells the programmer who is looking at the program that it's of type parameter. Okay, we'll we'll get to that. You know, as we write more complicated programs, you'll understand the need for a particular type of naming convention. For now, just start all parameters with a p underscore. Uh, start all data with a d underscore. And each project has their own nomenclature. So I'm not going to go into that. So p underscore ernam space type Mara Ernam. In fact, you don't have to do a Mara Ernam. You could just have done Ernam. Let's check if the syntax is okay. It looks good. Okay, and then activate it, execute, execute it. You see a different screen, right? This is the screen where the user has a choice of selecting what he wants from that report. In this case, we are just giving him one field. The name of the user who has created it. You could, you could give more fields if you want. You know, the dates within which that uh, material was created or anything you want. You know, anything that that table holds. For now, let's put in Morley. M-O-R-L-E-Y. Capital small, doesn't matter. And hit execute. But it doesn't do anything, right? It brings everybody 20 rows, but we only want Morley's materials, the materials that that particular user has created. Okay, go back and over here, instead of up to 20 rows, we write a where clause where ERNAM ERNAM equals P underscore ERNAM. What's this doing? This is saying that I want to pull everything from this table where this column Ernam, right? Ernam right? wherever it is created by is only let's say Morley, right? Okay. Let's check if the syntax is okay. Activate and execute. Okay, now I'm going to type in Morley and execute. It works now. It only pulled the materials that Morley, the user, has created. Right? And the way to do that is by declaring the parameters. The parameters creates a screen where the user can select the parameter. In this case, I am specifically asking ABAP to create a parameter for selection of type Ernam, which is the name of the user. And once the user enters that, it's going to be stored in this variable. Whatever the user entered in that screen is going to be stored in this variable. What did I enter? I've entered Morley. So that's going to be stored in this, this, this variable. And when the select statement runs, it's it, it's going to filter by rnam equals whatever the user has entered. And that's going to be in this case Morley. So this select statement is only going to pull all the materials created by Morley. And that's what is being written onto the screen. And this is how the parameters keyword works. Now there is an other way called select options, which is a more elaborate way of uh, letting the user select parameters, but we're going to talk about that later. So that was parameters, right? You could have as many parameters as you want. And we'll create more parameters as we create more complicated programs. All right. So the next thing is when you execute this, the name looks a little weird, right? P underscore Erna. What I would rather want the user to have is to have a descriptive text. User would rather see created by or whatever, right? The way to do that is by going to go to 
text elements, selection texts, and over here, you could put a description, whatever description you want, or you could just let it flow down from the dictionary. So if you go back here to the data dictionary, SC11, rnam is declared with a description of name of the person created it, blah, 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 right? So if you just click on this rnam field label, there is a description for that, created by, right? So if you click on data dictionary, okay, hit enter, see that? It's getting automatically pulled from the field label associated with the data element. Now don't worry about what the data element is, we're gonna get to that, okay? Now activate these text elements, like so, save it, go back, execute. This is nicer looking, right? Created by instead of p underscore rnam, right? Now the rest of the logic works just as fine. So enter the name and then it pulls all the materials created by that user. So this is text elements. Okay, next thing is we're gonna focus a little bit more on the data dictionary. The data dictionary holds the definition of a table. In this case, it's holding the definition of the table Mara and it says it has so many columns, Matner, Erzda, Ernam, so on and so forth, right? And it also shows you what kind of a data type it is. This is a character of length 12. This is a character of length 18, right? This is a numeric, so number of sheets, for example. It's a numeric of length 3. Units of measure, right? Is it measured in kilos or is it measured in miles or liters or gallons? That's a unit. So each column has to be defined with a particular data type. You can't just say, here's the column and it can hold anything you want. No, that doesn't work with databases. A relational database needs a precise definition of what type of column is going to be for this table. And before I go to the data dictionary, I want to talk a little bit about the business context. Meaning, why do these tables exist in SAP? You know, there's tables for material, there's tables for list of countries. There are so many different tables, right? Why do these tables exist in SAP? The SAP is a class of products called ERP. ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning, ERP. Just to give you a little background before we go on to ABAP because this is really important. Because unless you understand the environment and the data you're working with, you'll not be able to understand ABAP in the right context. So what is an ERP? An ERP is a software used to run the operations of a company. What kind of operations? Typical operations that a company does. Sales, purchases, HR activities, accounting, other logistics, warehouse management. All the enterprise level activities of a company are done with the help of ERP software. SAP just happens to be one such software and very popular. There are other packages in the ERP space like Oracle Apps, JD Edwards, and there's a new generation of products like Salesforce, Workday. These are all examples of ERP. SAP and Oracle are, are the biggest in the crowd. Now, these products, ERP products, in this case SAP that we are talking about, are built looking at the needs of thousands of companies. SAP started way back, 1978 or late 70s, 
And the first implementation was an accounting implementation for a chemical company. So the chemical company has a certain set of business rules that needs to be implemented in their accounting package. And then from that point, SAP has done so many implementations across so many different industries that any new requirement that it sees in a company, say for example, SAP is trying to implement its ERP for a Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson is, uh, let's say, a pharmaceutical company or a consumer. It doesn't matter, you know, whatever. So let's say pharma. So Johnson & Johnson might have the same requirements as um, another pharmaceutical company like uh, Bristol Myers Squibb or Novartis. So anytime there is a new requirement that it thinks should be put in the product itself, it will try to code it. For example, Novartis purchases stock or raw materials required to create these pharmaceuticals. Johnson & Johnson does that. Bristol Mayer Squibb does that. Pfizer does that. All these pharma companies procure raw materials to create those medicines. So the procurement is something that's common across all the pharma companies, right? Same thing with um, companies like Deloitte. Service companies, they need employee management. So HR is a function that's required across Deloitte, across Accenture, across TCS, across IBM. So SAP has a HR module that contains all the logic that is required to run the HR of a company. So most of these ERP softwares has all the logic built in right out of the box to run a company. And that's the reason why you see so many different tables. And there's millions of lines of code written already by SAP that can just come plug and play and run the enterprise. Now that we understand why these tables already exist, we should also understand how to create tables. As an ABAP consultant, it's your duty to create new tables if required. They are not always required, but they are definitely required in, 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 in many instances. And the place to create a table, database table, is the data dictionary. Okay, so what is a data dictionary? It defines the structure of the table. It doesn't hold the data. It defines the structure of the data. Right? Where is the data stored? How is it stored? What is the structure of this table? What are the different columns? What is the structure of each of these columns? Approximately how many rows is, is it going to hold? Should this data be stored in the RAM, in, in the main memory, or in the hard disk? So many different parameters. For example, in this case, this is a table that stores, let's say, coffee, right? A Starbucks coffee database, coffee beans, let's say. So this, this table could be named as Z. Remember, everything starts with a Z. All the major objects start with a Z. Not all, but most of them. Programs start with a Z, tables start with a Z, right? So let's call this um, Z material, right? It could be Z mat, Z mat 01, anything you want, as long as it starts with a Z, right? And this table has two columns. First column is material, column number one, column A, and column B, column number two is description. This looks more like um, in Excel, when you keep putting columns, you don't have to really define whether it holds a number or, or, or a text or something else, right? You can very well format it the way you want it, like dates or decimals, but you don't have to essentially, you know, define it. Everything can be a string or everything can be a number. But like I said, with databases, you have to define each column in terms of what is the structure of that column? Is it going to contain numeric values? Is it going to contain texts? Is it going to contain units like liters, gallons? 
is going to contain currency usd aud inr is going to contain floating point decimals like the net value of the order is 252 dollars 36 cents right we have to precisely define a column in the database so let's create a table anything that starts with a z z mat let's say have let it have two columns okay material and description how do you do that okay go to sc11 and then say z mat if it exists uh, if it's okay we'll create it if not we'll change the description looks like it's okay there's no other table by the name z mat and say materials okay enter and we have to define a delivery class we'll talk more about delivery class later for now just say application table a and say delivery and maintenance allowed x enter and for the fields we want to have two fields right material and description so say material okay and click on predefined types and then we're gonna say it's of type character okay we don't want it to be just numbers we could it could be characters right and then of length let's say 20 characters okay and give a description here saying material number if you want to only have uh, numbers you can very well do that as well you could say that this is going to be an integer right four bytes integer is going to be big so you could do that or you could just do characters and then description okay and this is going to be character as well alpha a character takes alphanumeric alphabets or numeric and this is going to be like 40 characters 100 characters whatever the description you want description okay and Okay, looks like everything is good there's no currency fields and click on technical settings yes we want to save it as a local object okay that's fine and the data class type of data is master data transparent tables and the size category is not really required so if you want you can put it and these are some of the other parameters that we're gonna look at at a later point save Now every table, like a program, has to be activated, right? So activate that program, I mean activate that table, and it says errors occurred while activating, refer to the log. Okay, what is the error? It's not activated because it needs a primary key. What is a primary key? Every table in SAP needs a primary key. A primary key uniquely identifies a row in that table. For example, for all people staying in the United States, SSN is an example of a primary key. There could be a John Doe in, in, in California, there could be a John Doe or n number of John Doe's in Chicago. That's not a unique key. Name is definitely not a unique key. But the social security number for each of these John Doe's is going to be different right and a primary key uniquely identifies a particular row in a table it's mandatory to create a primary key so go back and select the material number as the key because you only want to have one material number that's unique because when you want to say bmw 3 series uh, i20 sedan that should be a unique number right you can't have two of them a unique number right like an ssn identifies a person a material number should identify a material the name of a person is more like a description jane doe in, in san francisco jane doe in uh, chicago right same names no problem but the social security has to be unique like a material number 
And that's why we are defining the material as the primary key and not as a description. Okay, let's try to activate this again. Okay, ignore that warning. Okay, errors occurred. Let's see. Maintain size category. Looks like the size category is required. Let's go to the technical settings. Uh, we expect this to be so big. It doesn't matter. You know, you can have any size category and uh, it's okay. You don't have to really expect the size category. Try and activate it again. Okay, warnings occurred. It's not an error anymore. It's a warning. Warnings can be ignored. Okay, what's the warning here? Enhancement category is missing. That's fine. We'll look at it later. So we have a table that is active. We have created a database table. That's cool, right? Okay. Now, you, you could fill data in it, like, like so. Right? Uh, go to Utilities, Table Maintenance Generator. Okay. Zmat. Enter. Select uh, No Authorization. Enter. And... Uh, create okay let's say it's a one step thing okay 100 save save local object so it's trying to generate um, the screens for that table now it's actually trying to create a program behind the scenes now we're not going to really bother about that at this point what that does is create a screen where you can create entries in the table. You can enter data in the table, like so. Table is cross client, that's fine. Okay, and click on new entries, and material number could be like uh, coffee beans, zero one. This is dark roast Arabica. Okay, just one entry, save back back if you go to the display sc16 or click on this button which essentially takes you to sc16 put the table name in there and hit execute and it shows you that this table has one entry material number and material name you could enter as many records as you want Let, let's just put in some more records like go back and uh, go back, utilities, table contents, create entries. Table is cross client, all right. Click on new entries, CB02, Italian, Italian roast, save, go back, go back, go to data browser, execute, and you can see that there are two rows now. Right, this is relatively easy. Now let's do something interesting. Let's create another material with the same material name. Okay, CB01. CB01 remember already exists. And now we're going to try to add another row with the same material number. Does it work? So go to new entries, CB01. Okay, and uh, it's a uh, French roast. Okay, what does it say? An entry already exists with the same key. Entry already exists with the same key. This is what I meant by primary key, right? When a new person is born, can you give him the same SSN as an existing person? No, that's not possible, right? We don't want that. Because an SSN is a primary key or primary parameter that identifies a person unique. Same thing with the rows in the database. A material number has been declared as the primary key in the definition of the database table in data dictionary. And because of that, it does not allow any more rows to be created with the same material number. Right? I'm going to skip that go back and see that there are just two rows. The third row was not added because CB01 already exists. Now, CB03 could have the same description. 
right? New entries, say CB03, same description. Fine, save it, go back. See the description for row number one and row number three is the same. But that's not stopping SAP from creating another row, isn't it? Because this column is the primary key, the material number, not the material name or description. All right, so that was about the primary key. Now we have created this table by saying material is of type character of 10 characters, right? And description is, let's say, 20 characters. And this is 40 characters, right? That's how we have defined this table. But that's not the right way to define tables or columns in the table. The right way to do that is by using what is called as a data element. A data element. What's a data element? Go back and look at the definition of these columns. You'll see that we have used data types of a particular length. Instead, we could have used data elements. Now, why do we need to use data elements? Data elements offer something that data types cannot. Okay, now I'm going to create another table, ZMAT01, more or less like a copy of the same table. Right? Click on New. Okay. S11. Right? It's going to be very similar to this table, except we're going to say ZMAT uh, underscore zero one, right? And then click on create. Okay, same description. Materials. Okay, and same delivery class. Okay, and in the fields, material, same thing. And instead of data types, we're going to say data elements. So this has to start with a Z. The field name can start with anything you want, but the data element has to start with a Z because it plays a much bigger role. So we call it Z, Z material. If it's not created by somebody else, we could use it. Looks like it is not. So select that. Click yes, local object. Okay, data element not available. Do you want to create it? I want to say yes and say it's material. That's a short description. And then we need uh, it to be of a type care, right? And then 20 characters, right? Just like how we have defined it here. Enter and go to field label and the short length is 10 characters and it's of type material and the medium length is of type 20 30 40 right so whatever whatever <coughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this later now check if everything is okay save version save object yes local object activate it don't forget to activate it because without activation it does not have any useful effect go back and that's that now we're going to create a description okay description and then of course zz description okay enter and it's, it, it has to be a character of type 40 right okay double click that save it does not exist create a new data element yes and put in description and it's of type character of length 40 right okay and then we put a field label here description okay uh, no it doesn't fit so it's fine so check local object activate enter 
Okay, save it. Go back. And there you go. We're almost done. Go to technical settings. Finish that. Set a size category. One. Yep, sure. Save it. Go back. Do a table. Uh, activate it. It's not active yet. Activate that. Error occurred. That's probably because we didn't create the primary key. Sure, not a problem. Material becomes the primary key. Activate it. Yes. Yes. Warnings occurred. That's fine. Now go create a table maintenance generator. No authorization required. And a function group is Z mat underscore zero one. It's a one step thing. Create a screen. Save. Save local object. Now I know it's it's a lot of things that I'm doing here, but it's not really a lot because I'm doing the same things again and again and again. Okay, save it. Go back. So this is the same same table right here. You know, the table on the left and the table on the right are almost similar except for the way the data element is being defined. The columns in the table on the left is defined with data types and lengths, whereas the columns on the right table are defined using data elements. What is the use of these data elements? The reason why data elements are created is twofold. Number one, they hold, if you double click them, right, they hold what is called as texts. And without these texts, let's check what happens when you look at display. And these field data elements have field labels that, that span multiple lengths. Meaning, if that column is shown with something that's less than 10 characters or around that, it shows this description. If it is a medium one, it shows this description. If it is a really long one, like 30 char 40 characters, it shows this description. So there are different types of description that can be shown on the screen depending on the length or width of that particular column, number one. Number two is a data element can be associated with a character or whatever data type. And this could be used again and again and again. Meaning we have created table of type Z mat, let's say, and then we have created another table of Z order, which, which has, which has, let's say, three columns, okay, order number, just like the way you see, you get an order number in McDonald's, right, order number 230, right, and then what does that order have? It has a material, say coffee, and something else, right, now, you see that the column material in this table is essentially same as the column material in the ZMAT table. Meaning, the definition of columns is really, or rather should be really consistent across all the tables that use or that refer to the material. Right? It, it makes no sense to have a material as 20 characters here and a material as 10 characters here. It causes confusion. And it really doesn't work when you're trying to cross-reference this table. So we'll talk more about that at a later point, but data elements bring in a level of sanity when you define these database columns. Once you define a material of type whatever, right, with a particular data type, data element, you can use that across any table that you define that particular material. Right, let me show you an example. Let's go back and uh, pull, let's say Mara. Okay, that's the material table, base, basic table. There are more tables. Now, this table uses uh, the data element for material number called MATNR, M-A-T-N-R. If you look at the data element, say MATNR, right? Let me open another table. Okay. Uh, this time, I'm going to open a new table called MA 
R C. Okay, M A R C. This table is going to contain the plant data, meaning what are all the different factories that this material is stored or created or manufactured in. This row and this row. Right? Both of them essentially represent the same type of data, material number, and they are all created using the same data element MATNR. It just happens to be the same name MATNR. It could be any name, ZZ Matner or MATNR underscore 01, as long as the names are consistent. And if you double click it, material number, because it's, they are using the same data element, the definition of that column for material is consistent. It's character of type 18. Well, they're using domain instead of a preferred type, predefined type. But we'll talk about domains later. You know, it takes some more time for us to understand the need for domain. But for now, you understand that what a data element can do, right? It brings a level of uniformity to the way a column in a table can be defined example that we have taken is material it could be customer it could be country country keys for example right anytime any table declares a country key it has to be of a certain predefined type you know you can't define a country key as two characters in one place and three characters in another place if it's two characters it has to be two characters across the board across all the tables in sap right so that's a data element and we'll create more tables as we go forward or we could use just that that little table that we've used and uh, let's let's just populate this table and the table that we have created and create that list of materials program that's the intention uh, behind this program right list of materials so go to se38 and uh, Z, Z03, no, materials list, is that true? Zero, zero 04, okay, this is our fourth program, materials list, and we are creating an executable program, save it, local object, okay, now we have defined a table already, right? So tables and table that we have created is uh, Z mat, right? And we want to pull data from that table. Select star from Z mat, whatever is there, and then write Z mat dash material. We go back let's go back to the definition of that table z mat right material and description z mat description and and select right we just want to write them in a nice little columnar format check if there is any syntax errors activate that program and execute it we had three columns or three, we had three rows in the table, right? CB010203 and then the descriptions. So that's the list of materials. The fourth program is complete. So we have learned so many different things in this program. The first thing is the parameters keyword. What does the parameters keyword do? It gives the user a choice of selecting what kind of data he wants from that report. The example that we have taken is the list of materials program has um, a list of materials, so many of them. We only wanted materials created by a particular user. And that was easy. We created a parameters keyword. The user can enter the parameters there. For example, the username. And inside the logic of the program, we pulled in what the user has entered and use the select statement to only get or fetch values or materials from the table based on the user entry, right? That was the use of parameters. The next is text elements. 
So when you create these parameters, they have weird names, p underscore s underscore. It can't have a descriptive name. And you can use text elements to show nice descriptive names that could be pulled from that data dictionary. And after that, we moved on to data dictionary. Well, so far we have used tables that already existed. We have talked about the reasons why they exist. For example, why does the Mara table exist? Why does the list of countries table exist? We have said that ERP packages have been built over a course of time based on the requirements of so many different companies. So there is a whole bunch of data and logic that is presented to that's given by SAP out of the box. And ABAP dictionary is the place where you can view the definition of a table, like what's the definition of Mara or another table, T005T, the list of countries table. And that's also the place where you create tables. And we have created a new table, ZMAT, right? First, we have created that using data types like characters. The material type was 20 characters and uh, the material number was 20 characters. The description was 40 characters. And we have also created a primary key. We have seen what a primary key is. But if you don't understand what's a primary key, no worries. We're going to cover more about the primary key in, in the later set of programs. And then we have moved on to the topic of data elements. Why data elements are used? to create consistency across column definitions, across tables, how to create data elements, how to create different text labels, activate data elements, and every table needs to be activated as well. We have seen what's a table maintenance generator that's used to populate data in the table. This is just temporary stuff. You know, you don't really um, use this kind of way to populate tables. There are other ways, but this is just so that we can put some data in and then view it on the screen. And then we've seen how to view the data on the machine. And then we have seen how to view data in the table, like you can use the data browser, SE16. And we have used the report. And instead of using the standard Mara table, we have used this table, ZMAT, to write a select statement and pull the data from the database table, the ones that we have created and show it on the screen. So this concludes the list of programs for day one. Before you move on to day two, there is an exercise that I want you to do. So here is our exercise. So here is an exercise uh, to finish day one. I want you to create a database table with just two fields, customer number, customer name. Give it any name you want, you know, the column names or table names. The customer number should be an integer. And the customer name should be of 100 characters. We want to give really big names. And then using the table maintenance generator, populate the tables with these values or any values you like. Write a program to display these set of rows in this table onto the screen using your own custom report. And then I want you to tell me if you can create a column with this name, cust-name or cust dash -name. Welcome to day two. In day two, we're going to start off with this program called the list of sales orders. So what are sales orders? What is the sales order cycle is something we're going to learn in this program. After that, we're going to move on to the purchase order cycle. So just like the sales order cycle, there is also another cycle, business cycle called the purchase order cycle. Now the reason why I'm discussing things like the sales order cycle and the purchase order cycle is because as an ABAP consultant, we have to work in the context of the business that we operate in. For example, you might be very good in ABAP. 
you know all the statements you know everything that's there to know about a bap technically but when you go to an interview apart from things in a bap which of course they'll be asking you at least 50% of the interview will focus on functional scenarios what do i mean by that well we know sap is an erp right enterprise resource planning software and as an abap consultant you will be working mostly in one or more than one specific business areas what do i mean by that for example think of a company like uh, johnson and johnson right a company everybody knows they are into pharmaceuticals they are into consumer products like band-aids baby products so on and so forth right they are doing so many things now this sap software if it runs if at all it runs in j and j i don't know if it does i'm just taking an example if at all it runs in johnson and johnson what is it used for is it used to sell johnson and johnson products the software that's used to sell johnson and johnson products or is it used to purchase the raw materials or any other services that johnson and johnson requires is it used for managing johnson and johnson accounts the finances or is it used to manage the johnson and johnson warehouse or is it used to manage the hr johnson and johnson say for example has a workforce of 50000 people so is sap used to manage the hr operations of the company or it could be used for all of these operations in most probability an erp is used typically to manage the entire operations of the company now as an abap consultant i'm not saying that you have to understand the entire business of selling or purchases or accounts or warehouse or hr no but typically you specialize in certain areas for example i could specialize in sales or sales and distribution that's one module of sap that deals specifically with the sales and distribution of products as an abap consultant i could specialize in that or i could specialize in mm materials management which deals with purchasing or i could specialize in warehouse management hr fi in fact most of the time abap consultants specialize in more than two areas typically hr and uh, finance or logistics which includes sd and mm logistics execution you know set of areas one or two or one or more than one areas that they are comfortable with or that they have worked with in their previous set of projects and without that kind of knowledge you will not be able to understand the context in which we are writing this program and that's the reason why i said we need to understand at least the sales order cycle or the purchase order cycle don't worry i'm not going to go into the depth of each of these just the basics for now and slowly as we progress through this course we we'll learn more about each of these business scenarios so all right for this program we are going to focus on little bit of sd or sales so sales sales order cycle what is a sales order cycle again you can take the same johnson and johnson company and how does johnson and johnson sell this products you see it all over your retail places right like you go to amazon.com you can find these uh, johnson and johnson products you go to walmart you can find them you go to right aid you can find them you can you can see them in most of the retail places that you go to where you buy your regular groceries or products like that and here is johnson and johnson and how do they sell these products to these retailers or online e-commerce companies 
typically either they directly sell them or they go through distributors so imagine that there is a distributor right distributor one you know what a distributor is right the distributor buys goods from the manufacturer and sells it to a retail vendor so a simplest possible sales cycle could be a johnson and johnson takes an order from a distributor say walmart is asking for 100 cartons of band-aid right the famous jnj product band-aid all right so the distributor places an order and he says it's for walmart and j and j takes the order this order is also called as a sales order so the distributor is purchasing 100 cartons of band-aid from j and j and j and j is selling to the distributor so j and j takes the order and after some time delivers the order and this delivery the distributor might say deliver it directly to Walmart or they could say deliver it to our warehouse. Irrespective, there is an address where JNJ needs to deliver it, it will be delivered. And in a day or two, JNJ bills or invoice the distributor. Right? They'll send the invoice to the distributor. And finally, after some time, the distributor will pay that bill. Say 100 cartons of uh, Band-Aid is going to cost like $1,000. And the $1,000 will be paid by the distributor to J&J. So this is a simple sales order cycle. Now, all of this cycle is already coded in SAP. Remember, SAP is an ERP. And most common scenarios are already built right into SAP. And you can use them out of the box. Your SD functional consultant would know how to do it because this is all sales. Now, what you have to understand as an ABAP consultant is where is this data stored? The sales order data is stored in these tables VBAK, VBAP, mostly. And then the delivery data is stored in LIKP. L I P S and the invoice data is stored in VBRK and VBRP. And of course, the distributors or Walmart or the world they're all customers, right? So the customer data is stored in KNA1, KNVV. That should be good enough. There are some more tables, but that's fine. So we got how many tables here? 2 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, a total of 8 tables. That's good enough for a start. Okay. So remember these 8 tables, they are used extensively in SD. Okay. And I'm going to explain the structure of these tables in a bit. So the sales order is, I said, VBAK and VBAP. So this is called the header table. And this is called the item table. Same thing with delivery and invoice. There are two tables. Remember, there are always two tables. This is the header table. This is the item table. Header, item, header, item. Now, we're going to talk about customers in a bit. But at a transaction level, order, delivery, billing, there are two kinds of tables. At least two. There are more. Header, item. So, if you take a sales order, the sales order is going to look like this. Typically, there is a header section. And then, there is line item section. The header section is going to say who the customer is. Okay. So, in this case, the customer is say Walmart. What is the purchase order? Uh, what is the total price of this order? Say, it's dollar 1000 right so on and so forth at the line item level there's going to be a line number line number one or ten or hundred whatever and it's going to say band-aid and it's going to say 
quantity what's the quantity we need uh, 100 cartons right and then what's the price dollar 1000 let's say okay there could be more more items like uh, line number two could be um, a baby shampoo the quantity of hundred dollar one thousand right if there are more than one line items all these amounts are added up together and the net price in this case is going to be thousand plus thousand two thousand at the header level right so the header is going to contain information relevant for the entire order order number 2000 let's say and then line items is going to contain all the lines all the materials that that customer has ordered okay this is a good start with this understanding let's move forward in UM. now remember the two tables that you have created in the previous chapters we have created a table for material i don't know if it's z mat or something like that right z mat 01 maybe and we have created a z customer 01 as well whatever the names are but the content is roughly the same one table for material and one table for customer the material table contains the material number and material description and the customer table contains a customer number and customer name now this is the orders table okay now we're not going to do this two table thing yet header and item we're going to just have one table okay that includes all the information associated with an order so order number one is going to contain the customer okay in this case customer number one and when the order was created what's the line item number there are two line items one and two and then the materials that they have ordered coffee beans band-aids whatever and then the price and the unit of currency unit all right so what we are going to do now is create so these tables are already created right material table and customer table now we are going to create the order table okay all right where do we go to create this table se11 above dictionary right and we already have z cust z mat right now we're going to say z order and see if we can create it okay so this is our orders table or let's say sales orders table and the application class delivery class display maintenance is allowed enter and in the fields what do we need so order number order number is what it's it's like a number right so let's just say number order num okay this is a key field because it's a important field right and uh, do we do data element yeah let's do data element uh, zz order underscore num okay double click yeah save it local object create a data element yes okay order number and it's going to have define type of um, let's say int integer int 4 it's a big integer right so don't worry about the differences between all of them int 4 okay enter let's paste that here 10 order number okay uh, activate it local object enter okay save it and go back so the first field is ready the order number field and then the customer number now do we need to create a data element for customer number it's already there here right so what we are going to do is open another window create new session 
move it to the right move that to the right so go to sc11 and type in the customer number zcust01 okay we are going to just use this customer number and the data element is going to be the same enter now do you see what we have achieved here the moment a column or a data element or a field appears across tables we don't have to redefine how that should look like what's the definition of that field we can just use the data element as is and we are done we don't have to define that it's an integer or a character or any of that sort it's all taken care we see that it is a character of length 100 and we have not defined that here we have defined that in the customer table and reused the data element and we are good to go right now customer name is something that's already available in this table so we are not going to duplicate that here in the next set of chapters when we talk about data normalization and redundancy and all that stuff we'll understand more about why we are doing it that way okay that's that and then we need a creation date right so let's do that creation date okay and what do we want this to be is it okay that if it's just a oops is there a date data element it is there probably but used by or created by some somebody else or standard sap might have done it for example you can use erdat that's a standard date field right you see that you let me shorten this date on which record was created okay so you can use that or you can create your own it's up to you okay and then what do we need we need item number item number and material number okay item item is typically created as a postner again i am i know it because i have worked in as an above consultant in sd area but if you don't know it you can very well create this as an integer or a character or whatever right this is a numeric character of length 6 you could do that you could create your own data element and reuse it again and again but eventually you you'll get to know these things right so don't worry that i know them at this point eventually you'll know them for now you could either use this or you could create your own like 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 the way i've created these okay and then we need material so so what do we use for material z mat right is this the one or well this was created this was created without data elements so let's not use that instead let's use zmat underscore zero one i think that was that should have been created with the data elements so we're going to choose that you see this makes creation of the table very easy once we have the basic elements nailed the rest of them are really easy because all you have to do is copy the respective data elements and you're good right okay we got the material and then we need price and unit price and unit we don't have them created yet so we're going to say price and let's create a new data element for price right or you could um, i could use something that sand sap provides like pastner or erdat uh, could actually do it here network net value right it's currency of type 15 length 2 so it holds two decimals and 15 digits in total right and unit which is unit of currency and this could be w a e r s again this is a currency key 
a data element readily created for us by SAP. You could very well go and create your own data element, but let's start learning the data elements that SAP has provided to us by default. Okay, did we complete all the different fields? We need six of them, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Do we have seven? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, we have, we do have seven. Okay, and uh, so we have created this table, and through that we have seen how to reuse the column types through the use of data elements. Right. Next, we are going to talk about reference units. Okay. Now, if you go to the currency and quantity fields. Okay. Uh, let's let me unselect these. You'll see that for the price, this thing is open here, right? Meaning, you are saying that the price is of type currency. But what's the reference field? When you say the price is hundred. Hundred of what? Hundred dollars, hundred, you know, hundred liters. You really don't know, right? As a, as a table, as SAP, it knows that it's currency, but you have to really define it and attach it to what kind of a currency unit. So we can just say Z order, this this own very own table, and then unit, right? So we are saying that the price is linked. In terms of currency to this unit right this is really required because when you start pulling reports or doing calculations the price has always got to be associated with a currency right and that's what we have tried to do it here now we have not created a quantity here right so we know that there is an item and there is a material item is the item number one two three four five six seven eight nine ten material is the material and we have the price but where is the quantity we don't have that here if there was a quantity then the quantity also needs a cross reference for example if you say 100 i need 100 of a particular material say band aid 100 of what units 100 liters 100 cartons 100 pieces 100 each so that cross reference needs to be created both for currency as well as quantity. We'll, we'll do quantity in a, another time. Okay. And let's see if we need to put in technical settings. Okay. Just put the default settings. Anything is fine. Save it. Go back. And now save it. The entire table is saved. Now we check if there are any errors. Okay. Looks like it's all warnings, which is okay. So let's go ahead and activate this table. Warnings occurred, it's fine. Still want to activate it. Go back and our table is created. Now remember, if you want to put data in, we need a table maintenance generator, right? So go there. No authorization required. And this is same as the order itself, function group. So, one step and screen number 100, create and save it as a local object, of course. Save it, local object. As you can see at the bottom of the screen, the, the screens for maintaining that table are being generated. So it's basically code, automatic code, that SAP is writing behind the scenes so that the interface to, to put data into that screen uh, is ready-made and available to us at any given point. This is typically a cumbersome operation and it's going to take like a half a minute or so. All right, so this is done. Save it. Go back. Now we can go and create data. Okay, what do you see here? You see, okay, let's start putting in data. What's this plus? I, I don't understand what plus means, right? 
currency yeah this has a description i know that it, this is currency net value is okay item is okay but what are these pluses the reason why you see those pluses is because you have not defined the field label for the data elements of all possible lengths for example you go back you see for the order number field if you double click on z order number you only defined of length 10 right what if it is length 20 did you define anything no we have not and that's why you see a blank there because sap doesn't know what to put in so the the short medium long and headings these are of fixed lengths meaning you know the short is just 10 10 characters medium means you know it's 20 characters so on and so forth so uh, long is typically 40 and order number is just order number it's not going to have any other description so i'm going to have 40 there and uh, this is typically 55 and we're still going to have the same right save it and let's check this this one okay so we activate this data element yes go back and make sure you go to the table maintenance generator and delete the existing screens because you have done some changes to the data element properties right so delete the existing maintenance generator program which is a program that sap automatically generates for you to maintain data in the table it's just a front a gui so it's deleting all the front end that it has built to maintain the table okay and then recreate these screens okay save now again it's going to regenerate the screens and that's going to take some time save go back now let's try to create an entry okay you see the order number there right so that is because we have made sure that the text labels for that column order number has been maintained for all possible lengths 10 20 40 55 so let's do the same for all the custom data elements that we have created for example we need that for custom name go to field label and put in customer name for all possible field lengths so for 20 yep and for 40 yes save it now for those of you wondering why sap maintains these different lengths a particular field can be shown in various possible combinations you know in terms of visibility sometimes the user might resize the column to a smaller width in which case it has to show an appropriate content instead of cutting it off right for example customer name when shortened could be cust name or just customer and when it is expanded it could have the full customer name or or something more you know if it's if it is bigger so that's the reason why sap asks you to maintain lengths of different widths so that it knows when to display which particular length depending on how the user resizes those screens okay all right it's okay this is all good save it activate go back so this is customer name and we have to also ensure z material is uh, created with different links save and activate so make sure that you understand that activation of data elements is different from activation of a table both are two different things okay it doesn't mean that the table is activated or when you activate the table the data elements are activated both are separate entities okay so once you activate the data elements 
if you made any changes to the table activate the table as well but you don't have to activate the table if you have not made changes to the table all right now if there are existing screens delete them remember this has to be done if there are changes that you are trying to regenerate and view on the screen all right you want to do it in a one step create save save okay save it go back now if you go to table contents create entries now you should see that all the columns have been labeled properly okay it's a boring exercise but nevertheless this is something you have to know because you'll be creating so many different tables and you have to ensure that you understand the entire process well okay go click on new entries i want to create order number one customer name or customer number right so customer number do we have any customers existing customers uh, we don't know right we don't know that yet let's just say one and create it on let's put today's date or any date item one the first item and what kind of material cb-01 and net value is 10 what's the currency usd okay or 10 or let's say 1000 usd okay and for the same order same customer same date item number two the order is item number two is uh, cb-02 and that's again a thousand dollars or let's say 500 okay and the currency is usd again okay now what does it say it says that a primary key already exists with this number that is because primary keys can always be or primary keys should always be unique right if there is a one there cannot be another one in the table so what does that tell us that tells us that we can't have just that order number as the primary key we need something else as well but we're not going to bother about that now we're just going to say yes skip it for now it's okay save it and go back right so assume there are many tables many lines in here let's say so let's put one more table one more entry uh, new entries two customer name one same customer created on the same date item 1 material cb02 value 1000 or 500 and currency is usd okay save it go back so how many entries are there there are two entries now we have some data that we can use to write this program and what is that program it brings out the list of sales orders based on the user selection criteria okay okay so let's say go back go to sc38 which is a map editor and say z z z siva this is day two right second day and sales orders create give it a title like list of sales orders and it's an executable program save it of course save it as a local object okay now what is the first thing that we have to do declare the tables right declare the tables right so tables tab what's the table z orders orders or order let's just do a check okay so orders does not exist right you see that here is either not active or does not exist i think it's the order let's try that syntax check yep everything is okay and then let's say parameters what do we need p underscore order number type 
uh, z order dash well we don't know right so we gotta we gotta go to the table definition and check it okay so go to sc11 z order display okay order underscore num right so z order dash so we this is the field that we are referring to or order underscore num and you put a comma there to say that we are declaring more parameters right you could have done it using parameters this without the colon like this and then put a dot here and then we could have done another parameters like so and say p underscore we want to search by order number and uh, we want to search by let's say material as well material type now we could do two things here either of which way either put a comma here and then put a colon here or let's do it the simpler way using two parameter statement so type z order dash material or you could do this let's do a syntax check so it says p underscore material has to be up to eight characters long meaning these parameters that we declare here cannot be more than eight characters right that's a hard coded thing in sap you can't do away with that so all parameters has to be of character length less than eight okay so make sure you don't go overboard with the length of the character or the naming convention okay so if you activate it what do you see you just see two parameters order number and material okay execute it and then you see two parameters right but if you execute it nothing happens because we haven't written the logic for that so let's go back and start writing the logic for this so what do you do select star from z order right where now it's not just one parameter that we have to search we need to search based on two parameters where order underscore num equals p underscore order the one that the user has selected and see this is how you join multiple conditions in the where clause so you can have as many as you want and material equals p underscore mat right so we are searching for all orders in this table where order number is whatever the user has selected and material is what the user has selected so if you go here to the data browser for that table all right and let's execute and see all the entries that are there in that table okay there are two entries like we know first order second order the first order is for this material cb01 the second order is for coffee beans 02 okay so user can search based on the combination of order number and material okay let's come back to our program what do we want to do write z order dash uh, what do we want to write uh, order number let's say order underscore number comma z order dash what does we have customer underscore number and creation date comma could go to the next line z order dash item then z order dash material you could go on and on and on you can just pull all the elements in that table right for now that's okay and then end the select okay go to pretty printer make sure it's formatted all right then this is how i would like to format the select clause select star from z underscore order go to the next line where this equal to this and 
this equal to this right so this is how you select multiple parameters okay now let's check if there are any syntax errors looks like everything is okay activate it enter okay and then execute this program so for order i want to put in one and for material i want to put in cb01 okay now let's execute and see if it really brings up anything at all okay there you go there is something that's being printed here what does it print it says uh, one, one, and then some date, and then something here, and then something here. So why does it print it like that? Let's go and see what's really happening here. Okay. So the first is the order number, right? Order underscore num, and then customer number. Order number is one, customer number is one, we know that. And then we have a date, and then we have something else here, right? Now, when you execute it, order number 1 and material CB01, this is how it's printing. So, this up until this point, all of this is order number 1. Up until this point, all the way until here, it's 100 characters, right? So, that's the customer number or name. And then we have a date and then we have this. The problem here is, this customer number or name is taking up 100 characters. Do we really want to print 100 characters? Maybe we don't want to print 100 characters, right? So what we can do is, we can reduce the number of characters that is being printed to, let's say, 20 characters. We only want to print the first 20 characters. How do you do that? One quick way to do it is to use right like this so there is a right here okay and then put a dot here and just complete that and then say right don't put a slash but instead put in say 11 of 20 and then put in the order customer number blah 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 <clears throat> right let's check this this looks okay activate enter looks okay and then order number one and material cb01 execute do you see that up until this there is this order number and after that the customer name or number is only limited to so many characters whatever we have put in in that right statement 10 characters or 15 characters or 20 characters so what we have done here is we have pulled up data from this table so we have pulled up data from this table then based on the choice of customer selection the user has selected only to bring in order number one and only to bring in the material cb01 Right, execute it and we have brought in that row. The, the row that corresponds to this combination of uh, order and material. Now, if you look at this table, right, this is the row that we have pulled up. What if we want to say pull everything? I'm not specifying an order here. But I want all the materials that are CB01. Or if I have selection criteria as customer, all the orders with customer 1. How do I do that? How do I select one parameter and let the other parameter be a wild character, meaning anything goes? Does it work like this? No, it doesn't. Right? Well, we're going to have to wait on how to do this. But parameters does not give you that flexibility. Every parameter has to be entered. You cannot leave things blank and expect things to work. Okay. There is another way to do it called select options. But we are going to do it in the next set of chapters. So in this chapter, what we have done is written a simple program. 
with two parameters in the selection stream. One is order number, this guy, and the second is material number. Right? And then we have done a select based on the tables that we have declared. And in the where class, we have specified these two parameters. Order number is so and so, material number is so and so. Right? So now we know how to declare more than one parameter. We also know how to add more clauses to the WHERE condition of the SELECT statement. And we also know how to write something at a specific location and of specific length. We only want 20 characters out of that particular column. Yes, we can do that. Right? So, we have seen all of this and we have also seen the sales order cycle. That's good. And uh, we have seen how to reuse data elements. We have seen what are reference units. We have seen how field labels of different lengths are useful when SAP shows them on the screen that can be resizable. And then we have seen finally how to use the WHERE clause with the multiple conditions. In the next program, we are going to see the purchase order cycle and then some things related to the primary key. Okay, for the sixth program, list of purchase orders, we're going to start off with the purchasing cycle. Let's look at the same Johnson & Johnson. We have seen the cycle of sales orders from a Johnson & Johnson sales perspective. Now, Johnson & Johnson also procures stuff, right? Like this Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson needs raw materials, right? Say, for example, to, pro to produce the same band-aid, it needs uh, plastic and paper and cloth, let's say. So, there is vendor one, either in the US or somewhere else, which can provide that plastic. So, what Johnson Johnson does is, it places, step number one, a purchase order. Okay. So, the purchase order contains what? It contains, I need uh, line number one. Uh, some kind of plastic, uh, 100 pounds or whatever, and so on and so forth, right? And number two, uh, it needs, let's say, cloth, and then 100 meters, right? So, this purchase order is sent to the vendor. And step number two is the vendor sends over the material as a delivery. And that is called goods receipt. Okay. And number three is the vendor also sends an invoice called invoice receipt. Okay. Now, this is the basic business process. And in purchase order, there are two main tables, just like the way there are two main tables in a sales order EKKO and EKPO. The goods receipt similarly has both header data and line item data. And the goods receipt has the header data in MKBF and line item data in MKBE and the line item data in MSEG. MSEG. So MKPF, MSEG. And the header data for the invoice is RBKP and RSEG. Okay. And vendor, the main table for vendor is LFA1. And then there are more tables, LFB1, LFC1, so on and so forth. So these seven tables, I think, should be more than enough. Purchase order header and line item table. Goods receipt, header and line item, invoice receipt, header and line item, and vendor tables. Now, what we are going to do is, we are going to do the same thing as we have done for this sales order, except we are going to create a new table called the vendor table. So, this is a new table that we will be creating. Okay. We can call it Z vendor. Right. And then, we already have the material table, right? So, we are going to create ZP purchase order table. 
just like we have created a sales order table we're going to create a purchase order table okay so go to sc11 and start with the vendor table z vendor okay just like how we created z cost okay this is a vendor table and delivery class is a display maintenance is allowed and go to the fields we need a very simple table right vendor number and vendor name just like we have customer number and customer name right so vend underscore num and the data element for that is going to be very similar to the way we see customer right but it's going to be different isn't it it's different because if you put z cost there for example z cost name if you put this here the data definition is going to be okay meaning it's so many characters or is so many numbers in length that's going to be the same but the description that shows up on the data maintenance screens is going to be customer but it's not really a customer it's vendor right so we're going to say zz vend underscore number or name whatever okay then we have to define what it is just like the way we define uh, the customer number as so many characters so on and so forth we have to define the vendor number okay vendor number okay and what type is it it's um an integer okay and uh, the label is going to be 10 characters vendor if it's small let's call it just vendor if it's medium let's give the full length long and heading is also full length okay now save it as a local object of course and activate it okay go back and then we need the vendor name as well right so vend underscore name okay zz vend underscore name enter and double click yes of course yes and it's of type 100 characters right so it's character and let's not put 100 characters let's just put 40 characters for name right it's going beyond the screen so let's just shorten it you have created so many tables so far so activate this table and before doing that we have to ensure that there is a key field and of course vendor number will be the key field activate it i think we are missing the technical settings it's going to ask for it let's go maintain technical settings technical settings whatever we'll talk more about these fields later so activate that syntax check everything is okay activate yep warning which is okay and that's good so go to utilities table maintenance generator no authorization required and this is z vend let's do a two step here okay one step we have used so far Two step is uh, gonna look something like this 200 enter save it as a local object save 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 okay and go back now let's go and maintain the data okay new entries this is a two-step way of uh, generating or creating data so if you go back this is where you see things and if you click on new entries it takes you to a different screen as opposed to putting in the same screen this is called the two-step way of creating data so vendor number one vendor number one is uh, walmart okay 
save. Go back, go back. And there you see that, right? So new entries, render number two is target, let's say. Okay, that's easy, right? So we've got two entries created. One is Walmart and one is target, one and two. Now we are going to create the purchase order table. So we have created the vendor table, Z vend, and it has two columns vendor number, vendor name, right? Now we already have the material table, right? So the material table is something like this ZMAT01, I think, right? Or ZMAT01. We have material number and material name. Now we need to create a purchase order table like this. Call it ZP order to indicate that it's a purchase order as opposed to a sales order. And then we have order number and what? Vendor number. Then we have line item number, material number, price, unit. Right? We need all this stuff. Just to make things easier, you can skip these two columns if it's okay. If not, you can create them. For now, I'm just going to skip them because it requires mapping of the price and unit and all that, which we have seen in the previous chapter. What I want to drive out today is, in this case, what's the primary column? For example, order number one for vendor one can have more than one line item, right? Line number one, material CB01. The same order for the same vendor can have two line items. Line number two could be CB02, right? So in this case, both order number and line together make the key field. So primary key for a table is not always one column. It could be more than one column, right? Because only then you can clearly identify a unique row. A unique row in this case is not just based on the order number, it's based on a combination of order and line item. That's when it becomes unique, right? So we have seen this problem in this when we created the sales order table. We have said that sales order number is unique and when we tried to add one more line item, it said, nope, can't take it. That does not work, right? An order, be it a sales order or a purchase order, can have more than one line item. A simple example is you go to a shop, right, like a Walmart, and after you purchase it, you get a slip, right? You get a slip that gives you a summary of the sale. It says Walmart, so and so, order number 201, and it's going to have one, two, three, four, so many different lines. The first item is a band aid, the second item is juice, the third item is milk, so on and so forth. All of this data is stored in this table, sales order or purchase order, depending on what you're doing. Now, the header along with line item in this case, we are storing all of that in a single table. If we were storing them in different tables, it's a different story. But since we are storing them in the same table, order number and line item together should be the primary key. Right? So let's go create that. So go back. Okay. Z purchase orders or order. Purchase orders. Delivery class A. Display maintenance is allowed. Fields. So here we go. Can we have order number? We can have as long as we are ready to live with the same field description for sales orders. Anyway, that should be fine, I guess. Let's use that. So it's a primary key, all right. right? And then we're going to reuse the same data element. And order number and right next to it, we're going to have line item. Okay. So all the primary key elements, if it, in the case of a composite primary key, more than one column in the primary key is called as a composite primary key. So what's a composite primary key? If the primary key has more than one column, that's, then it's called a composite primary key. So now let's do a line. 
line and you want this to be the primary key as well and Postner. okay Postner is just a data element that can hold line items and then we need material material is really simple material and the data element is going to be zz material and what else the vendor right so vendor vendor number these are all not primary keys so vendor number okay i think we've got everything here so let's do a syntax check order needs to be saved yes of course as a local object sure okay everything looks okay so we have reused all the data elements so we don't need to create labels or data elements new data elements so let's see if we can activate it enter or the technical settings i always keep forgetting that appl0 and one save it go back activate warnings warnings are okay go back looks like everything is there so go to the table maintenance generator no authorization as usual the regular deal go back now let's create some entries okay order number one item one material cb01 and vendor number one okay order number one item number two cb02 for the same vendor now it works right and as soon as you hit enter these two columns are grayed out what does that mean that means that those two columns are the primary key right so you can just save it and go back right this program to pull data so z2 instead of sales call it purchase okay purchase orders create purchase order list executable program save as a local object and we have table statement uh, z p order right let's just check it before we write anything further so select tar from zp order but before we do that we have to write our parameters so parameters but instead of writing two parameter statements we're going to write just one parameter statement p underscore order type zp order dash order number right so what's the name of the order number just double click zp order save it and it will take you to the data dictionary so select this and copy order number and we're going to search by order number and material okay so order number zp order dash order number comma and then tab all the way to the to the right to align with this first parameter and then p underscore material type zp order dash material and then a dot no more parameters so just to make things look easy on the eye uh, just indent everything to align with all the parameters here okay so we have got the parameters ready now let's finish up the select statement select star from zp order so selecting from the table where tab order underscore num equals p underscore order whatever the customer or user has entered and material equals p underscore mat okay it's not going to have the entire length because remember it can only have eight characters so i'm going to just say p mat okay and then you can put end select right here just so that you don't miss it and then you can do a right here 
All right? What do you want to write? So we want to write zp order dash order number and zp order dash item and then zp order dash material vendor so on and so forth it doesn't matter we can we can write all the columns or some of the columns okay let's do a syntax check okay it says this table doesn't have a component called item maybe we called it something else so let's go there double click oh it's called line as opposed to item right so let's call it line instead of item call it line check activate and execute okay so order number one material cb01 right execute and there we go order number one line items so and so material and if you want the vendor you can print that as well right now there is one more adjustment that we have to do for the previous table the table that we have created in the previous chapter for the previous program z not zp order but z order the sales order table over there we had trouble with defining the primary key right so we wanted two elements in the primary key but we only have put one what was the other element the other element is the item so enter okay so we are we are trying to modify the primary key for an existing table that has data already in it okay so let's see if everything is okay what does it say the key is already defined field item cannot be in the key okay what does that mean that means the key has already been defined so here is what i want to do so i want to copy this and paste it there right i want to call it item as well item then delete this column okay save it okay activate it warnings have occurred that's fine so it's been activated right so we are just putting the primary keys together and data is being regenerated what happens if you go to the data okay does the data exist there or is it wiped away no it's there order number and line item are together here now when we put more data in it like go to utilities table contents create entries the display still shows order number and then customer name here right that's not how we want it we want item number to be next what do we have to do go to table maintenance generator delete the existing screens and in a one step process create new screens so it's generating a new program that's ready to show the primary columns order number and line item together and the rest of the fields right next to them okay save it go back utilities table contents create entries now you should see them in the right order right order number item and so on and so forth if you create new entries order number 3 line item 1 customer number uh, say walmart and then created on today material description cb01 net value 500 and then currency usd and line item 2 for the same order right uh, same customer of course walmart and same date and material cb02 a second material net value of 1000 usd okay does it say okay yeah because there are two primary keys right save it if you go back go to the data browser you see you got what we wanted there right one order can have multiple line items so both these columns order number and item 
are the primary keys. So what did we learn in the sixth program? It's a list of purchase orders where we have seen an overview of the purchase order cycle. We have also seen the different tables that are used in the purchase order cycle. And we have seen how to identify a primary key. We have had a bit of difficulty with the primary key in the sales order. Then we did not include the line item in the sales order table. Now we have identified that we have more than one column in the primary key. Very good. And that's called as a composite primary key. Right? And then we have also modified the primary key of the sales order table. Remember for this table, we did not have the item as the primary key. So we have included item along with order number in the primary key by modifying the existing table's primary key. Right? And then we are now going to walk through the step in, step through, and step out of debugging. All right, so let's go back to our program, SC38, not sales orders, or it could be sales orders. Click on change. Okay, let's see if it works as is because we have changed the definition of the table. Order number one, CD01, execute. Okay. It's pulling that up now if we say something like this order number one and then cb just cb okay it doesn't pull up anything right does it i try to execute it nothing happens we want to understand why okay now in order to do that the most versatile tool for the aba programmer is something called as debugging. Now, debugging is a concept that is available in any language. Java, C, C++, and of course, Ada. Debugging is a broad concept. We're not going to discuss everything about debugging here. What I want to explain here is program execution happens sequentially. Meaning, if this program needs to be executed, like so, when you click on the execute button first it looks at this line and then it looks at this line and then it looks at this line and then it looks at this line so on and so forth until it hits the end now that's an oversimplification now there is a whole bunch of complicated non-linear logic that goes behind the scenes but for us it almost goes in 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 sequence from line one all the way through line 10 or 20 okay now what we can do is put a break point here like so okay just go to the gutter to the left and then click on that or you can just uh, select a statement and then click on this button break point okay you don't need two break points one break point is enough and what a break point does is when the execution hits that line, it stops the execution and stares at you and says, hey, you know what? I'm here. What do you want me to do? You want to try it? Just click execute. It hasn't hit the select yet, right? Because we didn't put our parameters in. Now we put one and then we put CB, which is not supposed to bring in anything. Now hit execute. If you see at the left bottom corner, you see that you know the debugging is starting okay and then actually there is an arrow here this GUI does not show it but there is a little arrow here right on top of stop button okay so this has been executed and now it's at this line select star from blah 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 okay and then there are four buttons here that you need to know step in the first one this is step on execute go line by line this is come back one line and this is execute all the way okay don't worry if you understand all those buttons and this is a pretty complicated screen okay no worries we'll go through debugging step by step as we progress through all these programs what i want you to understand here is with debugging you can pause the program and then go step by step for example the select statement here is step number one. 
right in the in the sequence is the first step so you can just say execute and then you see that the size sub rc is 4 what it means is this select statement did not yield any results meaning for the combination p underscore order i double click p underscore order and the value is 1 i double click p underscore mat the value is cb this is what the user has entered when i have entered and for that combination it did not find anything in this table and that's what this size sub rc4 means oh now i know that for this combination there is no data and then it's not showing anything right now i can just hit execute and the rest of the program completes and shows me a blank screen okay that's okay but what if i do cb01 and hit execute again again it will stop at that line where we have placed a breakpoint now p underscore order is one right and then p underscore mat is cb01 because we have entered cb01 here now let's see if this stays zero or turns into different value so execute you see the arrow has gone from here to here you can rewind this video if you want the arrow was here now it has gone here okay that means the select has succeeded because it has not turned into four or three it's still zero it's an indication that the select has succeeded it has pulled in some value at least one row and then now you can do all these writes like going to step one step and then step again and select it has come to the end and then it has come back here this is this one is like a loop right this select and end select is like a loop there could be more than one line right so it's trying to go and loop through all the lines that is select has pulled but you know that there is only one line that that's because site tab x here is one now again don't worry about site tab x size sub rc we'll we'll learn them as we go forward these are just indications that sap is giving us saying hey, you know what this is what i found out this is what i want you to know so it's putting them there for a reason okay and then again again it's just one row so that select loop has completed and it's showing us the results that was cool right now if you're confused about what i've just done there you're not alone most people will be confused the first time but i just wanted to give you a taste of debugging and we'll learn more about debugging as we proceed forward all right so that completes the sixth program and we have not seen everything we have just seen step in or step out one of those step through f6 is the function key now let's move on to program number seven so far in programs five and six we have seen the basic business process of sales purchasing the basic tables that are used in sales and purchasing now if i give you a table whatever be the database table you'll be able to extract data from it give users some choice and then display it nicely on the screen using the right statement now in this program we are going to work on one of the material master tables called mara m a r a let me briefly explain what's there in this table mara s e 11 and the table is mara m a r a click on display it's a standard table in sap that contains most of the fields related to the material master what do i mean by material master we have already created one such table it's called zmat01 what does it have it has a material number and a material description if you look at this table it has probably a couple of materials that we have created cb01 cb02 
or if not we can put those entries now but I'm not bothered about that I want to show you one of the key material tables in SAP that's provided out of the box that table is called Mara M A R A there are many other tables associated with materials like MARC, MARC, MARD and probably it runs into 20-30 tables but we are not bothered about all of them we are only bothered about this particular table which is the base table that stores all the materials now if you want to visualize this if Starbucks is implementing SAP their material table Mara would contain all the list of stuff that they sell like coffee beans cappuccinos frappuccinos anything that goes on the shelf even newspapers any of that would be stored in this table Mara for example Walmart sells so many different materials it doesn't just randomly put things in this table Walmart probably sells a million products right million different kinds of products and they need a way to effectively manage all these materials one of the ways to do it is with a parameter called material group now the table that we have created just had two components right but this table has so many different components material number and then there will going to be a material description somewhere and then when it was created the name of the person who has created it when it was changed the name of the person who has changed that material master data and industry type industry sector material group base unit of measure so on and so forth all of this is data pertaining to that material master for example material say a cell phone okay the material number could be cell dash zero one and it was created on a particular date and who has created it and other things like material group for example which is used to categorize the material into different categories meaning when Walmart sells electronics Walmart sells uh, consumables like milk and water they'll try to bucketize these materials into different groups and that's what this field does material group so let's just view some materials and have a feel for uh, how materials groups looks like so go to the browser and just hit execute so where is our material group so this is all technical settings right MATKL what we want is field labels descriptive names rather than technical names okay so this column right here is the material group so for this material say uh, 38 this particular row the material group is 107 what is 107 107 is miscellaneous okay so there are miscellaneous materials cables fasteners mechanics steels metal processing monitors hard disks the list is endless and your functional consultant typically creates these lists but in our case what we want to do is write a report that gives you a list of all electronic products right this is what we want to do list of all electronic products and whether it's electronics or not is controlled by a field called Mara dash M A T K L M A K T L M A T K L one of those. And the way we are going to do that is not by using the table statement, but by using internal tables. Now, this is the key learning here. So we're going to look at this table Mara give a selection criteria for material group and using internal tables we're going to pull that up and show it on the screen all right so we want electronics right 
so electronics is what what which material group uh, 002 okay 002 it's good so what we want to do is create a program sc38 zz siva underscore zero two underscore electronics right okay and click on create electronic materials it's an executable program and click on save as usual it's a local object so our source table, the data that we want to get from, is the table Mara, right? Normally, what you do is create a table statement and then say Mara, right? Now, that's the easy way and we know how to do it. Just declare a table, write a select statement and then do a write statement before select and end select, right? As easy as that and then if needed we can put some parameters so that the user can enter some data like the material group so on and so forth right that's how we would do it well for a change we're going to do something else we're going to use something called as internal tables and in order to do that we are going to declare something called as a data type okay now why it is this table Mara? Let me open another session. So go to SE11 and look at uh, Mara. Click on display and it has how many columns? There are 238 columns in that table. Now we don't need all the columns, right? We only need to fetch uh, two or three different columns, not all of them. Right. So in cases like this, it doesn't make any sense to use the tables statement which uses up or brings all the data from the table. Every time you need data for that for a particular row, it brings in 238 attributes for that material. It's like asking Gmail, hey, I need this mail, click on this mail and then I want you to show you the mail, the subject, and the body, and probably the attachments, right? That's all you want to see about that email. But behind the scenes, Gmail stores so much more data about that particular email. Say, for example, your friend John has sent you an email. The basic data, for example, is who is the sender, who is the receiver, and then what's the subject, and what's the body and attachments but behind the scenes it stores the server where the data is sent from the server where the data is sent to so much more technical details that you know you're not asking for when you want when you want gmail to show you that mail onto you on the screen right so how do you go about just pulling in the data that you need from that big broad table without having to pull in all the data using the select star the way to do that is i'm going to comment this okay and i'm going to use something called as types okay so this is a very very important keyword and then i'm going to put colon because i'm going to create a big type here and then i'm going to say begin off type ty underscore mara comma then tab a bit and then what are the fields that we need okay let's see we need the material number matner okay type matner just just use the same name okay comma what else do we need we need let's say created on ERSDA type ERSDA comma then what do we need we need the material group MATKL right MATKL type MATKL comma and then that's it that's all we're gonna need okay 
Okay, so that's all we need for now. Begin of this type and end of this type. So what does a type do? A type declares a structure and it cannot hold any data just yet. It's just a structure. If you know the C language, you would know what I mean by structure. If not, that's fine. A structure is just a combination of certain number of fields. One field, ten fields, hundred fields, doesn't matter. But they can't hold data yet. So in order for the structure to hold data, you would have to declare it using a data statement. So data colon and then here is how I'm going to declare this internal table that I was talking about. IT underscore Mara, just a naming convention, IT underscore, it could be anything. Type table of TY underscore Mara. And then I'm going to say work area WA underscore Mara type ty underscore Mara. So what have I done here? I've created an internal table which I'm going to talk about, which is of type the structure. So an internal table is a table in memory that can hold any number of records. Now, don't worry if you are not fully able to understand this. So when, I, when we declare the word tables, as we have done it previously, what have we done? Tables Mara, right? That's how we were doing it so far. And then we would write a select statement, select star, which is all the fields from the table Mara, from Mara, where you would probably write a condition you know, where this is equal to that, mat not equal to this, so on and so forth. And then, in this loop, you would do a write, write matner, or just the few fields that we need. Because this table, for example, is 250 columns wide, but we would never use all those 250 columns, isn't it? Never, probably, I have never seen it. So, you would never use them. So, we would only require one or two or three different fields, Matner, Matkal, or three or four different fields. And then you would do an end select, right? So this is how we have been writing it so far. Now what we are trying to optimize on is we don't need all these fields, number one, right? We know what fields we want, right? At the time of writing the program, we know that we need one, two, three fields. In this case, we need field number one, material number and uh, whatever the next field which is let's say ERSDA who has created it or the date it was created and another field the third field called MATKL M-A-T-K-L material group we just need three fields so instead of declaring the entire table which will in turn create a work area internally, which we don't see, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. So what we're going to do is declare a types statement. Okay, a type is just saying, hey, you know what? I need a structure, a frame, that's going to contain however many fields that we like. Because we don't need all the 250 fields, we're going to say the first field is material number, the second field is ERSDA, and the third field is MATKL. Isn't that what we have created here? Just the syntax is a little weird so far because we have not done it yet. This is the first time we are doing it. But all we have essentially done is we have created a structure in SAP, it's called types, and we have assigned three fields to it. Material number, ERSDA, MATKL. And that's it, right? So this is 
py underscore mara that's the name of the structure or type and the syntax to declare this type is begin of py underscore mara and then whatever the fields that we need in this case matner of type what type matner and then ersda type whatever matcal type whatever and then end of type okay so that's how you define a structure okay the next thing that we have to do is a structure by itself is no good it can't hold data it just defines the structure this is how it, it's more or less like a blueprint for that structure that can hold data the actual data is being held in what is called as an internal table now internal table is a pretty broad concept it has so many variations in, in how we declare it how data is being stored what types of internal tables are there what are the advantages of each of them but at this point we're not going to go there we're just going to see and create a basic internal table but before we do that let's understand why we are creating an internal table so when we write a select right and then we, we were saying select star blah 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 from table mara put a where condition which is okay and then end select end select and then we can do whatever you want in this little space do a write statement whatever you want so this is acting more or less like a loop okay so how are we going to modify this in the context of an internal table we are going to do away this with this in end select and instead of star we're going to say just matner ersda and matcal the just the three fields that we want and from mara which stays good and then we're going to say into table an internal table okay and then the where condition stays and you don't need this end select anymore and you don't put the right statement here as well so this is the select statement which essentially goes and gets just those three columns from the table and then you start a loop loop at what this table whatever table we have declared here loop at this table internal table into a work area the work area is like a temporary space okay and then do your write statements here and then end your loop okay this is a different way of doing the same thing essentially the select and end select except that this is giving you more flexibility and it's more efficient on a system and this is how programs are written in a, in a productive system now if you feel that this is complicated just just play along and as we go forward in the course as we write more programs this internal table is something that we'll be using almost in every program think of an internal table as a copy of the data that resides in the database in memory so here is our database that's going to contain tables mara vbap ak so on all those 80000 or 100000 tables and all the data in it when you declare an internal table an internal table there are many ways to declare internal tables but one of the simplest ways use something called as a type ty underscore and then mara right and then you declared three fields there matner matcal ersda right so this is a type so that was step number 1 and it it doesn't hold data yet it's like a blueprint it it shows you the structure of the table that we're going to hold in memory so this is all on the hard disk basically database resides on the hard disk right it doesn't reside in memory and then using this type 
we're going to declare two things one is an internal table internal table which is essentially a grid of data with three columns right so this becomes column number one this becomes column number two and this becomes column number three exactly like how you define the structure or the type and using a select statement select whatever those fields are matner and then matcal group and then ersda when it was created or uh, from table from mara okay where do we want to select this into into table and then this means the internal table table it underscore mara whatever the internal table is and then the where condition of course that's it you put a dot you don't need an end select it will put everything that we want based on the selection where condition into this internal table now after you've done that all you have to do is loop at it underscore mara this internal table into what wa work area underscore mara now work area is just like a temporary storage location that can hold just one row one row one row at a time that's it that's all it can hold right and that's why the difference between the declaration of internal table and work area is slightly different you define an internal table like so data it underscore mara internal table name type table of ty underscore mara it's of type ty underscore mara the structure so this is the blueprint and we are creating an internal table of type ty underscore mara when you create a work area wa mara it's of type ty underscore mara right the difference is you don't specify table of when you say it's a table of you're declaring an internal table the difference between internal table and work area is an internal table is a grid meaning it can contain n number of rows so if you have selected 100 rows on your select all those 100 rows will reside in the internal table all in memory in ram now you can process it you can delete rows you can insert rows you can do n number of things on this internal table but it does not affect the main table it's just a copy of some other components of that table it doesn't affect the internal table you are just selecting some data and then having a temporary storage location in memory called internal table you're not going to affect the data in the database no effect and then you want to be able to massage it manipulate this data right to get the desired result that you want to do that a work area is a key component a work area is exactly similar to an internal table in structure but it's just one row okay every time you want to process this internal table you loop at this internal table and every time you do that you put one row into the work area and then keep looping until you hit the end using end loop okay that's the fundamental of an internal table and work area okay so we have our type created here and then in the data statement we have created an internal table and a work area so let's just do the pretty printer once check the syntax if everything is okay everything looks okay and now we're going to write the select statement and before we do that uh, let's put the parameters parameters uh, p underscore let's just say matcal we want to just search on the material group right so type Matey kale. Okay, do a quick syntax check. Everything is okay. Uh, just execute it, activate and execute so that we want to just see how it works. Okay, 
do you see that matkal yes and it should sh basically show the list of material groups right all the material groups that you can select do you see the electronics yeah 00103 right okay so far so good the input is ready now we want to write the select statement select we don't want to put a star because we don't need all the fields what do we need material number space ERSDA probably the date and then material group from which table the Mara table where do you want to select into into it underscore Mara this field so we want to select into this internal table right okay now you can put a where condition where matkal matkl equals p underscore matkal right we want to based on the user selection you want to select that data from the mara table then here you don't need to put an end select the statement ends right there because you are selecting everything into the internal table if you don't do that you'll have to write an end select but because we are selecting everything into an internal table that operation is complete right there so if you want to do a quick syntax check you'll see that oops sorry it says this is what you have to do so into not just it underscore mara but you have to write table okay now it says it's syntactically correct no worries you don't need the end select which is good and then loop loop at it underscore mara into wa underscore mara so from the grid you're looping the entire grid into one single line which is the wa underscore mara dot then just say write okay matner comma ERSDA comma matco okay and then end loop okay check for syntax if anything wrong okay now matner which matner where from do we need to select it it needs to be selected from this work area right there is a reason why we have looped everything into the work area now that work area is available inside that loop so wa underscore mara dash matner so wa underscore mara dash ersda and then wa underscore mara dash matco now let's do a quick check everything looks okay activate it everything looks okay then over here zero zero one zero three i think that's electronics if not you can go here and search for it okay where is electronics this is electronics right zero zero one zero three okay and then hit execute so these are all electronic products right remember starting with 951 and then something else just for a change if you want to really check if this is really electronics let's try something else let's say give me all uh, pumps okay zero zero one two zero okay you see the list is different right visually you can tell that the list is different this is the material uh, this is the date on which it was created and this is the material group all right so what have we done here we have we know what are types now right and then type is like a blueprint a structure that's used to declare an internal table an internal table is a grid of data or rather an internal table can hold a grid of data from the database or elsewhere you can create it on the fly that conforms to a particular structure in this case that structure is types 
it can have many other structures that we'll discuss at a later point and then a work area is typically defined again based on the types or there are many other ways to do it in this case we are declaring it based off that blueprint called types and then we use the loop statement to loop at the internal table into the work area whereby at every line of the loop one of the rows is available whatever that select has pulled in let's say 100 rows of data loop statement lets you loop through all the data in that internal table one row at a time and that row is being pulled into the work area using that loop statement okay now again don't worry if you don't fully understand it this is going to be the typical structure of how we're going to pull data from the database so most programs that we write going forward are going to be looking something like this and you'll get used to it and in the next program we are going to discuss internal table in a much broader context now don't worry if you're not fully able to understand this so when i when we declare the word tables as we have done it previously what have we done tables mara right that's how we were doing it so far and then we would write a select statement select star which is all the fields from the table mara from mara where you would probably write a condition you know where this is equal to that matter not equal to this so on and so forth and then in this loop you would do a write write matner or just the few fields that we need because this table for example is 250 columns wide but we would never use all those 250 columns isn't it never probably i have never seen it so you would never use them so we would only require one or two or three different fields matner matkal or three or four different fields and then you would do an end select right so this is how we have been writing it so far now what we are trying to optimize on is we don't need all these fields number one right we know what fields we want right at the time of writing the program we know that we need one two three fields in this case we need field number one material number and uh, whatever the next field which is let's say ERSDA who has created it or the date it was created and another field the third field called matkal m-a-t-k-l material group we just need three fields so instead of declaring the entire table which will in turn create a work area internally which we don't see but we'll, we'll talk about that later so what we are going to do is declare a types statement okay a type is just saying hey you know what i need a structure a frame that's going to contain however many fields that we like because we don't need all the 250 fields we're going to say the first field is material number the second field is ersda and the third field is matkl isn't that what we have created here just the syntax is a little weird so far because we have not done it yet this is the first time we are doing it but all we have essentially done is we have created a structure in sap it's called types and we have assigned three fields to it material number ersda matkal and that's it right so this is ty underscore mara that's the name of the structure or type and the syntax to declare this type is big enough ty underscore mara and then whatever the fields that we need in this case matner of type what type matner and then ersda type whatever matkal type whatever and then end of type okay so that's how you define a structure 
okay the next thing that we have to do is a structure by itself is no good it can't hold data it just defines the structure this is how it, it's more or less like a blueprint for that structure that can hold data the actual data is being held in what is called as an internal table now internal table is a pretty broad concept it has so many variations in, in how we declare it how data is being stored what types of internal tables are there what are the advantages of each of them but at this point we're not going to go there we're just going to see and create a basic internal table but before we do that let's understand why we are creating an internal table so when we write a select right and then we, we were saying select star blah 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 from table mara put a where condition which is okay and then end select end select and then we can do whatever you want in this little space do a write statement whatever you want so this is acting more or less like a loop okay so how are we going to modify this in the context of an internal table we are going to do away this with this in end select and instead of star we're going to say just matner ersda and matcal the just the three fields that we want and from mara which stays good and then we're going to say into table an internal table okay and then the where condition stays and you don't need this end select anymore and you don't put the right statement here as well so this is the select statement which essentially goes and gets just those three columns from the table and then you start a loop loop at what this table whatever table we have declared here loop at this table internal table into a work area a work area is like a temporary space okay and then do your write statements here and then end your loop okay this is a different way of doing the same thing essentially the select and end select except that this is giving you more flexibility and it's more efficient on a system and this is how programs are written in a, in a productive system now if you feel that this is complicated just just play along and as we go forward in the course as we write more programs this internal table is something that we'll be using almost in every program think of an internal table as a copy of the data that resides in the database in memory so here is our database that's going to contain tables mara vbap ak so on all those 80000 or 100000 tables and all the data in it when you declare an internal table an internal table there are many ways to declare internal tables but one of the simplest ways use something called as a type ty underscore and then mara right and then you declared three fields there matner matcal ersda right so this is a type so that was step number 1 and it it doesn't hold data yet it's like a blueprint it it shows you the structure of the table that we're going to hold in memory so this is all on the hard disk basically database resides on the hard disk right it doesn't reside in memory and then using this type we're going to declare two things one is an internal table internal table which is essentially a grid of data with three columns right so this becomes column number 1 this becomes column number 2 and this becomes column number 3 exactly like how you define the structure or the type and using a select statement select whatever those fields are matner 
and then matcal group and then ERSDA when it was created uh, from table from Mara okay where do we want to select this into into table and then this means the internal table table it underscore Mara whatever the internal table is and then the where condition of course that's it you put a dot you don't need an end select it will put everything that we want based on the selection where condition into this internal table now after you've done that all you have to do is loop at it underscore Mara this internal table into what wa work area underscore Mara now work area is just like a temporary storage location that can hold just one row one row one row at a time that's it that's all it can hold right and that's why the difference between the declaration of internal table and work area is slightly different you define an internal table like so data it underscore mara internal table name type table of ty underscore mara it's of type ty underscore mara the structure so this is the blueprint and we are creating an internal table of type ty underscore mara when you create a work area wa mara it's of type ty underscore mara right the difference is you don't specify table of when you say it's a table of you're declaring an internal table the difference between internal table and work area is an internal table is a grid meaning it can contain n number of rows so if you have selected 100 rows on your select all those 100 rows will reside in the internal table all in memory in ram now you can process it you can delete rows you can insert rows you can do n number of things on this internal table but it does not affect the main table it's just a copy of some other components of that table it doesn't affect the internal table you are just selecting some data and then having a temporary storage location in memory called internal table you're not going to affect the data in the database no effect and then you want to be able to massage it manipulate this data right to get the desired result that you want to do that a work area is a key component a work area is exactly similar to an internal table in structure but it's just one row okay every time you want to process this internal table you loop at this internal table and every time you do that you put one row into the work area and then keep looping until you hit the end using end loop okay that's the fundamental of an internal table and work area okay so we have our type created here then in the data statement we have created an internal table and a work area so let's just do the pretty printer once check the syntax if everything is okay everything looks okay and now we're going to write the select statement and before we do that uh, let's put the parameters parameters uh, p underscore let's just say matcal we want to just search on the material group right so type matical okay do a quick syntax check everything is okay uh, just execute it activate and execute so that we want to just see how it works do you see that matcal yes and it should sh basically show the list of material groups right all the material groups that you can select do you see the electronics yeah 00103 right okay so far so good the input is ready now we want to write the select statement select we don't want to put a star because we don't need all the fields what do we need material number space ERSDA probably the date and then material group from 
which table the mara table where do you want to select into into it underscore mara this field so we want to select into this internal table right okay now you can put a where condition where matcal matkl equals p underscore matcal right we want to based on the user selection you want to select that data from the mara table then here you don't need to put an end select the statement ends right there because you are selecting everything into the internal table if you don't do that you'll have to write an end select but because we are selecting everything into an internal table that operation is complete right there so if you want to do a quick syntax check you'll see that oops sorry it says this is what you have to do so into not just it underscore mara but you have to write table okay now it says it's syntactically correct no worries you don't need the end select which is good and then you loop loop at it underscore mara into wa underscore mara so from the grid you are looping the entire grid into one single line which is the wa underscore mara dot then just say write okay matner comma ersda comma matco okay and then end loop okay check for syntax if anything wrong okay now matner which matner where from do we need to select it it needs to be selected from this work area right there is a reason why we have looped everything into the work area now that work area is available inside that loop so wa underscore mara dash matner so wa underscore mara dash ersda and then wa underscore mara dash matcal now let's do a quick check everything looks okay activate it everything looks okay then over here 001013 i think that's electronics if not you can go here and search for it okay where is electronics this is electronics right 00103 okay and then hit execute so these are all electronic products right remember starting with 951 and then something else just for a change if you want to really check if this is really electronics let's try something else let's say give me all uh, pumps okay 00120 okay you see the list is different right visually you can tell that the list is different so this is the material uh, this is the date on which it was created and this is the material group all right so what have we done here we have we know what are types now right and then type is like a blueprint a structure that's used to declare an internal table an internal table is a grid of data or rather an internal table can hold a grid of data from the database or elsewhere you can create it on the fly that conforms to a particular structure in this case that structure is types it can have many other structures that we'll discuss at a later point and then a work area is typically defined again based on the types or there are many other ways to do it in this case we are declaring it based off that blueprint called types and then we use the loop statement to loop at the internal table into the work area whereby at every line of the loop one of the rows is available whatever that select has pulled in let's say 100 rows of data loop statement 
lets you loop through all the data in that internal table one row at a time. And that row is being pulled into the work area using that loop statement. Okay. Now again, don't worry if you don't fully understand it. This is going to be the typical structure of how we're going to pull data from the database. So most programs that we write going forward are going to be looking something like this. And you'll get used to it. And in the next program, we are going to discuss internal table in a much broader context. All right. So let's move on to our next program. Materials in Japanese. Or give a list of all Japanese materials. What do I mean by that? If you take a material, say bread, okay? or coffee beans, any of those materials, say Walmart sells those materials. Walmart or Starbucks or any of these companies are all multinational companies, right? They have branches in the US, Japan, India, UK, so on and so forth. And because of that, they need to be multilingual. Their systems need to work with different languages. And in order for that to happen, one of the key things is that data needs to be maintained in different languages. So bread is called bread in English and in German language, German DE, it's called something else. And in Japanese, it's called something else. Chinese, it's called something else, so on and so forth. For each language, you have to maintain the definition or the description of that material. Now, where is that stored? So, we know that the base table is MARA, right? M-A-R-A. -A. This is where the base data of the material is stored. There is another table called M-A-K-T. This is where the descriptions of all the materials in different languages are stored. For example, say material M-01, language English, description is sunny, sunny. The same material M-01 in Japanese is called something else. Same material German is called something else. You get the point, right? Now what we want is the material number, right? So, Matner here and then material group MATKL from this table. So, the first field and second field from this table and the third field, the description and language from the second table. So, we need data from two tables. How do you do that? Here, we use something called as a table join which essentially combines data from table 1 and table 2. Easy, right? Now, table joins are a concept that we use quite often. Almost every program requires table join. Why? Because data is almost never stored in a single table. It's always stored and distributed across tables. In day 3, we'll understand why it's distributed, what's the purpose behind that distribution, what is normalization, and almost all the basics of database design that you should know as an ABAP consultant will be taught in day three. But for now, we understand that data resides in two tables. We need the data together into one report. And I'm saying we use what is called as a table join, J-O-I-N, join. You're combining or joining data between two tables or more than two tables. And how do we do that? In order for us to do it, we should always have some kind of a key that's common between these two tables. And typically, it's the primary key. Joins can only happen between tables that have a common primary key. It's simple, right? For example, MD01, some material group 00203, 
Now, if you want to combine data from this table and see what's the description of this material M01 in Japanese, unless you have this commonality between this table and this table, it will not make any sense to join data from both these tables. Right? Does it make sense? So, when you join tables, you have to ensure that there is a common field between table 1 and table 2 that you are trying to join. Now, what happens when you do a join? Internally, SAP creates a complicated data set called as a Cartesian product, which is essentially a fancy word for data that's combined from data table 1 and table 2. So, all the columns are combined and then you have this huge list of data from which you can again pick and choose using the where condition. And here, your internal tables come real handy. Why? Because if you use the table statement, tables Mara, and if you do a select, select star on Mara, in the previous program, we said that tables is a waste of memory. It pulls in all the data from the table, row by row. And we said internal tables make this process very efficient by choosing only the fields that we require. This becomes much more magnified in the context of table joins because this has 250 columns, this has say 6 columns. Now, when you do the Cartesian product, the amount of columns that you get is humongous. At least, just for common sense, let's say it's 256. Right? What if you join three tables? What if you join four tables? Which is a possibility. In cases like that, the number of columns become so much more that if you try to do a select star and then end select without using internal table, the system goes crazy. Right? So, in, in situations like this, internal tables come in real handy by restricting the range of selection to a very narrow range. So, what do we want? We want to define an internal table with four columns. Matner, Matkal, Matner, Matkal, Language and Description. Right? Four columns. And then we want to join Mara and MAKT get the results display on the screen. Very simple, right? Alright, let's start to write the program. SC38 ZZ Siva underscore zero two underscore Japanese material. Japanese material listing. That's the title. It's an executable program. And of course it's a local object. So what's the first thing we'll be doing? We'll be declaring an internal table, right? So types big enough ty underscore. You can type in Mara material, any name you want. It's just a name, name of the structure. And we wanted four fields, right? Matner type Matner, and then Matkal, the material group type matkal and then language is something that we don't know yet so what what's the field for that so let's go to slash o s11 which opens this in a different window the data dictionary and then i was saying the name of the table was m a k t right so go there and what's the language key Spras. So, JA for Japanese, EN for English, DE for German, so on and so forth. SPRAS and the material description is MAKTX. Okay. SPRAS type SPRAS. So, this is the language and MAKTX. This is the description, actual description in the language. M A K T X, comma, end of T Y underscore Mara. Okay, so we have declared the type, the structure. Let's do a quick syntax check, see if everything is okay. Everything looks good. 
now we're going to define data right data colon it underscore mara name of the internal table type table of so table of is what declares it as an internal table table of ty underscore mara then we said we also need a work area right work area underscore mara type ty underscore mara now we know the definition between declaring an internal table and a work area right the difference is table of table of makes it an internal table and uh, if you don't use a table of it, it just declares a work area just uh, data that can hold one row at a time okay that sounds good right so we have declared the data that we need now um, we need the parameters based on which the user wants to get the material the language so on and so forth so parameters and what parameters do we want we want material number of course matner type matner comma and then we also want p underscore language right we want to select a specific language sprs type sprs that's it just two parameters okay now we're good here do a quick uh, syntax check make sure everything is all right i don't want to throw all the syntax headers at the very end you know it makes it difficult to understand where we have gone wrong okay and then let's write the select select what do we need to select matner matcal sprs pras m a k t a x four fields well all these four columns are not in just one table right they're spread across two tables so we need to join these two tables together from mara okay this is how we are going to join mara and makt inner join okay we're going to talk about inner join inner join makt and before we do that we're going to do something like this from mara as mara i'm going to talk about the reason why we are going to do that as makt and then we're going to say on mara matner equals makt matner okay this completes the inner join so let's analyze what you have just done so four fields which is good and then we said from mara as mara inner join makt as makt and then there was an on condition which says mara matner equal to makt mat okay so what does this really mean so we are trying to join two tables right inner join is one kind of join there are basically two kinds of joins that we use in scp inner join and uh, left outer join uh, we're going to talk about these two types of joins but inner join basically is more or less like a tight coupling so inner join works like this let's say for example this is the mara table right then we just have the matner and matcal this is m01 matcal 00020 m02 00030 m03 00020 just three fields or three rows and then we have makt it has five or six different columns but for now let's just uh, assume three columns okay material language and the description makatx so it would look something like this m01 en sunny the same material german something else same material japanese something else and then maybe one more row for m02 english 
uh, something. Now, an inner join is an intersection between table 1 and table 2. If at all there are more tables, it will do an intersection between all those tables. And when I mean intersection, when these tables are joined together, right, based on the primary key, right, I said there should be a key that joins these tables together based on the common column. That common column is what we write here in this on statement. We are saying Mara MATNR, this is the tilde character, the one right above the tab on your keyboard. Mara Matner equal to MAKT Matner. So, when doing the inner join, that is where we specify what is the parameter based on which we are doing this table join. In this case, it is Matner. Right? And that's what that on condition specifies. Right? So far, so good. Right? So, the first thing is we define both these tables and use the inner join to combine or join these two tables and don't worry about the as I'm going to talk about it and then the on condition defines how these tables need to be joined together based on what parameter or criteria we need to combine these tables together right and then we're going to have the where clause where matnr equals p underscore matnr and plus equals p underscore s p r a s okay save it quick syntax check it says now look at what it says column matner is unclear so what does that mean so when we join these two tables there is a matner here in this table there is a matner in this table right there is a matcal in this table there is no matcal in this table so when you join two tables together there could be common fields there are not just one field more than one field in cases like that when you do a selection do you need the parameter from this table or this table you need to clearly specify that when you write that select statement and that is why you have declared something called as an alias all right, Mara, M-A-K-T. This could be anything. This could be A and B. A for Mara and B for M-A-K-T. And here, we're going to say Mara, this. So this, what you are essentially saying is, this Matner should be pulled from the Mara table, not M-A-K-T table. Okay. Mara, Matkal. Mara, S-P-R-A-S. Mara MAKTX, where again we say Mara Matner equals this and Mara Spras equal to this. Now, if you do a check, oh, this is MAKT, not Mara, right? MAKT, KT, check. Okay, and then we didn't specify the into clause, right? We specified the from the tables, and then it has to be an into into it underscore mara, right? That is what we wanna. That is what we wanna pull the data into. Again, do a syntax check. Okay, into table. That's how you have to specify the internal table in the select statement. Okay. Mara Spras, no, that's not correct. M A K T. Right? Check again. Everything looks okay. So this is something that takes time to understand. You no, know, don't worry if you don't understand it just yet. What we are essentially doing is joining two tables together. Right? And that's what this statement does, this line. And when doing the join, we are saying what is the parameter based on which we are going to do this join? The common columns, right? That's defined in the on class. And then in this statement, we are saying, okay, we are doing this join, but where does this data go into? It goes into an internal table, right? IT underscore Mara. And then this is the where condition. 
which we are already aware of where this equal to that that equal to this this is where we narrow down the selection there are so many different rows in the table right we are narrowing down that selection to a specific set of data like only for this material this language okay now what do we do we got the data now we need to print it out on the screen and what do we do for that loop at it underscore mara this is something that we have seen in the previous program loop at it underscore mara into work area wa underscore mara then we do a write here so write wa underscore mara this is the work area that we have the data in dash matner wa mara matkal wa underscore mara spras the language and then wa m-a-k-t-x the description right and then end loop dot let's do a pretty printer okay everything is good do a quick syntax check oops something is wrong spras m no that's not correct it says mara wa mara has no component called spras m that's right that's my mistake okay m a k t x we don't have something called m a k t x okay we just need a comma here try it again that's all good okay now let's activate this program and execute it okay so just put in some material m01 and uh, put in a language j a japanese if there is a Japanese language description, it pulls it up. So material, material group, the language, and the actual description in that language. So you can try English, EM, execute. Okay, this is the description in English. So you can have description in any number of languages. Right? So what did we understand in this program? We understand that tables can be combined together to pull in data from multiple tables one example is materials in japanese the example that we have seen is we wanted data for the material in different languages and that was available in two different tables mara makt so we needed to combine data from both these tables and then only pick and choose four columns right and and we did that using what is called as a table join and the join type was called inner join we said inner join is a very tight coupling you know it extracts only the commonest elements okay i know that explanation was not still enough but you would understand it when we come to the next program where we define a left outer join this is the other type of join that's commonly used in a BAP. When we discuss the left outer join in the next program, you'll understand the difference between inner join and left outer join. For this program, I want you to focus on the way I have written this select statement. This is the key. How the inner join is written. What is the use of on statement? And the use of alias as Mara. Right? And how it was used to specify which column which column from which table has to be chosen and written on the screen the next program program number nine is material stock now, every company will maintain stock for all their materials stock means how much quantity do we have at hand and where is the data available? That data is available in a table called MARD. So MARA is our base table. Then MARD is the table that contains the stock of the material by plant. The stock is always stored at the plant level. 
for example if a manufacturing company manufactures bread right a bread making company it will have a plant a plant where it manufactures or bakes bread there could be multiple plant so there could be a plant in san francisco there could be a plant in san jose there could be a plant in new york chicago dallas right these are all plants and each plant could have different kinds of storages right space may not be available right next to the plant so the san francisco plant might store some of its stock in a remote location or one or more than one remote location each of these locations associated with a plant where stock is stored is called a storage location so based on the plant and storage location sap stores the stock so let's look at the mar d table okay mar d display right it has material number plant and storage location and this column labst gives you the picture of the total stock at hand there are different kinds of stock which we don't care about at this point material number plant storage location and valuated unrestricted use stock so these are the four columns that we are interested in from this table so what we want to do we want to combine data from mara and mardi and provide a list of stock now this mardi table is interesting in that if for a material there is no stock in a particular plant let's say then you don't see a row for example if you say m-01 okay execute it it shows you all the rows and all the plants where there is stock available right now if you specify a plant where stock is not available then that row itself does not exist so let's 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 make an entry here so m-01 whatever right this is just the one row that we are interested in and for this row m-01 say plant 1000 some storage location 0001 and then stock is 100 okay m-01 the same material 1200 storage location 0001 plant is or stock is 200 now when you join these two tables based on the matner criteria if you select a plant that's not there in this table right let me write that select query then you'll understand the difference between inner join and the left outer join so if you write a select query like this select whatever one two three parameters from mara inner join mar d on of course mara matner equals mar d matner just a way of saying what are the parameters based on which we want to do this combination of tables this is where we specify where matner equals so and so equals whatever and we want to also specify a plant plant equals 1000 okay now this works there is a row here and this row is combined with these rows using an inner join and when you say plant equal to this 1000 it pulls this data and when you say plant equals 1200 it pulls this data but what if you say plant equals 3000 is there a 3000 row here say there is no 3000 so there is a 4000 there is a 5000 but there is no 3000 what happens in that case this select does not pull up any data because for that plant there is no data in this table mardi 
So it does not pull up any data at all. That's how an inner join works. An inner join is an intersection between table 1 and table 2 and it only pulls up the common data, the data that's available in both the plants based on the wear condition as a common criteria. Now, what if you want to do this? You want to say, okay, select a material, whatever your selection criteria is, material, plant, okay, you can select a plant, you can select a material. What we want to show is, if for a material that you selected, this is how the output should look like. Select, show the plant, say 1000, and the stock, the stock is 100. Now, if there is no stock for that material, then show it as blank, blank or zero. This does not work with an inner join. Why is that? Because if no data exists in table B, when you do this inner join, then it does not even return this row. It returns null, blank. So how do you print that row? Now let me explain this again. Again, we have Mara and Maradi. When you combine these two tables and say, give me all the stock for M01 in plant 1000, it should give you 25. Give me all the stock for M02, 2000 plant, it should give you 30. And M03, 1000 plant, it should give you 25. This is all it to be expected. And if you say M01, give me the stock for plant 1200, it should say blank or zero because that row does not exist. So if a row does not exist on the right hand side of the table, this is important, left hand side versus the right hand side. If a row does not exist on the right hand side of the table, in an inner join, the left hand side of the table's row is also ignored. It says there is no entry. So this row does not come up. Although there is a material M01 here, because there is no corresponding row, for the plant that we have specified, this row does not exist. The select for an inner join returns null, nothing. A left outer join, on the other hand, okay, works like this. It includes everything that's common between table 1 and table 2, and then also includes everything in table 1 as well. So if, if, if that row corresponding row does not exist on the right hand side of the table, that's fine, it prints null or zero. That's called left outer join. So one of the use cases is, this table, MARD, only contains rows when there is stock in that plant. If there is no stock, it does not have a row. And when it does not have a row, when you do an inner join, when you ask for plant in a particular table, you want the system to react and say there is no stock rather than saying, I don't know. Because a null table basically, a null row basically says, I don't know. That's not what we want, right? We want a zero, a stock in that plant. But if this table, for example, was designed in such a way, Marty, that there exists entries, like M01, 1200, 0, for every plant that is there, then you don't need to do an outer join, left outer join, for example. An inner join would equally work well, because the row exists. But the table MARD is designed in such a way that if data is not available for a plant, if the stock is 0 for a plant, that row does not exist. In cases like this, if you want to have data for any value in the left table where an equivalent row does not exist in the right hand side table but you still want the data to be returned as null from the right hand side table then you use a left outer join 
and the syntax for it is exactly equivalent. Instead of inner join, you use a left outer join. Now, most of the time you use an inner join, but at least 10% of the time you tend to use the left outer join because of situations like this. Okay, so let's start to write that program. So this is going to be day two material underscore stuff. Okay, this is the name of the program. Click on create and stock of material by plan. Okay, executable program. All right, so we need to declare some variables as usual types. We need matner, of course, the basic field type matner, and then we need plant storage location and stock. Ty underscore Mara. Okay. Save. Check for syntax. Anything wrong? Nothing wrong. Okay, now we need to write our select. Select. Uh, what do we need? Matner. Works. Elgort. And lapsed. Okay. Then from Mara as Mara outer join, left outer join, M-A-R-D as Mardi, okay, on, what is the condition based based upon which the join should happen, Mara Matner equals M-A-R-D Matner, so this is the common field, right, Matner, where Matner or Mara Matner, M A R A Matner equals what is the material? We need that as part of a parameter. So I'm going to say parameters P underscore Matner type Matner, right? And Mara Matner equals P underscore Matner. Okay. And then we also need to specify the into clause, right? Into table it underscore mar. Right? Well, again, let's do a quick syntax check. Okay. Looks like something is wrong. it underscore mat, not mar. So this is it underscore mat. Save. Do a syntax check again. The column name Matner is unclear. Of course, that is because we have to always specify which column or which table that one belongs to Mara. And this works, the plant belongs to Mardi, right? And the rest of all the columns belongs to Mardi. Mardi. So this is clearly specifying to SAP which table the particular column should be pulled from, right? And then do another syntax check. Okay. Unknown column Mara, Mardi. So this is Mardi. Okay. Another syntax check. So this says the internal table has more fields than have been selected. Let's check it out. So Matner works Elgort Labs T. Matner works Elgort Labs T. Looks like it has the right amount of fields. That's fine, but these are warnings. Uh, just ignore them and try to activate it. Oh, but before we do that, we have to write a write it out onto the screen, right? Loop at loop at it underscore mat into wa underscore mat, and then we do a write here. Syntax check. Okay, let's activate it. Okay, now let's execute this program. M01, execute. 
So we have the material, the material group, the plant and quantity. Okay. So for M01, quantity does exist right, in, in these different set of plants. So it gives you some value. So there are some materials for which stock might not exist. In which case, it should not throw a blank line. Instead, show that for that material, it should show zero values. right? So we should pick up a material that has no stock. How do I do that? Does this have stock? Yes, it has. P-109. I'm just trying different materials to see which of them don't have stock in Mardi. So I found a material that does not have stock. M-100. Okay. Now, because this does not have stock, if we used an inner join with Mardi table, it will produce a blank row. No rows at all. That doesn't give an indication to the user if stock is available or something is wrong with that material. We want to clearly say that the material does exist, but the stock is zero. Right? So execute this. And do you see that? M100. So the material does exist, but the stock is zero. It does not exist in any plant at all. Does it make sense? You can only achieve this with a left outer join where the data from the left part of the table does remain if it is available as part of the selects where clause and if no data is available on the right hand side of the table it brings in zero values or null values right that's the use of a left outer join it's used in these kind of situations where when you do this join when there's no data on the right hand side of the table you still want to show it to the screen so the user understands that, hey, there is no data on the right hand side of the table. Now program number 10 tries to join three tables together. That's all it does. So in program number 8, we have seen that we can get the language specific data for the material, right? We use two tables for that. M-A-R-A, M-A-K-T. Program number 9 used an extra table called MARD where you store the stock that's available by plant. Now this table tries to join three tables together and we already know what table aliases are so we're not going to bother about that. We're going to focus on how to join three tables together and we're not going to use an outer join instead we'll use an inner join. right? As you start to increase the number of tables in the join, a left outer join is not recommended because it pulls in more rows than needed. But you could do it, it depends. Left outer join is more stressful on the system. So the way we are going to do that is join these three tables together and then show the results on the screen. Okay, we're going to call this 03. Or zero two Japanese material stock. Okay, okay, and then create Japanese material stock. It's an executable. Save local object, and we need these two uh, three tables handy. Okay, so we'll first take out the MAKT table, right? That's the language table. Okay, now let's define this internal table. Types big enough ty underscore mat. The first column for this internal table structure is going to be matner, type matner, because that is our key field, material number. And then we're going to start with uh, the language SPRAS, S P R A S. Or before we do that, let's pick one field from the Mara table. Let it be MATKL, the material group. Type M A T K L. And then SPRAS, the language. Type SPRAS. Okay. 
and MATKX, which is the description type MATKX. And then we're going to need some data from the MARD table, MARD, right? We need works and uh, lapsed, right? Works type works and lapsed l a b s t that represents the quantity i know these names are weird they're all created in german language right meaning with german words so they do sound weird for the english speaker but we just have to live with it end of ty underscore mat okay so that's our material internal table and as usual, we're going to define the data statement where we're declaring the internal table and work area. So it underscore mat type table of ty underscore mat. And we're also going to define the work area. wa underscore mat type ty underscore mat. So data declaration is complete save it activate it okay there is an error here m-a-k-t-s is unknown yeah that's right it's not m-a-t-k-s um, it's m-a-k-t-x right okay now that's in text check everything is okay and then we need to define the parameters right parameters p underscore matner that's the field the user is going to select type matner and then let's also give the the language as the selection criteria p underscore spras type is pras okay check everything good so two parameters for selection now we're going to write the select statement select this is where we are combining data from three tables Mara, MAKT, MARD. Okay, so select Mara, Matner, and then MAKT, Mara, MAKTL, space, Mara, or MAKT, SPRAS, the language. M A K T M A K T X the description in that language and MARD works the plant and then again MARD lapsed the quantity. Okay, so these are the different fields that we need to select from these three different tables. Okay, from Mara as Mara inner join m a k t s m a k t on mara matner equals m a k t matner right those are our common fields between m a k t and m a r a okay then we're going to do inner join m a R T that's the third table, right? Mardi as Mardi on what? Mara Matner equals M A R D Matner. Right? Again, Matner is the common field. Now where condition is where we specify Mara Matner equals P underscore Matner and Mara or not Mara, we want to specify by what language, right? Language is specified in MAKT table. MAKT SPRAS equals P underscore SPRAS. Okay, so that's our select statement. Okay, there is a syntax error here. I know that is because we didn't specify the internal table into into table it 
underscore bar okay let's check that again okay it's not mar it's mat right that's the name of our internal table let's do a check again okay it says m-a-k-t-l is not available mara matkal is not available really i think we got the t's and k's confused m-a-t-k-l and uh, let's see m-a-t-k-l t-k it's just that we are mincing up those letters here and there mara m-a-t-k-l oh this should be not a dash but a tilde okay okay this is all good now let's do a right loop but before we do that we have to do a loop right so loop at it underscore mat into wa underscore mat okay and then we do a write we write everything onto the screen everything that's there in that internal table no syntax errors let's activate this activate execute now m01 i know has a description in english and japanese so i'm going to select japanese and for that material well we're going to expand the screen here we need a full screen right okay so there you go so this is the material this is the material group this is the language and the actual description of that language the plant and the stock right you see two thousands here because we need uh, the plant and we didn't print out the storage location for, so for thousand plant there might be more than one storage location zero zero one zero zero two and we didn't print that out we didn't do that in the select statement to start with that's fine you get the point right so essentially what we have done is joined three tables mara the base table right and makt the table which contains the descriptions in different languages we have done an inner join based on matner and we have also created another inner join with mard which is the table that contains the stock of the material for different plants and as usual the join condition is going to be matner equals matner and we have pulled all the data into the internal table it mara right and the selection condition of for the where is based on the parameters then we have looped at it printed it out onto the screen so you can do three tables four tables five tables it's up to you now in general when you write programs in above professionally you never do more than three or four different tables in an inner join because inner join is a very expensive operation it combines data from so many different tables and creates all that data a product of all that data in memory so that's a very expensive operation from a database perspective but nevertheless that's the way the database design is right we have designed our databases to store data in different tables the stock table was there in mardi the basic data was there in mara the language table was there in makt and then there are so many other tables that store different kinds of data related to the material so joins are a fact of a map because that's how databases are designed they are designed to store data in different tables now that brings us to the end of day 2 and in day 3 we're going to start off with more or less a theoretical concept called database design now that we know data exists in database tables they exist in different database tables we need to understand a bit of how 
and why these tables are designed the way they are we're going to take some examples and start creating databases and pulling data from them is no big deal for us now right because we know that all we have to do is join these tables together either using an inner join or a left outer join and write the where conditions pull all the data that we need what we need to know now is why are tables designed this way most of the time you don't have to really create tables but at least 10 to 15% of your work or rather 10% of your work might involve creating custom tables and when you start to do that you need to understand the basic principles of database design you can't design tables just like the way you want them once you understand the basic principles of database design then it's going to be a really easy for you to create database tables as many number as you want depending on the requirement so see you on day 3 welcome to day 3 today we'll just talk about two programs and more importantly we're going to talk about a concept called database design so the focus is more on database design rather than on writing the program itself so on top of it once we cover all these topics that relates to the database we'll do a program and two versions of them version 1 and version 2 all right so first things first the importance of database design now why are we interested in designing or learning about designing databases is it the role of an abap consultant to design databases well maybe not fully because sap like i said comes with almost 100000 tables right out of the box you can add columns to the tables that are provided by sap but creating tables brand new tables is something that does happen 20% of the time because that's what we are paid for we are paid to customize sap right so that's very much a possibility so we need to be aware about creating tables well we know how to create tables already we've gone through the data dictionary and we know all the things that are required to create a basic table now when i talk about database design you're not talking about administering a database that's the role of a dba database administrator we are specifically talking about designing how to save data in the database in the form of tables basically how to design database tables for example let's take this scenario this is a very simplified version of how customers are created in sap as part of the standard implementation so walmart has millions of customers of course these customers are primarily segregated into retail and e-commerce they are called customer groups so there are many customers and they are grouped together as customer groups for example retail and commerce so there is a field called customer group okay that's a parameter there is a possibility for more kinds of groupings like this in the future okay that means that we have to create this customer group table or data in such a way that expansion is possible more data can be added when needed okay each customer can have multiple shipping addresses okay so you can log on to walmart and you can have as many shipping addresses as you want right shipping address let's just say shipping address is just a string okay we're not going to break it up into street city zip code blah 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 it makes things more complicated let's just keep things simple shipping address okay and then over there 
each customer can have multiple shipping address right so this thing over here says so that means that for one customer there can be more than one shipping addresses i'm just representing that using this fork okay one customer can have more than one shipping address and the customer grouping is a one on one relationship one customer one customer group it's not pretty obvious in the description here but you can very well ask the user and find out if this is really the case okay the person who is giving you that requirement okay since walmart sells across the globe but the name should be provisioned to store in multiple languages now shipping addresses need not be stored in multiple languages based on what we see but names on the other hand so each customer has a name right name and the name can be stored in multiple languages meaning name in english name in german so on and so forth so again for each customer there can be multiple names depending on the language that we are interested in right so these are the basic data points that we have on top of that each customer might have some set of data like you know what is the customer tax classification or you know how should the customer be treated for tax or uh, what is the customer's social security number or tax id which shipping zone does this customer fall under northern zone southern zone which time zone does this customer fall under to plan our shipments better you know there is so much of data that can go in to this this customer we are not going to really bother about that at this point for this customer there is a set of data that's unique to each customer like one tax classification one time zone so on and so forth on top of that there could be multiple shipping addresses and multiple names in different languages right so now we need to put all of this together and design database tables that can store this data okay so how do we create our tables well a very very naive and simple way to do it is by just putting everything in one table right like so just one table we can have a customer number like 1 2 3 4 right and then we could have a customer name right and then the language the name could be in multiple languages and customer group and shipping address right i think that should be it we can have more but this is what we have at this point so let's say i am the customer of walmart my customer number is 1 okay my customer name siva my language english uh, my customer group is uh, retail right my shipping address is uh, 1000 denise drive and then chicago illinois okay now remember i can be under only one customer group so this column is good i can have multiple languages if i want right meaning i could uh, choose to order in english as well as order in french but that's a very rare scenario okay uh, now i can have multiple names i can choose myself to be called as siva in english and something else in japanese right because if i go to japanese my shipping address or my name is going to be written in japanese because the 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 courier guy in japan It needs to read it in japanese right so the same customer customer number 1 is going to be is something else in japanese right i don't know what it is and i'm still retail same retail and my shipping address is going to be something else in japanese like um, and then tokyo right so this is a very simplified version of the database what are the problems with this kind of design of tables you can call it customer or whatever right that's the name of the table we could put all these columns and we could just dump data in it now what are the problems with this type of design 
for starters we need a separate unique key so this cannot act as a primary key so the constraint that a primary key should be unique is failing here now you might say the primary key could be customer number and language because for that combination there is always a unique set of data let's go with that argument okay so the primary key now is going to be customer number plus language key does it solve all our problems think about it let me give an example the same customer one okay siva in french okay again i don't know what it means let's just put some something there the language is going to be french okay i'm still retail and i'm going to have a different address right da 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 da, -da. Paris. Okay, so with the combination of customer number and language as a key, now we can have a unique set of data for name, customer group, and shipping address, right? But this fails when I have multiple shipping addresses. I'm sure you must have a whole lot of shipping addresses on Amazon, right? So this case where customer number one. For the same France, so I might have an address in Paris, and then another address in Paris. Right? I can have two shipping addresses, maybe Dropbox kind of thing. So in this case, the primary key constraint has failed because there are two addresses that need to be maintained. So this is not a good idea. So the basic constraint of primary key is failing. So that means we need to start dividing this table up. Right? We need to cut this table and separate out some elements that are really causing this duplicacy or duplicity. Um, I don't know if that is the right word, but you get the point, right? How do we do that? Well, in this case, what is causing the problem? You know, what really is causing the problem? Well, for the same language, there can be duplicate sets of data, like duplicate shipping addresses, right? And that's what is causing the problem. Okay, so let's do something else. Let's redesign this. The same table. Now let's see how we can split this table. So there were five or six different columns there, right? Customer number, name, language. And then group, customer group, and then address. Right? Now we're going to split this into two parts. Table number one is going to have customer number, okay? And then customer group, that's it, okay? So this is custom or underscore whatever the basic customer let's call it just z customer or something like that this is table number one and table number two is going to be customer number that's going to be our unique key and then language and then you can have address okay this could include the name as well right so let's say customer number one customer group is retail the same customer language English could be my Chicago address with name Siva. The same customer for language French could be, let's say, that whatever that address is, right? In Paris, and uh, name is Siva or some variant of it that's understandable in French, right? This solves a bit of a problem. At least this part is, is, is good, right? This part is good. The left part, table number one, is good. Table number two is okay, but it still has some problems. It still does not solve the problem of having multiple addresses in Paris 
whereby if we call just these two columns as the primary key, we're going to have a duplicate entries here, right? So that's not good enough. So this part is okay. Customer table one is okay. Customer table two is still a problem. So how do you solve that? This seems a very valid problem, right? And nothing unnatural about this. So let's let's go solve that problem as well. Okay. So the first part of the data was just the customer number and customer group. The second part of the table that we have designed is going to be further split because address seems to repeat itself. Let's give the address a key. Okay. Like each address, unique address is given a unique number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? Or whatever number. So, so this is table number 1. So, table number 2 is going to be something like this customer number, of course, and language and address number. Okay. Now, you can still have multiple names, right? My name in Japanese is going to be written in the Japanese script. My name is English is going to be written in English script. So, I cannot have multiple names in the Japanese language itself. If yes, we could follow one path. If not, we could follow this path where we just have a name. So let's let's see how this looks like. Customer number one, customer group retail, and customer number one, language English, and address is let's say starts with seven thousand. It could be starting with one also, no problem. And then Siva. The same customer now, Siva is in French is going to be seven thousand one. Now these are just imaginary numbers. They, they could start with anything. They would just start with one. So let's just put one there just to make things simple, right? We want to complicate things. So this is one, this is two, and I'm still Siva, which is fine. And then I could have another address, another shipping address in France, and that is called three, and my name is still Siva, or whatever I my name is written in French or Japanese or whatever, right? And then there's going to be a third table. It's going to have address, ADR, NR, and address. So one is going to be something, something Chicago, and two is going to be some drive in Paris, and three is going to be some other road in Paris, right? What are the primary keys here? This is the primary key and all these three columns become the primary key and this is the primary key in this table. So, table number three. Does it solve all the problems that we have seen when we have seen the first table? Almost all of them, right? So, this process of designing uh, database tables in this fashion based on our requirements uh, is called normalization. Normalization is the process of breaking down data and designing the database tables in such a way that it's easy to store data in the tables and it's easy to retrieve data as well. But what are we essentially trying to avoid here? You know, when we have split up this database table into three different columns, what have we done? Let's see that in the next chapter. All right, so what is normalization? And why do we do normalization? Well, the process that we have just done of splitting up that data into three different tables is called normalization. The question that you might have now is, we know why we have divided these tables more or less. Okay, and you have used a good term called normalization. But what does it really mean? You know, what are we essentially trying to achieve at a very high level? 
Now this is just you know five or six different columns that we are trying to optimize for. In fact, we have made things more complex, you know, in a way, right? So there are just five different columns or five different data points associated with the customer. And instead of putting it in one table, we have split them up into three tables. And uh, how many rows is this or how many columns is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So in fact, we have made five columns into eight columns spread across three tables. And we're using a big word here called normalization. That seems a little bit strange. But we have seen some advantages already, right? A normalization is something that's done with every relational database. There are some instances outside of SAP where things are not normalized. But for the most part, whenever you think of relational databases, data is always normalized. Now, why all this complexity? Why don't we just dump it in one table? The reason is simple. Normalization essentially tries to achieve two things. The first thing is called eliminating data redundancies. Now remember, this was our first table, right? This is the denormalized form or data as it is. No engineering done on it yet. You see, this is all data that is redundant. It's repeated n number of times. Right? That's all data redundancy. With this kind of splitting of those tables, that data redundancy is gone. Right? So one of the goals of normalization is to eliminate data redundancies. The second goal is to increase the data integrity. What do I mean by that? Now, in this way, the denormalized form of data, it's difficult to essentially pinpoint a particular set of record because the primary key is so messed up. And by primary key, I mean a unique way to identify a particular entity, in this case, a customer. But this way of doing it, by splitting it up into three tables, makes things easy to uniquely identify a record. For example, if I want to uniquely identify all the data associated with this customer, I do a join on one, two, and three tables, and then say, for customer one, name in English is Siva, and the address is so-and-so. You remember those joins that we have done already in the previous set of chapters? Using the join, we can combine these tables together to uniquely arrive at a particular set of data based on the where condition. But with this, good luck with that. It's all messed up. It's all muddled up. The data is there. No doubt about it. You can still use the where condition. If primary key were not a constraint, you can still use the where condition and arrive at that data. But this is a much, much better way which preserves the integrity of the data. Now, data integrity is something that I can't explain at this point because we need to understand uh, the concept of primary key and foreign key. But just understand this. Normalization increases the data integrity and eliminates data redundancy. Now, what we're going to do in the next chapter is we're going to design this customer entity has three different database tables using the ABAP dictionary and then write a report to pull data from these three tables. Now this is something that we have done in quite a number of programs previously but because we are designing these new database tables again in the context of normalization it will be much better if you do it in the system. Okay, so let's start with our first table, SC11. Let's call it ZZ Siva as a prefix. You can just start with any Z or Y, right? You don't have to do ZZ Siva, but that since there are so many tables in customer in the system, 
I'm going to just start with ZZSiva so that it's easily identifiable. ZZSiva and then customer, right? This is the base table, okay? Create, okay? So this is customer, base table, okay? And then it's going to have an A. Of course, display maintenance is allowed. And what kind of fields do we want? Let's use the standard data elements, right? Because it's it's, it's easier that way. We want Kunal or we could just say customer, right? This is Kunal. I know that these are standard data elements because I've been programming for quite some time, but you don't have to use this. You can create your own data elements. Because I know them, I'm using them. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to create new data elements because we have already gone through that exercise. Okay, what else do we have here? And then we have the group, right? What is customer group? Let me see what that customer group is. Slash O, SC16. Then I think K and V, V. That's the customer group table. Let's just say 1400 is our customer and 1000 sales org. Let's see what the customer group is. This is customer group. Okay, so these are examples of customer groups. Very good. Uh, we need to understand uh, what's the technical description for this, right? So go there and uh, look at customer group, do an F1. And then click on this field, the technical information box or little hammer and uh, wrench button. Click on that and you'll see that it's KNVV KDGRP and the data element is KDGRP. Okay, simple enough, right? So this is KDGRP and KDGRP. What is the primary key here? Just this guy. Now we are done with table number one actually, just two columns, customer and customer group. Okay, go to the technical settings, local object of course. Okay, save it, go back, try and activate this, see if everything goes okay. Okay, warnings have occurred, that's fine, we don't care. So the table number one, ZCC underscore customer is done. Let's design the second table. The second table, we want to call it, let's say, customer underscore, let's say, language, right? So something language specific. So, cust underscore lang. So, there's something that's language specific, okay? So, the first table was ZZC underscore customer. The second table is customer underscore lang or cust underscore lang. Okay? Language specific data right i'm gonna call it a and allowed of course and this is kunar the basic customer number and uh, what was the second field i think that was i think that was language right language address and name language is pras S P R A S, and that's a primary key as well, right? We want to have language specific data, so that's a primary key too. And then uh, we need an address number, right? Something that's a unique key again. I think that's called A D R N R. Let me see if that data element is available. Yes, that's available. And for that A D R N R, we need a name as well, right? So name can be called as what? So let's go back and see what's the name field used. KNA1, that's the customer master basic table. Okay, so this is our name one. Select a row, any row. And we wanna see what's the data element used here, right? Click on the hammer and you get something like name one underscore gp right so we're going to use that name one 
this is name one underscore gp now address number is also a primary key isn't it save it local object of course it's client specific that's fine just ignore it for now okay save this guy back and activate warning suckered that's okay all right so we have designed the second table as well the third table is just address and some address details right address details is more or less like a string so we go back and say cust underscore a d r n r or address number something like that a d r and you could just say a d r create okay address details okay a d d right and this is again delivery class a now don't worry about delivery classes and all that stuff at this point just just go with the flow and what fields do we need here adr and r adr and r this is a unique number for address and uh, we need details like a string right it could be a name or it could be anything let's just say it's uh, i don't know what that field is in the address number because i really don't know I could just say address, details, and then we could just say it's name one GP. As long as it's a certain length of string, 30 characters, 40 characters, whatever, that should be fine. Right? It's just a string. I'm just using name one in this case because it's really handy. Probably in a real table, you would use a more relevant data element. Okay, save it go there and uh, we're all good let's try and activate this okay warnings warnings is okay now for each of these we need to maintain data maintenance generators right remember that go to utilities table maintenance generator authorization object is no authorization the function group is the same as the table name just use a one step method, put a screen number and click on generate. Save it as a local object, of course. Now, this is something we have done a couple of times in one of the previous chapters, right? When we are talking about databases, this is basically creating automatic programs to display or change data associated with this table. Okay. This is done. Go back and uh, let's go do the same thing for the other tables as well. The other table is customer table, change utilities, table maintenance generator, no authorization. Copy this and paste this here. One step, 100, and new screens so it generates new screens or the code behind the new screens automatically through this table maintenance generator okay this is complete save it go back go back and the third guy is what i think it's customer language right so go to change utilities table maintenance generator as usual just copy the table name do one step 100 is the screen create screens or the program behind those screens automatically as a local object of course just give it a second and it will generate on the screens for you okay save it go back now let's go to the very basic table customer right Go to change, go to utilities, table contents, create entries. Okay, new entries. Now, why do you see this? These are all the existing customers in the standard SAP system. Because we have used the standard data elements, K U N N R, they are already linked to standard search help tables you want to see that you can go to 
slash o sc11 kna1 okay that's the basic database table for customer kunar and if you double click on kunar it's associated with a domain which we have not seen yet if you double click on that you'll and go to the value range you'll see that the link table for this is kna1 that's why you see all those entries that doesn't bother us a lot we can just say 1400 as a customer here right it's just fine and customer group is again we can put as 0 1 okay save so instead of creating 1 2 3 4 5 we can just use an existing customer okay so that was customer and then what was the next table language change utilities table contents create entries so what was the customer that we have created we have created 1400 already okay oops where is our address details let's just say customer 1400 languages english name siva right this is just a fancy way of maintaining address because we have used ADRNR. Okay, so don't worry about it. This is not of much significance at this point. Thousand some drive, right? And then city is Chicago, and country is US, right? Language is English. Save it, right? So this is all set. You can have another address in French um, Siva in French and this is uh, Siva in French in fact we did not have to have that name column there it's, it's right there in this address field but that's fine this is thousand Eiffel Tower I don't know if the spelling is correct dry country is France right language is FR save it right we're good here that's fine don't worry about that little pop up there okay so we have maintained language specific data then what are the other tables the last table is address so in address you could you could maintain an address like like how we have done previously right create entries you would have a problem here because we have used the standard domain element called ADRNR if we have just used any other integer for ADRNR and a string this would have worked fine but for now we can just ignore it okay now how long does it take to write a program to join these three tables together and then show it on the screen this is something we have done 10 times already what do we do here so we have created three tables customer is the base table and then customer underscore language is the second table which contains language specific data and the third table is customer underscore address right so these are the three tables and how do we write that select statement of course we declare the internal table and then the data statement selection criteria finally we're going to write that select statement right that's the meat of that program so select what do we need to select we need to select let's say we want to show the customer number kunar and of course you're going to prefix it with the table and a tilde right so select kunar and language is pras which language we are showing the data in and then we're going to also show the name, name1, and we're going to show address, ADRNR, address number if required, and the material group or customer group, KDGRP. From customer as customer inner join, right? We also always want to do an inner join inner join cust underscore lang as cust underscore lang on customer corner equals 
cost underscore lang color. So far, we have joined these two tables. And then we're going to also say inner join because the address data is in another table. Inner join customer underscore address on, of course, the same thing customer kunar equals customer underscore address kunar. So this is going to join these two tables together. Right? This section is going to join these two tables together. So essentially you have a join of all the three tables. Easy, right? And then you write your where clause where kunar equal to so and so or sprass language equal to so and so or whatever you want to have in your parameters for selection. Right? I would leave this as an exercise because it's a real simple operation that we have done so many times. All we have to do is do a join of three tables and then spit out the data in a loop. In the next chapter, we're going to talk about a concept called foreign key. Okay, so we all know what a primary key is. Now we'll talk about a foreign key. So this is how we have designed our tables. So customer is the basic table, and then we had Two more tables. The customer group was not really descriptive, isn't it? It just had a 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03. We don't know what they really mean. They're just codes. There must be another table where these codes have meaning, like 0, 01 is retail, 0, 02 is wholesale, 0, 03 is franchise, 0, 04 these healthcare customers. This is how you might want to group your customers, right? So these descriptions must be available in some other table. Which table is that? And how do you find it out? Okay, so go to display of that table and then here is our data element, right? Double click on that data element. Double click on this domain. Click on value range. And this is the table, T151. This table, if you double click on that, it has three rows or three columns. Go to the data browser and execute it. And you should be able to see what these descriptions of customer groups really mean. For example, 01 means industrial customers. 0, 02 means trading customers, 0, 03 means development partners, so on and so forth, right? This is a ready made grouping of customers that's given to us and we have used it by using the data element KDGRP. If you did not want to use it, you could create your own data elements ZZ cost group or ZZ group, something like that. And you would not have any of these check tables or any of that readily available for you. But since we have done it the easy way, there is one more thing that you have to do. And that is maintaining a relationship between this table and this table. So here is our primary key, right? And this is the table where the corresponding foreign key exists. So again, in this table, this is the primary key. So we are essentially linking the primary key in this table with another table where it's not really a primary key. So this way of linking the columns of one table where that column is a primary key to another table where it's not really is called as primary foreign key relationship. So this is the primary key. This is where unique values exist. Over here, they could be duplicated as many number of times. 0, 1, 4 could be 0, 1 as well. 5 could be 0, 2, right? Because th that key is not really unique here. This is not a primary key. But we can link this data to a primary key table. In this case, from the perspective of this table, this table, this entire table is called the foreign key table. And this is one of the aspects I was talking about 
when I mentioned data integrity in normalization. Remember, the first element of uh, normalization was to reduce data redundancy. The second element is increase the data integrity. And this is one of the key elements of data integrity. You can just have the key in here and the value will be created and maintained in a different foreign table. Right? It's easier to do it this way rather than having to maintain it all in this table. You could have one more column here, right? Called description and have 01 as retail and 02 as wholesale right there. But you would lose out on many of the advantages of normalization if you do it that way. Now we are already over that. We know that we don't want to do it that way. We want to do it this way, where data needs to be clearly separated to avoid data redundancy and to preserve the integrity of data, meaning the linkages between these tables, you maintain what is called as a foreign key that links these two tables together with a foreign key. Right? The primary key in the key table is linked up as a foreign key to the other table. Okay, so let's go to our basic table which is a customer table, click on change and this is the table that we want to hook up as a foreign key, right, to the table T151, right. So select that column and click on the foreign keys button. So it says foreign key does not exist, we know that. Create a proposal with the value table T151. It already knows that it can generate a proposal for a foreign key, basically the linkage and the table is T151 because that's available in the domain. Now if you don't use the standard domains, this statement would not come up here. You'd have to generate the proposal based on what the target key is. Right? You can put a description there and, uh, and it has already generated that a little constraint there. T151 KDGRP equals ZZCVA cust KDGRP. Right? That, that relationship is maintained there. Okay. Click on copy. And foreign key was transferred. Now, see how things work. So, save it. Okay. Activate it. Warnings are okay. It's all right. Go to utilities, table maintenance generator. Okay, delete any of the existing screens and create your new custom screens. Right, remember generally any changes to the labels or any of that stuff, you need to create a new table maintenance generator. Okay, I want to do it using the one step method and save it as a local object. Now, in this case, it's not really required because that foreign key um, generation is uh, does not really have to trigger a new table maintenance generator. That's fine. Let's just do it anyways. Go back. Utilities. Table contents. Create new entries. Okay. And new entries. And then customer 1000. Right. Go to customer group. And they're automatically pulled up for you from the foreign key. Now this is something that the data browser or data maintenance generator intelligently does for you automatically, right? This is merely a side effect and not the only intended consequence of maintaining primary keys and foreign keys. The key reason why we maintain a foreign key is to link up data across tables. Right? Wherever we have a table where there is a primary key, if that data is being used across other tables, in those other tables, link up that column as a foreign key to the main primary key table. Right? That's how you maintain this referential integrity. That is the key thing that holds these tables together. So these three tables, 
that we have designed for example right so we have created three tables right so this was table one this was table two and then there was another table table three where there's a corner then address and then address details right now what's the primary key table this is the primary key table this is primary right so these other tables needs to be generated with a foreign key by linking this table to the primary key table and that's how you maintain the referential integrity if you don't do that these things kind of are independent of each other we did achieve some level of data redundancy reduction but the linkage between these two tables or three tables using the concept of primary key and foreign key is what binds them together okay meaning for example once you create the primary key one two three four five customers right if you do this referential integrity then you cannot put any customer number here like like for example there is only one two three four five can you put a uh, 10 here no that's not possible because anytime you put a value in here it references the table that has this column as the primary key does it have 10 this value that we are trying to enter it does not so this value is not allowed that's what i meant by referential integrity so it's referencing the primary key table because we have linked it up as a foreign key table and then it's checking for the integrity of data can i maintain 10 i cannot because this primary key table for customer does not have 10. Now if you maintain 10 here then it will love you to maintain 10 and then english and then siva and so on and so forth same thing with this other table n number of tables can be foreign keys with the primary key table right now this is one of the other key advantages of using normalization and spreading data across tables we're almost done with day three day three our main focus has been the database design right what is database design what is normalization what are the key advantages of normalization what are foreign keys and we have done all of this with an example the example of designing the customer master using the set of data points that we have discussed in our little exercise kind of thing right now we're going to shift gears and move to another type of customer master select statement where you don't need to join tables instead use a different kind of uh, syntax called for all entries okay for all entries so how do we do that well here is what we'll be doing okay let's not worry about the table that we have at hand let's take the simple example of the standard customer tables k n a 1 this is the standard customer master table standard customer master this is the basic data okay this has customer group customer name so on and so forth all that stuff is right there there is another table called knvv right which contains sales specific data meaning a customer's data that is specific to the US for example let's say thousand is Germany so thousand sales org or sales territory specific area and then 2000 is something else 3000 is US right so this is sales specific customer data so this is basic data this is sales specific customer data we are interested in finding and doing a write on some of the data associated with KNVV. Now, how do you do that? Now, the standard way of doing it is joining these two tables and pulling all the columns that we need. Right? And we can do it typically using an inner join. And that is something that you're already aware of. There is another way to achieve the same thing. And that is using the for all entries. Okay? Now, I don't recommend this approach because a join is much more cleaner. 
the database will do the bulk of the work for us the for all entries is a little tricky it's used in very specific circumstances let's not go into the details at this point but i want you to understand that there is an option to do this data across tables in a different way other than using joins okay now what will be our selection criteria be something like kunar or customer number right that's a selection criteria we want to list all the sales org specific data right the customer is just going to enter the customer number and then we are going to write all the sales specific data or you can you can even specify the sales specific org but we'll not go there you define a simple internal table internal table k n1 right this is going to just contain one or two different columns like corner customer and then any other columns right and we're going to define another internal table called k n v v and this is going to have corner v k org v k org is signifying a number that represents all the different territories in which this customer resides meaning think of a multinational company like ge general electric so general electric sells what does it sell it sells let's say it generator right or let's say ge medicals right ge medicals general electric medicals sells medical equipment to hospitals right so hospital is a customer and that particular hospital could be across many territories and many countries right so ge medicals is a multinational company and this hospital chain of hospitals is a multinational company too so for that multinational hospital chain the data in the us is different the data in india is different the data in uk is different right and that's what i meant by org specific org or country specific data so this is a new internal table two different internal tables the first select select blah 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 from kna1 into it underscore kunal or kna1 it's this internal table and then the second select is where things get interesting select whatever fields from knvv the second table for all entries in it underscore kna1 okay so this is the key where you can have all the constraints and on top of that you say knvv kunal equals it underscore k n a one corner okay so from here all the way until here you are using the for all entries which essentially is a two step process this is step number one where the first internal table so contains all the data that we need to pull out of the first table table 1 and that is done using this select so table 1 internal table 1 and the first select select 1 okay so we got all the customer numbers that we need there is another internal table right and another table as well so table 2 internal table 2 and then the second select the second in the second select we're going to select or pull some columns but for which customer numbers the list of customer numbers is got from this internal table and that's what this for all entries in internal table does so it iterates over all the entries in the first internal table where this condition is fulfilled and then pulls data from the second table this is basically a, an alternate version like i said to the join a join like i said is much much more efficient well i'm not debating how much efficient each of them are but the point being a join is much more cleaner a join does all of the things behind the scenes in the database the database does the bulk of the load 
but this for all entries is a more in memory application server oriented thing meaning the application server does some of the logic of joining this data behind the scenes for you well not technically a join but achieving the same result and that's why i said i'm not a big fan of for all entries because it has its it has a bit of an overload okay so let's let's write it in the system okay sc38 zz seva this is day 3 right so day 3 underscore customer list for all let's just say for all entries okay for all entries example of for all entries executable program save it local oops local object and then we're going to use two tables right parameters uh, p underscore kunar q n n r type kunar right we're just going to have one customer then internal tables types begin of ty underscore k n a 1 right the first table then it's going to have just kunar that's it you can have more but this is a good start end of ty underscore corner so this is the first internal table then the second internal table is big enough ty underscore knbv the country specific data and then it's going to have corner type corner then we need org specific data so vk org think of org as country type vk org and then what else do we need let's open another screen and then look at what do we have in knvv knvv contains kunnar vk org and then the name of the person who created the object the date on which it was created so on and so forth right if there is so much of data let's just pull in rnam and rdat okay ernam type ernam erdat type erdat comma end of ty underscore comma okay now now that we got our types done let's do a quick syntax check okay it says name specified at end of ty underscore kunar okay this is not kunar it's k n v v right so we have started with k n a v k n v v we end with k n v v syntax check okay same thing here n a 1 another syntax check okay so far so good now we're going to do our data statement right we need to declare two internal tables it underscore kna1 type table of ty underscore kna1 we don't even need a work area for this it underscore knvv type table of ty underscore knvv then we also need a work area for this wa underscore knvv type ty underscore knvv so this is the work area that we're going to use uh, to massage data from this internal table right so we got that covered say you want to do a quick check everything is okay now the magic select what do we need Kunar, just Kunar for now. From KNA1 into table IT underscore KNA1 where Kunar equals P underscore Kunar. Based on the selection criteria of the user, we're going to do a select statement. Now we're going to write another select statement. Select Kunar 
wiki org add that or rnam add that right all these four different elements of the structure or type into table it underscore knvv right from knvv the table for all entries in this is the alternative to the join so for all entries in it underscore the first internal table kna1 where kunnar equals it underscore kna1 dash kunnar right save it and do a syntax check okay something is wrong here let's see where it is it underscore knvv is not known why is that knvv not nn okay see syntax check okay everything looks okay uh, with our select and then we need to loop at it right now i'm not going to do this loop because it's going to be the same loop with the same set of write statements instead all i'm going to do is make sure everything is checked and then do an activate and just do a right here okay right end okay and like so check activate everything is okay and i'm going to put a breakpoint here because i don't want to do that right instead i'm going to do something else now execute this okay I'm going to select 1400 as the customer hit execute the debugger should kick in and it would stop at that select state now by this time the first select is complete right and it has already put the data into this table internal table it underscore kna1 right so double click on it underscore kna1 and you'll see that there is one row one into one meaning one row by one column and if you double click that it will show you that number right just just one row of internal table with one column okay go back to desktop 3 or desktop 1 wherever that code is now it runs through this select okay so do an f6 and from here the arrow has moved here right now this table the second internal table it underscore k in vv says it has one by four right double click that and you'll see that this data is available for one sales or order meaning for the customer 1400 the table k in vv contains just one entry is that true Let's check that. Customer 1400, right? Execute. Okay, just one entry. Uh, let's take another customer, say 1000. Okay, see in how many territories this customer exists. This territory, that there are five or six different territories, right? Each of these territories represent either a country or a region, it could be a state. For example, if you are in the US, these territories could represent either the entire country or they could represent a set of states like West, all of West could be one territory of sales org, all of East could be one territory of sales org, or each state could be a sales org or territory. Now, we don't bother about that. We just want to see how many entries are being picked up. Now, how many entries are here? One, two, three, four, five, six. Right? So let's go back and finish our program and instead of 1400 let's put in 1000 and execute it again now it's going to hit the breakpoint again and we know that this is one customer in there it underscore kna1 contains one entry all good and that's going to be 1000 now the second select that's going to run on knvv let's go one more step downwards this step is complete so double click on it underscore knvv and do you see these six entries 
six for the number of rows and four the number of columns double click on that and these sales orgs or territories would be exactly similar to what we have seen in the data browser for knvb just now essentially we have achieved the same thing isn't it joining two tables together versus the use of for all entries some abappers prefer this approach well, there are specific advantages to using this approach for all entries but that's something we'll talk about at a later point but just understand that these are there are two ways to do it one is using the table join and the other is using the for all entries all right so far in day 3 we've understood database design now like i was saying most of the database tables are already designed by sap so you don't really have to design these database tables as often as you think but sometimes you will have to create them your understanding of database design is the key to be able to create these database tables the way they should be created okay let's look at an exercise so so far we have seen the customer master design right now in this exercise we are going to talk about the material master design the customers are you and me we go to walmart purchase stuff we go to amazon purchase stuff or a company like starbucks or bank of america purchasing uh, say coffee from starbucks right those huge machines that make coffee at office right or or a company like ge purchasing goods from bosch the company the company that sells hardware right or a hospital example that i've taken the hospital purchases mri scanners from ge so the hospital becomes the customer right they are buying it what is the material the material is that mri scanner now in this exercise we are going to create database tables or design database tables for creating customer tables so what is the business scenario walmart has millions of materials okay we know that these materials need to be maintained in multiple languages okay very good the primary data that every material has are description gross weight net weight just three parameters for every material and then the materials are classified into the following groups so this looks like the way we have done customer grouping this looks like material grouping and then each walmart store acts like a plant right plant is where you maintain or stock goods so stock of each of the materials need to be maintained at the plant level so walmart at any given point of time needs to understand how much stock is there for a particular material in each of its stores this is the exercise simple enough right so what is the solution so let's go design this uh, table right the first thing that we want is these materials need right to be maintained in multiple languages so that's the first statement that we have need to be maintained in multiple languages so we have a material right material number which is a unique code that's used to identify that material right a code could be like one character 10 characters 18 characters 20 characters whatever the user wants and then we also need to maintain a material description right so material number is typically a code more or less like a code Right? material description is, is is the actual description of it in i uh, say 40 words or 60 words right so this describes what that material does what that material is for example um, material number could be a code like mlk ff g1 right what does it mean the description for it could be fat free milk one gallon you get the point right and the requirement says 
that this description needs to be maintained in multiple languages. So language is a key. So meaning if it is a Japanese, there is a material description for it. If it's English, there is a material description for it. If it's Spanish, there is a description for it, right? So the fat-free milk one gallon is a description in English. So in English, it's going to be fat-free milk, blah, blah, blah. And in Japanese, it's going to be, I don't know, the same thing translated in Japanese. And in n number of languages because Walmart sells in so many different countries. So that's all we could get from that little statement. So let's go back. The primary data that every material has are a description. Of course, we have covered that. And gross weight and net weight. Okay. So we need something called as gross weight. So this is how much it weighs with the packaging and stuff. And then we have net weight. This is how much it weighs if you remove the packaging, right? The gross weight of the TV is 20 pounds. And if you remove all the packaging and cardboard on the styrofoam, maybe it only weighs like 12 kilos or 12 pounds, right? So gross weight, net weight. Okay, and then the materials are classified into the following groups for reporting and analytics. Uh, the reason why these materials or customers or any kind of data or transactions or group into, you know, these kinds of groups, for example, in this case, food and beverages, electronics, clothing, there are many reasons. I'll give you one reason. At the end of the day, Walmart is trying to make business, right? They're trying to make money. So some CEO or sales manager wants to know how much of total sale did he make for that plant or store in the electronic section. How does he do that? Unless he knows all the materials that belongs to the category of electronics, right? Thumb drives, CDs, camcorders, cameras, phones, all that stuff is electronics, right? And then food and beverages, milk, yogurt, cheese, drinks, chips, that's all food and beverages. Now, like I said, one of the reasons could be, give me the total sales of electronics. right? Unless you classify a material as belonging to the category of electronics, you will not be able to answer that question. There are more uses of it. For example, say the store manager has got a budget to promote whatever he chooses, depending on the location. right? And say the budget is ten thousand dollars now now how does he know which products to promote I mean, he can't just do a blanket promotion right that's useless so in order to make those decisions he needs data okay does it make sense to spend ten thousand dollars as promotion for electronics or food or clothing or distribute it between all of them in a, in a particular proportion that would depend on a variety of factors, like what's the footfall in a particular time of the day and what are they trying to buy, right? So based on that, he might try to use that promotion amount for specific timings, maybe put up stalls that, that focus on a particular brand, right? Or um, use cross-selling, like, you know, beer goes with diapers, right? Uh, you, you must have heard that example. or put salsa along with chips right and in order to do that maybe he might require some uh, decoration for that in order to specifically promote that particular combination he might use that money to do the decoration right so it, it all depends so until you try to categorize products you'll not be able to do that kind of stuff and that's the reason why products customers transactions are categorized now we want to categorize them for whatever reason into three possible combinations, right? I would call it material group. And how would a material group look like? Material group would look like something like this. FB could be called food and beverages. EL could be electronics. So on and so forth, right? You don't have to essentially do it. You could just say food and beverages and be done with it, not have a code but we'll realize the importance of a code at a later point. 
for now just let's do it this way okay what else so we say each walmart store acts as a plant forget about the word plant each walmart store needs to maintain its own stock meaning the manager needs to understand how much stock of any product that is available in that particular store you can think of plant as a store doesn't matter so we need stock data at plant level so meaning we need plant data meaning how many plants are there or how many stores are there we can call it store no problem so we need store data and we need stock by a particular store right so we need stock data we need plant data as well so plant meaning plant or store so these are the different parameters that we have uh, identified based on the description that we have seen in the previous slide now let's go about you know creating or normalizing this data into different tables we can obviously we can put all of this in one table right but that's not going to be very effective there is going to be a lot of data redundancy data accuracy will be lost integrity will be lost we have seen all of those examples when we talked about database design in the context of normalization now let's try and normalize this data into different tables okay so let's put all of these things together into one table right so this is material number and then material description language gross weight net weight blah 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 and then store data stock stock is just a quantity okay let's assume that now we need to separate this so what is the main key parameter that's used to identify material material number of course so material number and what else can go with it you can have the material description very good and language very good now can you have material description well you can you cannot but i would not go with material description let me tell you why simple reason is for every language there's going to be a different material description meaning for example if the table looks something like this okay milk one gallon that's the material number and then material description now the same material could have multiple descriptions right like uh, this is milk one gallon in english and the same milk one gallon is now something else in japanese now this is duplicacy right unnecessary so what we're going to do is create another table called material description and it's going to have three columns material number which is going to tie this with this right and then language key which language do we want the description in and the actual description so we're essentially pulling all this away into this table does it make sense so we're going to only have the basic data that doesn't have a lot of variations so language on description has a lot of variation we don't want to club that into the main table so this is the main table material table and this is the material description table okay what else do we have that's that's really unique to every material without having too many variations how about gross weight does it vary with plant or store or language it does not right so there's only one possible gross weight for a material at least as of our understanding same thing with net weight right so let's put that into the main table so instead of material description let's put gross weight net weight so milk 1 gallon is going to be like 2 pounds and the net weight without the box and everything is going to be like 1.5 pounds right so the milk 2 gallon is going to be 4 pounds and maybe 3.5 pounds right now this is all cool you don't need to really separate the weight into a separate table it's not necessary because there are no variations which essentially result in duplicate data okay 
and how about material group now material group has these two different columns right now the reason why it's it's separated into two columns is every time you want to reference the material group you don't have to put all this big chunk of data right you can just say fb and that cross references to food and beverages so for ease of use you typically use codes to represent something else that's put in another table so what we can do essentially is create a table for material groups and in the main table just link this particular column right so we, we're going to have another table called material group and over here we're going to have two columns one column is group code and group description so it's going to be like um, food and beverages is the code and this is the actual description food and beverages right so we can include the code here group code into the main table and uh, this is called food and beverages food and beverages say for example you have a third product called uh, camcorder camcorder right it's it's one pound and uh, 0.75 pound is the net weight and what's the classification here electronics el for electronics and the code here could be el which ties the group code to the material right and then we have stock and plants and stores and all this stuff so how do we design this part stock is essentially how much of stock do we have at hand meaning how many camcorders do we have and that is maintained by store so the how many stores do we have there needs to be some kind of a store data right so we need something like this store table and that's going to have store number and store description or name so this could be like store number one is on 1000 this could be address so this could be on 1000 park drive chicago right this could be number two 100 station road new york something like that right so we can separate the store data into one table right where we have a set of data that logically should belong together like you know this is all related to metadata associated with stores like what is the store number where is it located maybe an address maybe other details like who who work there like employees and any other details is parking available of course it's going to be available but just any other parameters that identify that particular store and then we're going to have another stock plant right the stock plant is going to be something like this material number store stock see so material number is let's say milk two gallons or one gallon store one and the stock is uh, we got a hundred one gallon jugs or jars or you can say camcorder store two we have five in stock right so what we need now is is two more tables one for store or stores which contains just two columns right store number store address like store number one store number two and store number one is located on 1000 park drive chicago store number two is some other place so on and so forth then we need the stock table stock this is material number store and stock quantity so material number milk one gallon in store number one has 100 gallon jars and the same material in store number two can be just two jars right and uh, say camcorder store number one has like five quantity does it make sense so out of this uh, seven or eight odd fields that we have chosen initially 
based on the requirements. We have normalized it into different sets of tables and they are all linked together using primary foreign keys. For example, now this table material and material description are linked with the material number. So the material number here is going to be the same as the material number here. And the material and material group are linked with the group code. Material and stock are going to be linked with the material and stock and the store is going to be linked with this. Right? It's like a map. One thing points to another. Now what you have to ask yourself at this point is, am I able to effectively store and retrieve this data? from these tables based on what I need at any point in time. Now what do I mean by that? For example, if the user wants to know what is the stock of a particular material in a particular store, how do you do that? Well, the material key main table is the material and then we have stock and then we have store. That's all we need, isn't it? You combine or join, do an inner join between material, stock and store and you have whereby using the where clause you combine this equal to this and store equal to store number. Now you have the material, any other parameters associated with that material like gross weight, net weight, and the store number where store equal to 2 for example, okay store equal to 2. Material is milk 2 gallons. Okay, material is that. And what's the stock? Number 2. And you also have the address for store number 2, whatever that address is. Right? Another query. Give me the stock of all the food and beverages in store number 1. Right? So, first thing is we have to identify all the materials in store number 1. So the first thing is, first you have to identify all the materials that belong to food and beverages. So a join between material group and material will essentially give us all the materials that belong to food and beverages. Right? Now once you have filtered down those materials, you can join between this table and this table and this and this table. If necessary, you don't have to do it. You don't have to do this one. This is optional. You want to have the description of the store? Go there. Otherwise, this is optional. If you want to find out all the food and beverages in store 1, right? So, the join between this table and this table should give you all the materials that belongs to food and beverages group. And a join between this table and this table will essentially give you all the materials in store 1 that are food and beverages, right? If you want to also have the description of these materials in English, you can then join this table with this table. And for every material, just use language equal to EN and you have the description of that material in English. Now, this is the design part. You also want to create them, right? Now, we have already gone through the process of creating customer tables in very great detail. I want you to create these tables in SAP using your own data elements and cross-reference them using the primary and foreign keys. Right? So for example, this could be like material zz underscore mat. Right? That's the name of the table. And it has four columns or four key fields. It could be mat or zmat underscore num and z g gross underscore weight and then z n underscore weight these are the column names and then we have z g underscore code for group code and each of these columns or column names need a data element Right? So you create a data element, it could have the same name, zmat underscore n, and it, you could give it a character of 20 in length. Right? So that way you can reuse this data element here, 
here, here, right? Three different places where you can use that. And the gross weight is going to be a quantity field. This is going to be a quantity field as well. And the group code um, could be characters of two in length. And that data element could be used here and here. Right? So you get the idea, isn't it? So that's how you create these tables and cross-reference them using the primary foreign key and you reuse those data elements so that the labels and the consistency of how you define a material, for example, is equal across all the tables. Meaning, you don't define 20 characters in length of material in this table and in this table you don't, you don't want to redefine it as something else. It could be 20 characters or 18 characters. That, that results in inconsistency, right? The, the relationship between this table and this table is lost. We don't want that. We want that relationship between the primary and foreign keys of tables to be consistent. And that's what preserves integrity. So, we have come to the end of day three and uh, we are going to go into day four. Let's quickly summarize what we have learned in three days. We have learned quite a lot of stuff. Just that it was not in a particular order. So what have we learned? On day one, we started with a simple set of programs. Of course, it was the Hello World program that we started with. And over the course of writing these four programs on day one, we have learned quite a lot of stuff, right? Same thing on day two. So we have written six programs and on day three, we talked mostly about databases and maybe one program. So in the course of three days, now you know what are the building blocks of ABAP, right? We have seen that in the very first day. And what have we covered in this entire set of building blocks? So here is what we have covered, well, not in its entirety, but we have seen some parts of these boxes. So we know what are reports, forget about classical reports, we'll talk about that later. We know what are basic reports. Any program that starts with the word report is a report. We know what are internal tables, we know what is program flow, how the program flows, meaning if statement, else statement, loop statement, do while. Then we kind of know a bit about SQL, like a select statement. We know how to define variables, define an integer variable, right? And then we have covered data dictionary in quite a bit of depth. So we know what tables are, what are primary keys, foreign keys, data integrity, consistency. So given a situation, we can design tables and normalize the tables. And operators are plus, minus, divided by, and then, you know, stuff like that. And we have seen the plus operator, right? A plus B equal to C. So at the end of day three, these are the things we have learned. So anytime you want to come back and refer to what we have learned in three days, this is the slide that you wanted to go through. So these are the things that we have covered in OpenSQL. This is what we know about classical reports. These are the functional concepts that we have learned so far. What kind of loops and program flows have we learned? Right? We have learned a bit about debugging, the operator plus. We have learned internal tables quite a bit of data dictionary and something about variables, data types and tables. So every so often we'll pause and then look at the big picture like this so that you understand where you are and how far you have come. And believe me, 
I'm going to need a separate PowerPoint just to summarize what we have learned as we keep going forward through the number of days. Probably by day 10 or 12, I'm going to have like three or four different pages of uh, what we have learned so far all the way from the beginning. So that was the summary for day one to day three. Now, for those of you who are confused or not able to put your finger on some of the things, like for example, um, in SQL, I've talked about the select statement, right? We have covered the select statement probably 10%. So if you're wondering what happened to the remaining 90%, that's going to be covered as we go forward, right? So there are a lot of gaps in how we have progressed so far. But what we have achieved so far is lay a foundation, a framework. It has some holes in it, yes. But it does show you a path. You know a little bit of many different things at this point. And then we're going to keep plugging in those holes until we have a real smooth understanding of the key concepts of ABAP. So let's move on to day four. Okay, so day four program 13 so we know the table vbak right vbak is the header table and vbap is the item table so so far we have seen how to extract data from this table or from this table or a combination of this and this using the join state Right? And we also know that we need to create an internal table which combines elements from this table and this table. And that's what we are going to select our data into. So what we are going to learn in this chapter is we are going to talk a little bit about the database tables, VBAK, Sales Order Header, and VBAP. And then we're going to talk about some stuff like select options, how to write left justified, right justified, and then how to format the color a little bit. Right? Remember in one of the first standard SAP reports that we have seen, it was really beautiful. You know, there were lots of colors, it was formatted right, there were boxes. We know how to create a box, but we don't know how to color our report. Right? So we're going to talk about color. Okay, so let's start with the standard SD tables. So we know that uh, there is a header table, there is an item table. But let's explore what the header and item tables are. We kind of went through it at one point, but we're going to go through it again. So the sales order header contains items that are relevant across the entire order. Let's take an example. You go to Walmart. I said the first, you know, like 20% of the page of the bill is basically the header data. What does it contain? Your card number, credit card number, right? Uh, 100, zero, zero, and then there will be a bunch of X's, and then 230, let's say, right? And then maybe if you have a rewards card or a loyalty card, that will be printed there. If your name is listed there, it will be printed there total and then the store details like which store you are purchasing in it's the store on the park avenue or chicago so on and so forth. There's, there are some so the bottom line is there are some details that are relevant for the entire order so this is the header right and here we have line items or lines so this is more or less like this so this is line item one, shampoo, quantity one, and the price is, uh, let's say, $5. So this is quantity, this is value, right? Line item two is um, beer, quantity two. We don't want less beer, right? We want more beer. And the price is like, what should I put? Like $10, $5? Let's say five dollars, right? 
and the list goes on and on and on at the very end you'll have the total price 5 plus 5 let's say is 10 dollars right and then your discounts um tax if you have paid any all that stuff will come at the bottom right so we have a header section and we have a line item section so keep this in your mind because you'll be working a lot uh, with sales and purchases most of the time above consultants one way or the other work on sales sd or mm tables the other two major examples are fi finance and hr but these are not the only functional areas there are many many other areas like production planning crm srm but i'm just giving you the most basic and most commonly used examples okay so this entire header data is available in vba k and most of the line item data is available in vba p this is vba p right so what kind of data is available here really so here is the vba k table and it has what kind of data so the document number which is the order number and the date on which it was created right if it's created today you'll get today's date the time on which it was created who has created it right and uh, the product division right for walmart it might not make a lot of sense because you purchase products across the line electronics food stuff groceries so on and so forth but if a big company say ge is is selling goods you know their customers would not go across divisions a person buying uh, a train from ge locomotive is probably only interested in trains he's not interested in buying bulbs or he's not interested in buying other power equipment right so the kind of division or the group of products that the customer purchases in a b2b scenario is kind of fixed right sales office for example what is a sales office this is something similar to your store the walmart has a store right which store did you buy or purchase your goods in so similarly in a b2b scenario say for example even for b2c uh, say you place your order for a in new internet connection okay say comcast place an order and then the order will be routed to the nearest uh, geographical sales office right so on chicago west side of chicago there might be like two sales offices and depending on the nearest location you might um, be asked to reach out to a particular office in the west side of chicago so that's your sales office that is the office that is selling you that connection right similarly if you were taking a quotation say for example uh, you are going to a car dealership and you are taking a quotation you are taking a quotation today and then he has offered you his best price say a uh, $20,000 for a Civic or $40,000 for a brand new Beamer how long is that quotation valid it will not be valid forever right he will not be offering you that price if you come the next year it's probably valid for a week or two that is what these dates indicate valid from and valid to right and i can go on and on and on about the business functionality of uh, the sales order header and what's there in the line item and don't think it is not important because without this kind of knowledge you wouldn't know what kind of code you'll be writing that's the problem so functional knowledge is as important as technical knowledge to an abap consultant okay never underestimate the functional knowledge in the area that you're trying to work on so this is vbak the sales order header and then we can have vbap this is the sales order item okay what do we have so we have the primary key as the order number and item you see now do you do you understand the power of normalization 
so both the header and line item could be put in just one table but no that's not the right way to do it right data needs to be normalized and it is normalized the header table contains vbeln as the primary key the sales document number and the item contains the position also so the order number is 101 right think of the token number that you get when you go order in uh, uh, say mcdonald's right he'll give you a number order number 232 that's your order number or sales document number and then these are items so to uniquely identify what is line number two of a particular order you need both the order number and line number isn't it and that's why you have these two keys as the primary key in case you are wondering what this field is we're not there yet okay so we'll get to it okay and then we have the material number so this is where you put your shampoo right and then batch number you have seen batch numbers at the back of your product right a shampoo has a particular batch number a bagel has a batch number a bread has a batch number right the batch in which it was manufactured and then type of item is it relevant for billing not all items are relevant for billing for example if you get something that's free of cost associated with another item it's not relevant for billing right what's the quantity what's the unit of measure I, I need one shampoo and the unit of measure is each right i need say for example uh, if you go, so if you go to a store like uh, whole foods market so you have the pulses or nuts section where you can go and uh, just just download as much as you want like you want 100 grams or 50 grams you can just download that and then bag it up weigh it right and then go to your counter so your quantity there would be like let's say you you got 530 grams of walnuts you bag it and then the unit is uh, kilos or pounds right so it's uh, roughly half a kilo so, so that's a unit of measure there are different kinds of units of measures it's either count like 12 bagels or it's weight you can get five pounds of chicken or half a pound of walnuts right i think that's a good start we have a good understanding of uh, the different fields that exist in the order now what we are going to do is write this program okay that pulls in different kinds of data let's say we are interested in the order number okay and created by who has created it the clerk who has created that order and the items in that order okay the material shampoo beer so on and so forth the item is item number one item number two item number three and then quantity okay how many quantities of shampoo or how many quantities of beer and then we also need the value one beer five dollars so this is going to be one beer and the quantity is going to be five dollars and this is going to be saying beer and this is line item two right beer is line item two and then created by whoever has created it order number is let's say five and we want a list so if you want to select um, all the orders say five thousand to five thousand five all those orders should come up or uh, you want to just search by all the orders created by a person say bollinger user id you could put your user id if you have created orders or you don't want to put anything else you want to just say give me all the orders that has the material beer right with parameters as selection criteria you can't really do this kind of stuff right you want to be able to search on all these parameters maybe not net value or quantity but these four parameters at least you want to be able to search on them and then print out these six parameters so how do you do that now we know about parameters right what are parameters a parameter is used to select your data 
right? You want to show only a particular order or a particular material or a combination. So let's start there. SC38. So this is our program, and the title is going to be sales orders listing. Sales order listing. It's going to be an executable program. Save it. Assign it as a local object. Okay, so these things that you see here are just messages. I didn't want them to be at the bottom because uh, if you see them at the bottom, uh, I might not be able to show them because the screen is more focused on the top um, left corner. So what I've done is I went here, clicked on options, and if you go to I think somewhere here, interactive design, right, and then these are the check marks I've done. If you do it this way, uh, all the messages will be shown as pop-ups, irrespective of if they are warnings or errors or any of them, they'll all be shown as pop-ups. So that way, you'll be able to quickly see what's going on. Okay, so this is our program. And what are the tables that we want? So the tables uh, that we're interested in are VBAK, VBA. Okay, and then typically this is how we go about doing it. Parameters, p underscore vbell. I know it's vbell because I've been coding for quite some time, but you don't have to really worry about it. You'll eventually get there. We know that it's vbak, right? Just double click vbak, save, yes, and here is vbl. And it's of type vbell underscore va, right? So that's the sales order number. And then we have Ernam, the name of the person who has created, right? So these are the three variables that you need from the header. So remember, this comes from order header vbak, uh, vbak, and uh, what else? Maybe created on created on right? this date on which it was created and that's also going to come from VBAK okay so let's select these three parameters VBEL ERDAT ERNAM so like I said you don't have to remember them you can just copy from here right uh, so here is what I'm going to do I'm going to do a control Y allows me to do a vertical selection so if you normally do this kind of a selection right like this you can only select that particular cell right I can't go beyond that cell it's not possible but if you do a control Y right the cursor turns into a crosshair and then you can do different kinds of selections like this right anyway so we have selected the fields that we want or some of them and then I'm going to just paste it here, right? So we know that uh, the parameter vbel is of type vbel underscore va and comma. Uh, do a bunch of tabs, tab, tab, tab. Okay, the next one is p underscore red at, which is uh, the date, right? It represents the date on which uh, the order was created. So delete. And then comma p underscore air nam the name of the person who has created it and then of type air nam right and then comma yeah we need a comma because we want to add a couple more parameters maybe just the material number okay so p underscore matner where is this matner coming from it's coming from the line item matner VBAP Matner. Anyway, so we have created the selection parameters, right? And then we are going to now create internal table or the type for the internal table that's going to hold all this data. How is that going to look like? So it's going to be types, ty underscore, let's just say order. So this order is going to contain both header items, line items. And then Oh, this is going to be big enough, right? Big enough ty underscore order. Then do a tab, 
and we need order number I'll do a double tap so that if um, the field is bigger in length you can accommodate it in a straight line type vbell underscore va that's the domain or data element for order number tap 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 and then rnam we need the name tap tap type rnam right and then rdat type rdat the, the date and then fastener represents the item number so it's um beer is line item two and line item one was shampoo right so fastener represents um, the line number type fastener or position number probably that's what it represents so these are all standard sap provided uh, data elements so you don't have to really think twice they just work okay matner this is type matner now we need quantity right so where is quantity i don't know where quantity is so let's go uh, quickly save this guy the program and um or oh, not vbak vbap right vbap okay uh, where is the quantity quantity should be here somewhere let's just search for quantity q u a n t y quantity okay target quantity in sales units i don't think this is it it must be uh, something that starts with a k k w meng i think this is it Okay, KW Meng. Well, it's your functional consultant who gives you the specs will kind of give you all of this stuff. Uh, but like I said, an experienced above consultant always knows all of this basic stuff, right? So I might not be knowing this um, as a beginner, but the easiest way to know is go to the contents, select an order, right? Let's say 5,000, 10,000, whatever, right? And uh, look at where which column really contains the quantity let's see so this is uh, line item 10 material 17 we want to see where the quantity is this looks like quantity but it has zero so it's not the one this looks like quantity but it's really conversion factor so that's not the one this is scale quantity this is rounding quantity let's see where is quantity 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 okay order quantity this looks like it right now what is the technical name for it order quantity is not it. it it's it's a label but what's the technical name for it you go to settings right user parameters and set it to field name instead of field label okay now again scroll to the right you see that K W Meng K W Meng. This represents quantity. Okay. So go back, go back, and we need the quantity, right? Type K W Meng. Okay, that's quantity. And what about net value? Net value is network N E T W R. Again, you can do this. You can double click it. You can see what's the value and pick up the column name from that. I just happen to know it, so I'm going to put it here. Network type network. Right? And then end of type underscore order. Uh, just do a pretty printer um, to align everything. Okay? Save this guy. Okay. Now we need to declare the data element or the data for the internal table or rather internal table using uh, data keyword. IT underscore order is going to be our internal table and it's of type table of ty underscore Mara. So we are declaring it as an internal table of type ty underscore Mara and the work area because we want to be able to work with a particular row of that internal table it's going to be declared like this right type ty underscore order without the table keyword all right so 
we have declared the tables and we have allocated a place in memory using the data statement where we store the data basically the internal table and now what else do we need we need to pull the data from the database table based on the user selection and then put it into it underscore order the internal table how do we do that select statement of course we need data from two tables vbak vbap and what do we need we back tilde vbel right and then we back tilde ernam so everything that we pulled or what we want to pull from the the header right these three fields will all be pulled from vbak vbak and then error dot so like i said these three columns are done with they are all from vbak these four columns are from the line item table vbap so let's go to vbap postner vbap matnal vbap okay i think we've got all the seven elements right 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 okay now from which tables do we need to pull them from vbak as vbak vbak becomes the alias right and then from vbap but what kind of a join do we do do we do an inner join or an outer join we basically do an inner join because we want that tight coupling inner join vbap as vbap right we have mentioned the tables very good but what's the condition based on which those two tables can be combined what's the common common feature between these two tables we go to vbak we bell is the order number that's the primary key go back and go to vbap and we bell is the common feature so this one field should be good enough for us to combine both these two tables into a tight inner join okay so go back and say on this is the condition that's used to join these tables together internally we back tilde we bell equals we map the line item table tilde we bell so both these tables contain that we bell field and we are using that to join these two tables together okay and where do we want to put it into this table right it underscore order so it's going to be it it underscore order and remember when you mention the internal table you have to use the word or keyword table into table it underscore order okay let's not do it now and see what kind of error we get okay so into order okay now starts the where clause where okay where we back we bell equals p underscore we back this is the selection of the user right so we want to select it select the order based on what the user has selected we bell and oh no comma there it's all one statement and we back ernam the name of the person who has um, created this order equals p underscore ernam right so this guy so these two things are done with and we need just the date and material number okay and oh we be a k i think we be a k dash r dot the date on which the order was created r dot equals p underscore r dot the date right and we be a p because first three parameters are done with 
the last parameter in the selection criteria is the material number. So we map map now. So material number stays at the line item level. P underscore map now. Right? I think that's it. That's our select statement. Okay. Now let's do a quick syntax check. Syntax check. And what do we see here? Ty underscore Mara. Oh, that's not the right one. Ty underscore order. Right? Ty underscore order. Order. Save. Check again. Okay. Uh, you cannot internal use the internal table as a work area. That's a second error. And that's the error you get when you omit the keyword table. So when you omit the keyword table, it assumes that you are referring to a work area. And you can't really select anything into your work area. You have to select it into an internal table. Remember, an internal table is like a grid. It can hold a grid of data. This is an internal table. A single row out of this that's used to manipulate data in the internal table is called the work area. Internal table, work area. These are always used together. Right? Internal table, work area. Okay. So when you don't specify the keyword table here, it thinks it's a work area. Okay. Check again. It says V back Ernam unknown. It's not a dash, it's a tilde. Right? Tilde. Tilde. Okay, check again. It's not VBAL, it's VBAK. Silly errors, right? Check again. Okay, everything is good. Syntactically correct. Okay, so we have declared the parameters, we have declared the type and the data variables, the internal tables and work areas. And finally, we have the select statement. We have got all the data. Now, what else needs to be done? We need to show it on the screen, right? And how do we do that? Uh, we do a loop, right? Loop at it underscore order. The variable into which the select statement has filled the data, right? So, you want to loop at that parameter into our work area work area wa underscore order right we are looping it into the internal table and when you mention into work area so we have already seen this but i'll go over one more time okay and then you do a write statement right what do we need wa underscore order dash v bell wa underscore order dash ernam wa underscore order dash erdat we're just picking the components of the internal table one by one that's it you know it might seem like a whole lot but it's not really the case wa underscore order under dash postner wa underscore order dash matnel right and then let me go to the second line so that you know it doesn't get really too long wa underscore order dash kw man wa underscore order dash net value then we are done here. End the loop. Okay. Check it again for consistency. The program is correct. Pretty printer. Everything is good. Uh, let's see if we can activate and execute this. Okay. So this is what we wanted, right? We want to be able to pull data from the order header and order item based on these parameters. Now if I just say, give me all the data for order number 5000, try and execute this, 
it doesn't pull in anything why let's go back and uh, put a break put a break point here session break point was set okay now execute it again 5000 and execute the debugger will start and uh, it has stopped there right so you might not be able to see it but it has stopped there because that line is highlighted and you'll, you'll see a left arrow so you'll see an yellow arrow in the gutter okay so let's go step by step let's just see what this select statement does remember size sub rc is a, like a global variable that returns zero if the select is successful and it returns something else any other number one two three four some number if the select has not returned any rows okay so go step by step this is step by step i'm going to click on this button the second button right execute button you see this arrow on the left that means the statement has crossed this and has come to this point now what size of rc four that means that there is no data that's returned by this select statement. If you want to check it, you can just double click IT order, which is basically the internal table into which the select would have pulled the data. Double click that, you see zero, right? Zero meaning there is no data. So it's seven columns wide and zero rows of data. There's no data. Okay why is there no data let's quickly open another session go to sc16 data browser or sc11 either way vbak the order header and 5000 execute this data in here right it was created on 24 01 1997 it was created by Bollinger so on and so forth so why is that data not being pulled in the reason is you have given a value for the order number but you didn't give a value in the selection criteria for our nam our dot matner isn't it our nam the person who has created it our dot the date on which the order was created what are those values 2401 1997 and Bollinger right so let's try and execute it again error dot 07 24.07 this is 24th July 1997 okay that's good Ernam is Bollinger just a weird user ID that represents the user and then try to hit execute okay go to the next step the size of rc is still four right what else do we need we need the material okay execute this and what kind of material is there in the 5000 order let's go back to the item table which contains material data vbap enter 5000 is our order and show me all the line items there are four line items 10 20 30 40 right think of it as 1 2 3 4 10 20 30 40 and m17 m-17 is one example of a material so let's put that m-17 okay let's see if this time it pulls in any data execute and go past this select and still it doesn't pull any data we have entered all the parameters right we have entered the order number the name of the person our name, and then our dot the date on which the order was created and the material everything is there why has it not pulled up any data yet it underscore order if you double click on order you will see that there is zero rows so execute and go back 
So 5000 Bollinger, let's double check this data, okay? M-17, that's the material, we know that. Let's go back to V back, 5000, and it's 1997, right? So the date format could be sometimes wrong. Error dot 2407. And let's just copy and paste this error name, Bollinger from here. Right, 5000, this looks okay. Um, maybe the date format is, is wrong, okay? 2407, it's 2401. Let's try that. One, okay. Execute. Let's see if that select pulls in any data. So we are here. Go past one step. The size sub RC is zero and it has gone past that select statement. That means it has pulled in some data. Now just double click on IT underscore order. And you'll see that there is one row here. Right? So we have got some data, which is good. If you double click on it, you'll see the data actually. Order number, the person who has created it, the date, position, material, quantity, and value, right? So execute it all the way through, and then you get that printout, right? Good. So this is our order number, the, the, the red little square like thing right it shows you the entire width that that particular field occupies date uh, line item number material material is a big bigger and then we have quantity right 3.00 and then we have value now we we really don't know what these values are unless we we really have done this program right so three it doesn't say if 3 is quantity or if 3 is uh, value or 3 is something else. So what we're going to do is like put a nice header that shows each of the columns. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that uh, with a write statement of course. And uh, we're going to say write. And the first one is order number. And the second created by and the third is a date created on okay and we need item then we need material and finally the seventh field is value or amount okay so that's our right statement let's check the syntax everything okay Activate, execute. So 5000 order number created on 1997 2401 by Bollinger, and so we have to select all the data when, when you do parameters. Right, it's going to go to debug, but I think we know that it's going to pull in data anyway, so I'm just going to execute. So we got some data here, right? So this is all the data and these are column or titles, right? Order number created by, created on. But we just need to, you know, stretch them all the way so that, you know, they are neatly aligned like so. How do we do that? So this guy needs to be pushed out by one character. And then once that is done there are three characters here but there is one character that is pushed over here so push this by two characters right let's just start there go back and uh, push this out by one character and uh, push this out by two characters remove the breakpoint because we know uh, it's going to pull in data anyway and then save it then push this out by two more characters, save it, and execute. Execute, and this looks okay, right? A little bit okay. So we have pushed this a little bit too far. So let's pull them back. And with, with, with some level of adjustments, um, we'll be able to get to the right positioning that we want. There are other ways to do this without having to go through 
this kind of a manual adjustment but we'll, we'll get there okay execute okay so it's it's slowly coming to shape it's not fully there yet but it's it's slowly getting there so all we need now is to push out quantity and value but it might not be that bad because you know quantity is really at the right place because this is where the column is really starting so let's just push um, value by one two three four five six characters or seven characters and we should be done go back okay so this looks more like it it's 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 almost there now now if there were more rows i would really like this um, header right this column definition to have a different color so i just want to give it nice red or blue color so that you know you can really look at it and say that these are the column definitions and then we have data underneath that so how do we do that so there's something called as format format okay color and then you can have 0 through 7. 1, 2, 3, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, you don't have to remember all those colors, but you just try some colors, okay? So format, color, and then format, color, uh, off, right? So we don't want color for all the line items. We just want it for the header. That's it, right? Check if there is any syntax issues. Looks like okay activate it because we are fairly sure everything seems okay and execute okay this looks a little bit better right there's a nice blue hue on the column headers and then we have one ten or hundred columns underneath it another thing is the quantity quantity is actually right aligned typically quantities and values are right aligned right it makes sense that values are right aligned because you know when you add things up it makes sense that you know right alignment makes counting them visually easy but sometimes you might not want that for example quantity you might want it to be left aligned right meaning you want this three to start here instead of aligning itself to the right just like how we do it in word right right align left or justify something like that so the way to do that is we want quantity be to be right aligned right so let's um, put a dot here and start another right line right 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 wa underscore order okay and uh, this is called left justify okay then we can start another right right w order score only this particular column the quantity is being left justified execute you see that quantity is now left justified the value is as usual is right justified if we can just pull this value column a bit to the right then this report alignment is perfect okay options let me tell you why we need select options or what select options are for example i want to view all the data for a couple of orders say 5000 5001 5002 345 from 5001 all the way through 5005 i want all the data for all those orders with parameters, you only have the facility to view or enter one parameter, just one order number. That's it. But you might want more order numbers, right? The details for more order numbers. How do you do that? The way to do that is to use what is called as select options. Okay. Select options. Okay. And instead of P underscore V bell. This is a parameter, right? P underscore VBEL. I'm going to use S underscore VBEL to signify that it of type select options. And I can't do type. Instead, I have to do for. Okay? But just understand that select options 
has to use for and parameters has to use type for what for v back v bell okay put a dot and remove this guy here we don't need two ways of doing it select options is going to be used to display the order number and parameters for the rest of them let's do a quick syntax check and what do you see here the field p underscore v bell is unknown makes sense right we have completely deleted it instead we have put in s underscore v bell right now let's do another syntax check okay this is okay but still there is something wrong with it we're gonna find out how okay check activate execute okay this is more like it right so we want everything from 5000 to 5005 right or 5005 oh. okay there you go and then we have order number and the rest of the stuff as is okay execute you don't get anything right why is that because because the way select options work is different from the way parameters work okay for select options in the select condition you don't use an equal to but instead use something called as a in i n in okay now so let me explain why that is the way equals to work is different from the way in works so in versus equal to in the select statement so imagine a grid like this okay just a very simple grid v back table okay v bell order number arnam and so on and so forth now when you say select anything from v back a couple of rows where v bell in and then you can specify a bunch of parameters like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 order numbers or order numbers 1 through 10. That's only possible with the keyword in. But you only want one row which is row number 5000. Then you don't use in but instead you use vbell equals 5000. Just one piece of data. So if you want to select multiple rows for a particular column, you use in. And if you want to select based on just one value, use equal to. So for all selection options, select options, options, you use in. And for parameters, you use equal to. Okay. Now that we have put in in here, let's check the syntax activate execute okay now let's execute okay so there's only one order for 5000 bollinger created by bollinger created by material m0 m70 which is good but what about 5001 is there no order for 5001 actually let's check it sc16 BBAK. Then let's see if there is a 5000 all the way through 5005. If it doesn't exist, then our data is right. But looks like it, these orders do exist. So why are they not coming up? They are not coming up because some of them are not created by Bollinger. 5004, for example, is not created by Bollinger. It's created by Cura. And not all of them are created on a particular date, like 2401. This guy, this row number, order number 5, 5005, is created on 27. So that eliminates these two rows. Now we are left with four orders, 1000, 1001, 2, 3. All of them are created by Bollinger. And all of them are created on 2401. The next piece of selection criteria in our select parameters is Matner, right? 
they've all got to be M17 because that's what we have uh, put in the selection criteria here, right? The rest of the parameters being same. If that orders line item is M17, only then show it. Now we know that the order 5000 has a M17, but does a 5001 have M17? We don't know. What we're going to do is select these four orders 5001 all the way to 3 and go to the line item table, go back, BBAP, okay, and 5000 all the way through 5003. And the material is M17. Okay, execute. You see, there's only one line item in the combination of these two tables that has a material M17. So, what we see in our data is right, there's just one row. But here is something I would want to do just to make the report more flexible. Give me the orders created on a particular date, say 2401. Okay, give me the data associated with all these orders 5001 through 5005 created by Bollinger. But don't bother about the material, it doesn't matter. Give me all the rows. How do you do that with parameter? That's not possible. Okay, so you have to go with select options. So convert the material number parameter into a select option. And let's do it here. Second select option is tab, 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 S underscore Mapner. Okay, for the BAP dash Mapner. Okay, and then we're gonna remove this, put a dot here, that should complete it. And over here, we're gonna say in s underscore matter. Right? Alright, so let's summarize what we have learned in the sales order program. The most important learning is this piece, the SD order tables. Now we already knew before that there are two tables, right? Sales order header and sales order details or line items. What we have learned in this chapter specifically is what kind of data really exists in this header and what kind of data really exists in the details. And we have also learned that a good functional knowledge around sales, purchases, or HR, or FI tables, or and functionality is really going to make you a very good ABAP consultant. 50% of the time, a good ABAP consultant is not how much ABAP he knows. It's a good understanding of the tables and the business processes behind the scenes for which he or she is writing the code. Simple, right? As an engineer, unless you know what your user wants, you'll not be able to engineer your stuff. You might be, you might know thermodynamics or you might know how an electric motor works, but it doesn't matter as long as you don't understand what the user wants. And then we talked a bit about justification in the right. So if there is data like this that needs to be written in a grid, right? Order details. Quantity can be left justified. Value, on the other hand, is typically right justified. Right? So you want to be able to count things. 23.00, right? It's easier to count. And quantity can also be right justified. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be left justified, but anything that you want left justified, you use this keyword to the right. And anything that you want to be right justified, you can use right justified. Okay? This is how you adjust values in the columns. And then we have format color. Typical example of formatting color is your titles. First row or the header row needs to stand out. Right? 
So use format color. Write your row using the right statement. All that will be in format color. Uh, let's say color two. There are a range of zero to seven, just eight colors. And then format color all. And anything you write after that will not be colored. But anything you write between format and format off will have a color. Okay. And finally, select options. Select options is the most used way of selecting parameters in a report, as opposed to parameters. The reason why is if you want to select order data based on a couple of parameters, say order number. Order date, order created by, right? If you know the exact parameters, go ahead and use parameters. Okay, but if you want to pull all the data associated with order number one, irrespective of what date it was created and who it was created by, you don't care, right? Any wild card is okay, but you want to have the data for order number one. Parameters. You can't do it. With select options, if you declare these parameters as select options in the report, then instead of doing a strict filtering by these parameters, it'll just say, okay, whatever the user has put in here in the date, if they don't match, that's fine. As long as at least one parameter matches, bring in all the data. So select options is more flexible. Parameters is more rigid. Now, for parameters, there are use cases where you explicitly want to use parameters as opposed to select options. For example, let's take a transaction MB MMBE. This is a transaction to view the list of stock. Now you see that for material, you don't have multiple values. You only have a single value, or display unit of measure. You don't have multiple values, right? Although this is not really a parameter, but it works more or less like a parameter. The only difference is it has this little pop-up kind of thing, which parameter does not have, right? Other than that, this is a select option that that has a lot of restrictions on it. So what I'm trying to say is, when you want to select something based on only one parameter, you don't want to give the user choice, then you can use parameter. If you want to give the user more choice and be more inclusive in your data selection, use select options. Select options is very flexible. There are so many things that you can do with select options, and we're gonna learn more about it as we go forward. So, program fourteen. So, in thirteen, program number thirteen, we have seen how to view a list of orders. So what we have done is very simple. We have just taken a join of VBAK and VBAP, the order header and order line item, and then looked at the internal table, written it out onto the screen. Now there are different kinds of sales orders. Meaning, for example, if you go to a car dealer, you typically shop around. For cars, right? Meaning, if you want to buy a particular brand or a particular type, say an SUV, you shop around, right? You go to Honda, you go to Toyota, you go to some other company. Say you have narrowed your brand to Honda as SUV and a particular type, say the Honda CRV. Now you go to different dealers, dealer one, dealer two, and ask them for quotations, right? So this guy will give you a quotation that gives the terms of the sale and then a price. And the dealer two will also give you a quotation, terms of the sale and the price. Now this is called a quotation. Well, you'll not buy from every dealer, right? You'll only buy from one dealer once you finalize the deal that you like. Say, for example, this is the deal that you like. So with reference to that quotation. You go place an order or put up an advance, right? So this is called an order. And then 
they'll deliver the car to you or suv to you and that will take like say one day today right away or in a couple of days and there's going to be some document that's generated at the time of delivery and that's called a delivery right i'm just trying to rehash what we have learned in some of the previous chapters regarding the sales order cycle just putting it in the context of a different example and the reason why i'm doing that here is you see orders and quotations all of them or rather both of them are called sales documents right and whether it's a quotation or an order all of them reside in the same table vbak so how does the sap system differentiate the quotation from an order there is a category called document type so let me open another window se11 vbac display vb type document category so this column tells you whether a particular document type is a quotation or an order okay so if you go to the data browser let's see if we can pull out some quotations versus orders as of now you see that there is only vbell and kunar for searching but we want to search based on document category let's say okay go to settings fields for selection what do we want to select based off of document category vb type okay and what are the options here you see that if the value is c for that particular row then it's an order if the value is b it's a quotation so let's try to pull up something with value b for vb type so we are just trying to pull up documents sales documents of type quotation okay so this is a quotation 5001761 whatever or 2 1234510 right these are all quotations or you could search by orders as well right c and these are orders so here is our order number 5000 that we have used in the previous program the point i am trying to make is there are these different kinds of documents based on document category and here is what i want to do so this is the previous program so when we allowed the user to select based on vbell matner erdart arnam oh by the way let's go and put these texts go to text elements selection texts then all you have to do is enable sap to get these definitions from the data dictionary okay let's check this again okay this is better right so we have we have allowed the user to select the data from these tables vbak vbap based on sales document material created on created by now in this program we're going to enhance this a little bit okay so here is how we're going to enhance it so i want to put an additional selection here like so it's going to be a checkbox let's going to say quotations only or orders only right this is what essentially we want to achieve so when you select this this only pulls documents from vbak where vb type or document type equals b right so b is for quotation and c is for orders right so if we uncheck this everything is pulled no restriction on vb type but if we check this on then only vb type b from vbac should be pulled in right so we learn two things here how to create a checkbox and how to write a conditional logic that adds this only when the checkbox is checked on okay so let's copy our the previous program and then write on top of that so this was our program so we go back and click on copy button 
So select the program you want to copy and click on copy. If we want to call this instead of sales orders, let's say orders by type. Type meaning orders versus quotations versus contracts, so different kinds of sales documents. Okay. So it looks like the target program already exists and we want to overwrite it, right? We don't want to use it. We want to write that from scratch. So it's overwritten and yep, delete everything that's already there in the target. Okay. So the order type program is now ready. So click on change. So this is a copy of the same program that we have written previously. Now, here is what I want to do. Right next to the select options, so I want to write a parameters, say p underscore quote as checkbox. So this is the syntax to create a checkbox. So we have created a checkbox. Let's just quickly check if we can, we are able to see that checkbox, right? So I'm in, I'm able to see that checkbox, and go here and then put a text here like quotations only so this is a cue to pull up only quotations try that again yes quotations only right so this is a checkbox you can check it on check it off okay now based on the fact that the user has checked on that quotation only then uh, we should modify the select statement in such a way that uh, only need to pull in documents of type quotations if not pull everything else right there are multiple ways to do it but here is a simple way okay so what was our parameters p underscore quote so this is the parameter that contains the value in that checkbox right so if the user has selected that checkbox the value will become x and if not it will be blank so what should we write here so this entire select statement is good if the user has not selected anything in that checkbox if the user has selected something then it should be more like and v back vb type equals b because we only want quotations so this is how the select statement should be if the user has selected the checkbox if not you don't need that and statement right so it's going to be something like this if selected there's going to be one set of select statement else it's going to be this so how do you write that syntax if p underscore quote equals x it should go for one select statement else it should go for another select statement right so let's see if we can write this we want two copies of the select statement right one copy should have an extension an addendum that says v back vb type equals b so that's the only difference and this should apply when if p underscore quote equals x so what this x indicates is the fact that the user has selected this checkbox so that's how we are telling sap that if the quotation checkbox is selected use the select statement else else is fine and then end if right so let's do a pretty printer see if a cv does something yeah so it has indented the select this select here so if p underscore quote equal to x do this right else work on this select and then end if ends that if statement now there are different kinds of if statements if else if or just an else statement different ways in which you can write this if statement but this is a very basic simple if statement and the rest of the program would remain the same i don't really care execute just execute it meaning if i have not selected the checkbox 
you see that the order numbers are 46, 4969, Cura, 4970. You see how the order numbers are starting, right? If I go back and if I select the checkbox quotations only, execute, you see these numbers are different. These are quotations now. The only difference is that a particular column VB type is of value B for these documents and its value C or any other value if you leave that open. If you want to quickly check that, you can do a debug. Like put a breakpoint here and execute. Check for quotations only and double click P underscore quote. The value is X because you have checked it on. So SAP sets the value of that parameter to X. And then because the value is X, if you go inside, this select is going to be executed, which is going to specifically select orders with VB type equals B. If not, of course, the other select will be executed. So that's an if and else statement. If you like warm weather, stay in Texas. If you like cold weather, stay in Chicago. As simple as that, right? So we've learned two things in this program. One is how to create a checkbox. Very simple syntax, parameters, and then p underscore whatever as checkbox. That's it, right? And then we have checked the end if and end if. So if a condition is true, let's say p underscore xx checkbox equals x. And this condition could be written in a variety of ways. You know, this is a very simple condition. There could be more complicated conditions. And then you could just end if, right? If this is this, do that, and that's it. Or you could say, if this is equal to x, do something here, like write a select statement, for example. Else, alter the select statement here, and then end if. So this ends the if with two blocks one in the if block and then the next end if block right now there is another way of doing this p underscore xx equal to x what does this do this checks whether that parameter has been checked on or not there is another parameter called initial so what it does is checks if the user has done something to that parameter or select option, meaning if there is, the user has not touched it, then it stays as initial. So what we can do is, instead of this, we can also write, if p underscore xx is initial, then do something else, do something else. Right? Okay, let's get out of this program. Now, how do you modify this? with the initial keyword. If p underscore quote equal to x, or rather I'm going to say, if p underscore quote is not initial, not initial means that the user has done something with that checkbox. Okay? So the else part assumes that the user has really touched that program, meaning the user has done something in that checkbox. So the else part indicates that the user has touched the checkbox. Let's try if this works. Okay, syntax is okay. Activation is okay. Then execute. Now let's try it without touching that checkbox. Okay, execute. Okay, so P underscore quote is blank. So if you just, so what, what should this if statement do? If it is not initial, meaning is it initial? Yes, it is initial because there's been nothing done on that. So this condition is going to fail and it's going to move on to the else statement. And it's going to execute the simpler select without the VB type. And if you execute, you only get the orders. You get everything, 
orders, quotations, contracts, whatnot. But if you go back and click on this select and click on this checkbox and execute, now since you have touched that checkbox, it's not going to stay initial. So p underscore quote is equal to x. So it's not initial. Now instead of the other select, this if statement is going to pass and this select statement will be executed. Isn't it? See the arrow has moved here. And if you execute, you get quotations. So if you observe, the numbers are going to be different between this select and the previous select. All this data is going to be different as well. The numbers, the data, the dates, everything is going to be different because they represent different documents. Now the way I have written this initial statement is, is not the most straightforward way of doing it because I have written a negation here by saying not initial. But if you want a condition where you want to check whether the user has touched that particular parameter or checkbox or select option or not, you could say p underscore whatever parameter or select option is initial. So initial is the keyword that you use to check whether a particular field has value or not. If it is initial, then the field does not have a value. If the field is not initial, then the field does have some value. You could write it in a different way. For example, so if, I, if you don't want me to not use the negation, you could write it like this. L let me simplify this select, okay? If p underscore quote is initial, okay? meaning if the user has not touched the checkbox then execute this block and if it is not initial execute and if execute this block let me pretty printer it so if it is not initial execute this block if it is initial execute this block so this is a much simpler way to write the if statement instead of using the else i'm just putting an if statement and ending it right there and then another seat if statement and ending it right there right two different blocks very similar to how we have done it previously except that this version is much simpler now we have seen what initial means program number 15. this is going to be very similar to the previous program except that we're going to change the way the parameters are created. Earlier we had these four parameters order number, order date, created by material, and then we had a checkbox here. Right? Another way to do it is you can also have VB type as a select option just in case if the user wants to select something else like what for example orders was vb type b c c was orders b was quote or quotations and then if you look at vb type sc11 v back display Look at technical settings, VB type. For example, G is contract, right? And then there is delivery, so on and so forth, different kinds of document types. Now, earlier we only had a checkbox that said pull every kind of document if I have not selected the checkbox. But if I select the checkbox, only pull the quotations. Simple enough, right? But what if we want to give the user more choice? Meaning the user can select whatever he wants. Put an additional selection parameter or select options whereby the user can select either orders or quotations or contracts or any other document type he wants. It's like giving user more choice, right? 
at the same time we want to also provide this checkbox because we know for sure let's say that the user most of the time selects quotations so we want to provide this checkbox and say quotations only and when you select that let the user pull in only quotations if you don't select it let the user have an option of choosing whatever he wants so this is not how the previous program was built right so here we go let's go back this is our previous program copy it and then what are we going to call it orders say any underscore type just trying to be a little bit more descriptive you know in real time there's some kind of a nomenclature that each company follows and it, it depends on what the client wants okay but typically there is some kind of a naming convention that the client follows and we follow that logic so in our case luckily we don't have a client so we can do whatever naming convention we want okay copy local object of course okay orders any type that's our program and this is what we want to change right so we're going to have quotations only yes but before that we're going to have document category or document type and that's going to be a select options also we can the user can select whatever he or she wants like for example we can select either b or c or g or just one of them and we are still going to have this checkbox quotation only and if the user checks it on we ensure that we add b here automatically so essentially this is an exercise in automatically populating the document category or a select option with a particular value right how do we do that so all we need to do first thing is to add this parameter right or select option how do we do that we know that it's vb type so comma s underscore vb type for vback vb type okay check activate execute now this is our vb type and we could select b or c or g or whatever we want here right it's up to us and you could also select multiple options like go here and then say select i want orders and quotations and contracts execute so you see this box is colored green right so that means that multiple selections are active so this is a quick way to know that this select option has more than one parameter selected already now if you execute this you still only get orders right that's because we have not modified the select condition so how do you modify the select condition we modify the select condition like this vb type equals or rather in s underscore vb type right and i don't want this if statement here because it's no longer relevant all i need is select based on the document type that has been selected by the user check activate execute okay now we wanted three different document types right backspace and that pulls the previous values g backspace b backspace c so we want documents of type b c and g execute now let's see if sap pulls these values 
then there are so many of them right so how do we filter out uh, how do we know that sap is really pulling all these values so let's go quickly check some quotations slash o or rather let's go here go back double click v back go to technical settings and let's see of type b give me some documents okay so we have something here created on 23 march 2007 right there could be multiple documents created on that date but let's just search for 2303 2007 and it should definitely pull up this document document of document category b quotation so 2303 2007 okay go back all the way to the program execute it right we want the document to be created on 03 23 2007 so what's our format so 2307 right and then we want all different document types g b c okay so it did pull up 5001646667 and 67, right and these are quotations so the confusion that we just had was regarding checking if sap has really pulled up these quotations or just pulled up the orders it did really pull up the quotations because we wanted to restrict it by date then that's how we found out that yeah it did pull up quotations as well because on that day no orders were created if you are confused about the last few minutes, that's fine. Don't worry. SAP has just pulled in quotations, contracts, and orders for you based on this little selection box. Now, what was the intention for us? On top of this, if the user has selected quotations only, so we want to modify VB type automatically to include B. Right? So, how do you do that? So in the program, again, because it's a conditional logic, right? If the user has selected only them. So I'm going to write if P underscore quote. So the quotation parameter still exists. Is equal to X is one way of writing it or is not initial, right? Is not initial. Then, so here is what I'm going to do this select option is like an internal table think of it like a small little table in memory so it's going to have dash sign equals i i means include there are two options i and e e for exclude okay and then i'm just going to leave it at that okay and then i'm going to just say append s underscore vb type okay and if do a pretty printer okay and then check for syntax activate execute okay if i select quotations only and execute this the program goes to a dump and what does it say the in operator used in internal tables has the following structure sign option low and then high so let's go back to our program click on change and here this s underscore vb type was used in the select statement right and this select statement is the one that has failed let me explain why so when you say in s underscore vb type what sap is trying to do is so this s underscore vb type so let me write it here 
s underscore vb type because you have declared it as a selection option right is like a structure with with a set of columns like how you define a type and then you can fill it with values and what values does it take so to understand this let's just comment this for now okay and how do you comment that control comma okay now execute it and if you click execute it should run okay okay stay with me what i'm going to show you is this select statement okay i want to put a breakpoint on this select right so you have a breakpoint here now let's execute over here i'm going to give it a value document type or vb type equals b now if i hit execute and look at s underscore vb type see it's a structure right it's like a table so double click that and what are the values that you see you see that it has four parameters sign option low high and this is the value that i've put in right b so what does i and eq mean i stand for include Okay, EQ stands for equals, and this is the value that I have put in on the loop because the select option has two boxes, right? This is the low box, this is the high box, and then you have a two here, and then you have a little pop up here that where you can add more parameters. We'll see some values there. So there is a low, the left box, there is a high, the right box. I to say that we are including these values as opposed to exclude, which we're gonna look at later, right? And all these values need to be fill in for the select to be able to work based on this value, right? So we cannot just say equal to B and be done with it. We have to say what is the sign, what is the option, and then give either a low value or a high value or both, right? sign option low high okay we're done with this go back go back and let's uncomment this control dot so sign option we want this to be an equal right and then the low value will be type low equals if we select the quotation we want to pull documents of type b that's it now check this okay then activate and redo the breakpoint because we have written additional lines so we don't want the breakpoint here instead we want the breakpoint here on the select statement okay now execute let's say we want to put c orders only right execute and we should see that the select options must have all of that fulfilled all of that filled up right like s underscore vb type okay i equals c because we have put in c okay we know that that works but can we explicitly put it using the if statement meaning if i don't put anything here right and if i hit execute what is the value of that s underscore vb type double click double click all the values are blank right but what do we want if the user has selected this checkbox then we want 
the values in the in this box to default to C or B rather because we need quotations. Now let's hit execute and see if the S underscore VB type does have these values populated. Yes, it does. So who populated these values? S underscore VB type dash low. They were populated because of this if statement. If you doubt that, what you can do is go back, go back and put a breakpoint in the if statement. Now execute. Select this checkbox, click execute and the debugger should stop at that if statement. Now s underscore vb type is blank, right? Nothing here. Go back and we are right here on this line and go step by step. Okay, the arrow moved on to the next line. So vb type underscore sign is being populated now. vb type underscore option is being populated low. Then the append statement, what it does is appends the values to the internal table. Okay. So the append statement makes sense when you go to the internal tables and more on internal tables. But at this point, not to worry. So if you want to populate the select options, you would have to use append. So put whatever values you want to use and then append it to that internal table, s underscore vb type. Okay, now it's come to the select statement. By the time it comes there, if you double click this, you'll see that these values are populated. So essentially, we are dynamically populating values in a select box based on an if statement, an if statement which checks whether a particular checkbox has been selected or not, right? Now you should see that it only pulls quotations, which is not what we have entered in this box. If you put a value of B, it should pull quotations, but we didn't pull anything, but we have just enabled a checkbox which internally in the program is used to dynamically populate this select option with a value of B. Now, what did I mean by include versus exclude? It will not make sense for this field maybe, but for example, there is 5000 is our sales document. Okay, execute. Then we don't need to stop here, just execute all the way through. Okay, so for 5,000, we have four line items, right? What about 5,001? Okay, is there a 5,001? Let's see. No need to stop. We are going through. Okay, there's a 5,001. Now 5,001, 5,002, 5,010, 5,100. What if we want 5,000 all the way through Let's say 5005. Okay, 5000 all the way through 5005. We want all the documents in that number range 5000, 5001, 2, 3, 4, and then 5. Okay, now hit execute. Okay, now what does s underscore vb type have? Okay, double click. Oh, it's not s underscore vb type, right? We have modified s underscore v bell okay what does s underscore v bell have okay so it says include everything in between previously it was equals eq now it's between in between 5000 and 5005 okay execute okay 5000 5001 2 3 4 5 right if you don't want to include everything but exclude values from 5001 through 5005 double click this and do an outside range so this excludes everything between 5000 and 5005 and then pulls in everything else execute s underscore vbell double click what does it have it says 
not between right not between so earlier it was between now it's not between so there are different options here like equals between not between so on and so forth now if you execute this it will pull all the documents but it will exclude the values 5000 and 5000 1 2 3 4 5 right you want to check that you can do it doing a quick page down and you see that there is a 4095 96 97 98 99 and then it starts with 5006 but we know that 5001 5002 3 4 5 exist they've been excluded from the selection because you have explicitly asked that in a selection criteria right so this is how you get everything in between 5000 and 5005 or outside of 5001 and 5005 right so let me set that back to range and then there are other options here for example you could do single values instead of a range like this right i'm going to delete this range like so and select single values we want 5000 we want 5003 and then we want 5005 okay execute and execute okay what does s underscore we will have now double click so because i said it's an internal table you don't just search for s underscore v bell which only shows you one row instead you search for multiple rows using this square brackets just double click it and then you see that we said we need 5000 include equals 5000 include equals 5003 include equals 5005 so three different rows in that internal table this is what i meant when we use the keyword append so each of these lines one or two or three is done using an append so append this row append this row right so when we learn more about internal table operations we'll get to the keyword append for now just understand that if you want to append a row to an internal table you use the append keyword okay do we get those three different documents 5000 5003 5005 so these are some of the options that we have discussed on the select options there are many more options and um, we'll, we'll get to them as we go forward to the programs so we have seen the sign low high and option of select options okay now we're going to start with obligatory say we have a huge list of documents right so we don't really want the entire range of documents to be pulled we want to restrict it by date let's say so unless you put a date you're not going to pull the documents so how do you make this date mandatory or this is probably a better option because you have so many different document types right you don't want to pull everything but only pull up one particular kind or type or category of doc either orders or quotations or contracts right so basically you don't want to leave this field blank vb type you want the user to force to enter some value either b or c or a combination doesn't matter some value should be there so that we restrict the documents that we pull in the way to do that is by calling a field called obligatory okay o b l i g a t o r y obligatory okay do a quick syntax check activate and execute do you see this checkbox here now if i try to execute this it doesn't work it says fill in all the required fields okay if i just put in b okay now it allows me it should only pull up quotations execute execute and it should only pull up quotations 
right so this is a way force the program to pull up only a subset of these documents and we want to give a choice to the user as well so essentially we have made a field as mandatory on the screen so this is like how you sign up on google right so you got your name first name last name and then your old email phone number etc etc and in the sign up form it ensures that you have a last name right so you can't just not enter a last name so that field is mandatory so the keyword in above for that is called obligatory so when you mention obligatory to the select option or parameter it ensures that the user puts in some value before moving forward the next is default values what do i mean by default values Say for example, you want by default pull in only orders. The user can always change it. Okay. So the default value for this is C. Okay. So what it means is that this field will always be defaulted to C automatically when you execute that program. And you can of course go and remove that value or add more values like how like so you see i did not put that c in it automatically came in now that doesn't mean that i can change it i can change it to b no problem right so that's how you set default values so typically you set default values when you know that there are certain options that are almost always selected in a particular way for example, most of the time, 90% of the time, this report is only going to pull up orders and not quotations or contracts. In this case, it's a good idea to default the value to B. But you're not taking the choice away from the user because the user can always go back and change it to B or C or A or G or whatever value he likes. So that's default value. Okay, so to quickly recap, program 15 we have delved more into the select options so that's the meat of this program select options what are select options what are the different values for select options how do you manipulate the select options using the append statement and then we have seen how to make a field mandatory remember the sign up example last name is mandatory and then we have also seen how to default a value for a select option or parameter. You can do this for checkboxes as well. All right. Program number 16. Materials by user. The program is really simple. There are so many different materials, right? And each material is created by a user. All we want to do is give a choice to the user and say pull out the materials created by this user or this set of users that's it the key thing that we are going to learn here is about a concept called events so what are events so so far all the code that we have written essentially gets executed like this so the first line, second line, third line, all the way up to the 100th line, let's say. The first line executes first, and then the second line, third line, fourth line, fifth line, all the way until 100. They go in that sequence. Right? For example, there are some loops or conditional statements like if statement, else statement. So things might go in a loop like this. Or things might branch from here to here, right? But the execution does not go up unless it's a loop. It always goes top to bottom. So this is the typical paradigm that we have seen so far. But above cannot just do that. This is all good. You know, this is no doubt. This is wonderful. This, this gets a lot of things done. 
what we have been doing so far. But above does also something else called as event driven programming. So what is an event driven programming? Let me take some examples actually. So applications are typically written to interact with the user, right? Not all programs, but most programs. Examples, websites, mobile apps, or even programs like how we have been doing. User selects some data, clicks on the execute button. That's an example of an event. All along, we have been doing this, but unknowingly. So in this chapter, we're going to uncover that. So what's an event? An event is typically user driven. For example, a mouse click or a, a, an enter key. That's an example of an event. Or hit the execute button. Click on the execute button. Hit F8. These are all examples of user driven events. And not all events are user driven. By default, most events are user driven. Not all events need to be user driven. For example, when you add a friend on Facebook, right? The system responds to the event of you selecting the friend and clicking on the add button, right? That was the event and the system said, okay, add it as a friend. On top of that, Facebook does a bunch of other things. And that's all done behind the scenes without you having to do anything or trigger an event. Like prepare a list of potential friends for you, right? Based on your pattern. It does it all on its own based on some kind of logic. So in the context of ABAP programs, the execution of ABAP programs happens in a set sequence. So what kind of events are they? Well, let's start here. Right, you go and execute the program, program name and then execute. And then the screen comes up, right? So this is the first screen. So the event here is probably the start of the program itself. So once you enter your data and then click on the execute button, that's when the list of data that's being pulled shows up. So the first event was starting the program and that has triggered the selection screen and once you do and click on the execute so first event and second event has spawned off the screen where it shows you the data right now there are many other events behind the scene that we should be aware of this is not the full set of events but it covers most of the events 90 percent so load of a program for example is an event that's triggered when the program loads. As soon as you hit that execute button on the program, this is the first event that is called. And then the second event. And then third event, fourth event, fifth event. Now, all these events don't necessarily go in the order I have put it in. But they form a block of events that are related together and they go roughly about the same time. And then this is exactly where the logic starts. The logic to pull the data out of the database and then do your write statement. And then there are some other events which we're going to talk about when we get to them. But I want to show you the full list of events. So these are the list of events that are available in the standard ABAP report. The next thing I want to talk about is the non-linearity of events. Now, events are non-linear, meaning, now, not all events are non-linear, but think of most events as non-linear. Now, so each event waits for an action to be performed by the user and reacts to it. For example, look at your Comcast TV. All the channels are in there. They're right there in the wire that connects 
to your TV. But you see the channel only when you trigger that event. 335 CBS. When you trigger that event, the channel shows up on the screen. Right? The event in this case is triggering the channel on your remote. In the case of a Bob, these are the list of events, and behind each event is an event handler. And we're going to write these event handlers as we go forward, but in this chapter we're going to write one event or two events maybe but so far we have not written any of the events right we didn't specifically use any of these keywords load of program or initialization or start of selections end of selection none of these events have been used in the programs that we have written so far and they have worked okay right did anything go wrong the execute button worked fine the selection screen shows up properly and this is all because of a courtesy <laughs> SAP extends us. That courtesy is the start of selection event. This is the key event that SAP automatically puts all the code that we've written into this block. Okay? You might want to see that in action. The name of the program that we're going to write is the first version of materials by user. Click on create. Okay, we know the table is Mara and we want to search by user. So once you got the select options, all you have to do is write your select statement. Now at this point, you declare your internal tables. But let's say start with your types. Once you got the types, declare your internal tables and work area. And now we write the select statement okay that should do it so the syntax check says that uh, there is no column of type erdat let's go quickly check it double click on mara it says ersda e r s d a okay okay now it's syntactically correct Let's execute this program. Give me all the materials created by the user Hollinger. Before you execute it, we want to write it out onto the screen, right? All right, let's do a quick pretty printer. Looks like everything is okay. Activate, activate and execute so we want all the list of materials created by this user ruf so select that execute and you get all the materials created by that user now this is something we are already aware of we know how to do this so why did we write this program now remember i said there are events right and I also said that there is a default event called start of selection. Okay. Put that in there. Now let's check for syntax. So start of selection is syntactically okay. Activate it. And execute. Okay. Now let's try this. Everything works as usual. So what is the difference really? So here is the difference. <clears throat> so even though so far in the programs, we have not written this particular event explicitly, everything that's there is already put into this event by default. So SAP knows that you have not written an event, so most of it or all of it must go into this event because this is a key event so this is where we start the bulk of the program now that does not mean that the rest of the events are unimportant but this is the major event and sap knows that this is a major event and if you don't write an event explicitly like this sap puts all the code into that event by default without you having to say anything 
This is the only event that SAP forgives. Any other event must have to have an explicit handler. Now, when you write your code like this, start of selection, and then you have written a select statement, and you have written a loop to write it out. So this is the handler code. This is the event that was triggered, and this is the bit of code that handled that event. Like when you change the channel, there is a program behind the scenes on your setup box, Comcast setup box, that watches for any change of channels. And once you trigger the event, it knows the channel number that you've entered, and then it goes and fetches the data or the picture video associated with the channel and shows it on your screen. Very similar. So essentially, your ABAP code, ABAP reporting code, consists of events. And so this is the code that you want to execute when that event is triggered. And then another event, say this is event one, and this is event two. And event two has its own set of handler code. Event three, event four, event five, all the events can be handled. So you can write the handler code for all the events, some of the events, or none of the events. Now, if you don't explicitly specify an event, the default event is the start of selection. And these events have some kind of an order. Like I was saying, this event goes first, and then this event. Before, these events have a specific order. For example, event 1 always gets fired first and then event 2 gets fired. But sometimes there could be loops. For example, event 4 could get fired before event 3. Okay, So don't worry about all the logic of that. We'll slowly get to it. The point I'm trying to make is these are all the list of events that either the user can trigger based on his actions or they can be performed default by SAP like load of program or initialization. Think of it like how a TV console starts, right? Your Comcast setup box, when you click it on, it doesn't like start immediately, right? It takes a couple of seconds. And what does it do there? It checks your signal strength and probably your subscription status, the package you're subscribed to, all that stuff, right? And think of that as what happens here during the load of program or initialization. Once that is done, it shows you the list of channels. Think of this as the list of channels. And once you've chosen your channel, meaning put the data into the screen, then this is the main event that starts. Which in the case of Comcast does the job of pulling the video and showing it onto the screen. In case of a bob, crunches the numbers and writes it onto the screen. Now, load of program is almost rarely used, except for a very specific class of programs. But let's not worry about that at this point. It's very rarely used. Initialization is also rarely used, but it's something that you might want to know because it's used sometimes. You, know, you can do some things in, in initialization. And more importantly, I want to show you that there is something that you can do in, in the initialization section that you might not have been able to do so far. Let's execute this program. And here is a requirement. I want the created by to always default to the username of the program who is trying to execute that program. For example, if the user ruf is trying to execute the program, this field should default to ruf, right? And then execute, and then it pulls in only his materials or her materials. If I was executing it, whatever my user ID is, that should be pulled up onto that select option. Can I do that using, let's say, default values like? Go here and then put default 
user i can't do that the reason is the default keyword just hard codes that selection option to a particular value for example my user id is xyz this is an example check now if you execute it you'll see the value xyz here but that's about it you cannot dynamically set it based on any parameter meaning it should be a particular user id uh, like the user id of my superior or the user id of the person working in the bpo office right I, I can't dynamically change it based on who is executing it or it could be a date it need not be just created by what about created on if i had a field called created on and i want that to default to today's date right so today's date is dynamic i i can't hard code it using the default parameter so how do i do it for that you can use the initialization event which gets triggered every time the program is run but it, it gets only triggered once okay during the start of the program okay and then in initialization you can say s underscore ernam so instead of putting in default xyz which i'm going to remove i'm going to do this in the initialization section i'm going to set a value for s underscore ernam based on a dynamic parameter in this case my username and i get that username from a global variable or structure called the syst syst structure or short for sy okay if you double click sy it will take you to that structure that contains a bunch of environment variables like who is the user running the program what is the message class that has been triggered what is the time zone of the user what is the local date and time we'll we'll talk more about this variable as we go forward but for now just understand that i am dynamically trying to pull some value from somewhere in the memory and then assigning it to the low value of this select option and appending it once i do that activate execute do you see that this username is defaulted in the created by select option i did not put it in it was defaulted you can think of other examples if the user is in the us okay you can maintain a table where you can have certain set of materials or any specific data that indicates that that user is in the us and he's responsible for this set of materials and you could pull them automatically from that table and default it in the initialization section of that program the point i'm trying to make is this section right here runs once at the start of the program and you can do certain housekeeping activities things that you want to do before you show the selection screen right and the second another point you should remember is there is no end of initialization right end of no nothing like that there is no start of selection and then end start of selection no events do not have an end statement as soon as the next event line is seen the previous event handler is done with meaning it looks at this event okay and then line number 27 28 29 30 31 32 okay 33 okay 34 is another event okay that's good so up until here all this code belongs to this event right so there's no explicit stop or end for an event you don't have to write it when the next event starts this event is closed the event handler is only these set of lines for the initialization So let's summarize what we have learned in this chapter. A simple program which lists the materials by the user who have created them. 
And the key learning in this program is events. We have learned that ABAP as a programming language is event driven and we have seen an example of event. And we see that events need not be executed in a linear fashion. They could be non-linear. So one event could go before the other even though you have written that event after the second event. Also, sometimes events just stay there waiting for you to perform certain actions. And when that action is performed, like a click or, a, or an enter key button or an F8 button, the event handler kicks in and responds to that event. And we have also seen that so far in the previous programs, we did not have to write an event because the default main event, think of this like the rock star of events, and that's already written for you by default. You can explicitly write it and you should. But if you don't do anything, all the code gets placed into that event. And that's the reason why you have seen programs working so far all good without you having to explicitly write events. And then we have seen the list of events like initialization, start of selection, uh, end of selection, top of page, so on and so forth. But don't be scared with those list of events. You'll get there eventually. Just understand that there are so many events and you have to write event handlers for those events and understand when those events are getting triggered. And finally, we have seen an example of initialization. This is the one event that we have explored a bit in detail. I said initialization is an event that's only run once for every program when you execute it and it's run before you even see the selection screen. It's run at the very beginning of the execution phase of the program. And what can we do there? So one of the key things that you can do in the initialization phase is default values in the selection screen or pull some data from a table that you might lead at a later point in time. All right. So in the next program, we'll explore more events. Okay. Now we are moving on to program number 17. It's going to be the same materials by user program, but we are going to do a slight modification. So call it V2, version 2. So how do we do this program? It's almost going to be the same, except that we have a selection screen like this, right? Where you can select material. Then create it on. Create it by. Then we're going to have a little check mark here that says created by me give me all the materials that i have created the user who has logged in so if i logged in siva logs in if i click on this check mark i want to only show or i want to only see the list of materials that i have created so in this case when I click on this check mark, really all that has to happen is this has to be populated with my user, Siva, and then it has to be grayed out. Right? No further input possible. Because if it's created by me, all this field requires is my name. That's it. And if not, if this is checked off, then you remove this Siva and then reactivate this particular selection field and then based on the selection criteria you write your select statement and then issue your output so how do we do this now to understand this a little bit better i want to talk about a different take on uh, the way we have seen these events so these are the set of events that we have previously seen, right? At least in theory, we did not go through all of them. Maybe a bit about initialization, but that's about it. We didn't see all the events in this set of events. 
this is one way of looking at the events i want to present these events in a different way and here is how i'm going to do it so what is an event an event is how the user interacts with the program so i want to really take an example of how events happen in real life like how you see in your everyday world so i want to take a real simple example okay so you go to starbucks and start ordering your lattes and what right so you're the user and you go to starbucks and let's think of that transaction where you say go through a drive through in starbucks get your lattes or coffees and then get out of the drive through that's entire transaction has a particular set of sequence and a bunch of events associated with it so let's look at this from the starbucks associates perspective the person working there at that counter okay so you arrive and then let's say this is initialization what do you get first as soon as you arrive at the drive in so the person working there wishes you so it's wishing the customer that's the first step right as soon as you step in the initialization event has started and under that here is what starbucks wants the associate to do or in our case the program right we are trying to compare the events and what the associate is doing as what the program does and you as the user of that program okay you are driving through you are the user of that program okay so this is event number 1 initialization and wishing you is what happens during the initialization phase this is a simpler step okay and then what happens next at selection screen so this is your say second event okay what happens here you start asking what for what you want right think of this like a selection screen and what you do with the selection screen in a c so the first thing is line item 1 is a cafe latte and you say it's a medium and you want a croissant right heated up or not heated whatever your choices are and finally you place an order right so this is what happens as soon as the the associate wishes you so think of this like the selection screen in a bar at this point many things can happen behind the scenes and in fact they do happen so what happens behind the scenes for example at selection screen validation can happen what do i mean by validation item level validation like is the quantity okay did you order 1000 lattes well that's a trigger right so nobody orders 1000 lattes or let's say you ask for different options you want latte with soy or latte with non fat milk or with sugar with cream different kinds of options you know maybe a hazelnut maybe a pumpkin spice you know what i mean right so different options can be validated maybe not all combinations are possible right so i'm just going to put the things down here quantity can be validated options like non fat fat so on and so forth and then totals right is the total proper no confusion there so on and so forth now during this entire process you can change your order meaning you might say well i don't need a croissant so the croissant needs to be eliminated means needs to be removed right so user can change the quantity user can delete stuff he doesn't need it's a dynamic process right say for example there's a combo and the user might wants to remove some of the stuff from that combo or maybe add more to the combo in cases like that the system has to validate whether the combo is valid or not you don't want to offer anything and everything in a combo right i'm just giving you an example so say user drops the croissant okay user drops the croissant is a simple example and what happens there on the screen the croissant needs to be removed right from the selection screen the croissant needs to be removed but you know that in sap the about program 
what you see in the selection screen is basically parameters or select options. And they are kind of hard coded there, right, in the code. Say if you look at the version 1 of the program, these are our select options, meaning what we present to the user for selecting uh, the data from the report. And these are standard. These are almost hard coded. Right? In the program, they are hard coded and you can't change it dynamically. Meaning, this is material, this is who has created it. At runtime, during execution of, of this report, can you add another parameter? or gray out this parameter under certain conditions see that's not possible typically at least not so far but what if you want to do it like the example that we have taken is a starbucks ordering screen and then the user keeps entering stuff and he can delete things as well meaning i don't want the croissant uh, just put in something else so the selection screen has some inbuilt options like it goes out with a default but it can be customized depending on the way the user interacts with the program in this case the starbucks associate so the ordering selection screen kind of changes okay i'm trying to compare the selection screen in the bob report with the ordering screen on the starbucks associates computer okay in order for this to happen, in order for the selection screen to change dynamically, there is another event called at selections screen output. And then you can do some validations or modifications there. Then the selection screen shows up again. Think of this as the selection screen and it shows up again. Now, why am I taking this detour instead of going down why am i taking this detour like like a loop because over here we have to understand a concept called pbo and pai so pbo stands for process before output and pai stands for process after input now pbo is a, an event that's triggered before the user is presented with a screen PAI is something that happens after the user is presented with the screen and then the user interacts with it. Okay, so let's say this is the screen, this is the selection screen and the user is presented with a list of options like, you know, these are what you can choose from and then choose from there. But as we keep ordering, there could be more dynamic variations depending on the interaction, like I want this, I don't want that. In which case, the screen needs to be redrawn. It needs to be rewritten. It needs to be changed. The selection screen. And in order for things to change, SAP has to run some code and then represent that selection screen again. Before that selection screen is shown, PBO is what is triggered. And once the user interacts with it, there could be some things that can be done in the PAI things. So validation, for example. PAI event, meaning it's a process after input. So the user has given us some input saying he wants a cafe latte or a croissant. And we can do something at that point saying that the user has given an input. And that's why it's called after input. The user has given us some input. Now process it. PBO, on the other hand, is something that triggers before so the b is before a is after before the screen presents itself so this is a pbo event and that goes in a loop it gets triggered again and again and again well we'll come to that in a bit but i just want to explain the idea of pbo and pai okay so once this loop is done we are happy with what the user wants now it's time for us to deliver the actual goods meaning the customer has asked us for coffee latte croissant so on and so forth we have locked that down place the order now it's time for us to work on that order meaning this is where the select statements come in and the write statements come in 
right so we move on to the next event which is start start of selection so it takes over from where we have left in the previous slide start of selection is where we start to do our coffee we start to brew coffee we start to pour the coffee into the cup we, we heat up the croissant all the stuff that is needed to deliver what the user has asked for in the selection screen right so this is the delivery in terms of above this is where you do your write statements this is where you do your select statements any kind of logic that's used to give the customer what he wants okay and then there is an end of selection as well which we don't use all that often but this is really a key event start of selection and then after that we just go to the delivery window and then give it to the customer right at that point you can do some other stuff as well like the customer might ask for additional sugar right things that we do on the fly uh, without having to bother too much about what's there in the selection screen you don't have to really ask the user to go back to the selection screen to give additional sugar right or ketchup so after that there are two more events called top of page and end of page so in a multi page report like you know 10 pages 20 pages it makes sense that on every page there is something that we can write on the top and there's something that we can write on the bottom like a title page number so on and so forth every time the user sees or scrolls down and hits the top of a page this event is triggered and this is triggered at the end of a page so this gets done by default the user does not have to do anything he just has to scroll down okay and all these events happen in a particular order meaning initialization happens first and then the other selection screen events everything else happens first and at the very end the top of page and end of page happens right for example putting it in the context of starbucks you don't go to the delivery window or the user does not go to the delivery window directly without having to order and pay first right so things go in a particular sequence but sometimes like the ordering screen itself things go in a loop like the user can keep ordering keep changing until he is satisfied with that order right like how we want to modify our selection screen and and whenever a screen shows up before that screen is shown the pbo event is triggered and after the screen is shown the pai event is triggered so now with this background um, i don't want to really talk about all the events in one program so we have already talked a little bit about initialization in the previous program right the version 1 in version 2 this program where we're going to include an additional flag and gray this out we're going to talk about two more events okay and let's see how we can achieve this functionality by the use of those events so this is version 1 of our program and now we're going to copy this and create the second version which gives us a little more flexibility v2 okay copy that local object and let's start with the select options first so what did we need material we already have that created on i think is not there so we need to add this created by is already there right and then we need a check mark so these things can be done with select options this is a parameter so material number is already there we've just added the date the name is already there and finally we need the check box so i've just made two changes added the date and added a check box as a parameter right so let's go and put some text in there so that it 
looks good. So everything is based on uh, the dictionary. The other one, the, the, the created is still not visible, right? So let's save it. Activate it. Okay, everything is good. Okay, now let's go there and put in our text created by. Okay, save, activate. Activate. Execute. Okay. So this looks more like it. You got the material, you got the created on, you got created by, and you have created by me flag. Let's change this text as created by me. Okay. So go back and call this created by me. So as soon as the checkbox is selected, only the materials created by that user needs to be pulled up. Let's try that again. Activate. Execute. Okay. Now, as soon as this checkbox is clicked on, what needs to happen is this field needs to be populated with the current user, whatever my user ID is, and it needs to be grayed out. How do you do that? So that was one of the requirement, right? Another requirement could be, let's say I put some user okay jf some random user it's not even there in the system and hit enter okay execute what happens nothing happens but that's not the correct system reaction right if i put something that's not valid tell me that it's not valid don't just don't just stay there right give me a message give me something give me an indication that something is wrong now, this is our second requirement. So, we have two requirements. The first requirement is to ensure that when created by me is checked on, some fields are automatically populated and things are grayed out. The second requirement is if I enter an invalid user, I want the system to react and say, this is not a valid user. Hey, go back and check your user. Right? Okay. All right. So at this point, we don't need the initialization. So I'm going to remove that. And we're going to start with the second requirement first, which is everything is as it is. Now, when I click on this button or radio button, this created by field should be populated with my current username, right? How do you do that? Now, graying out a particular selection screen is a visual parameter that, that changes the way that particular select option is being displayed. So, that is a PBO event, meaning process before output. The screen is getting changed. Essentially, we are talking about this step, this little loop here. Okay. So, there are some things that need not change the selection screen's visual look and feel. And that can be done using PAI events, which we are going to talk about in the second requirement. But the first requirement changes the way a particular field looks. It's which we want it to be grayed out. So that can be achieved using this loop that is basically a PBO event, which gets triggered for every single screen as soon as the user hits enter. So what I want to do is, I want to write this at selection screen output, just a blank event, okay, and then fire up a message and see whether that event is really being triggered, okay. So at selection screen output, then what I'm going to do is message PBO process before output type I. It's an informational message. Okay, save it, check for syntax, looks okay, activate, okay, execute. You see that the PBO message comes up, okay, I click okay, that's being done once, okay. Now, I'm not doing anything 
I'm just hitting enter. I'm just hitting enter. This gets triggered once. Okay. Enter gets triggered again. So anytime the user interacts with the, the screen, automatically that PBO event is triggered. That, that was the loop that I was talking about. Okay. I click on this, hit enter, it triggers. Right. But if I do a selection here, like so, is it getting triggered? No, it's not. But when I hit enter, it's triggered again. Okay. So enter is our thing. Okay. Even if you hit execute, that PBO event will not be triggered. If you want to try it, let me try some user like so. Okay. And then hit execute. See that that message does not come up. That means if when you hit execute or do some selections, your PBO is not triggered. But when you hit enter, just the written button on your keyboard, the PBO event is selected. Right? Or, for example, when you hit execute and then you find the results are okay, you go back, the selection screen is shown again. Right? And then, right before that selection screen is shown or right after that, the PBO event is triggered and you see that message. Right? Just before the system paints the selection screen, the PBO event is triggered. Now, at that point, what I want to do is check if this checkbox created by me is checked on. And if yes, just populate my username, the current username, and then gray out this entire select option. How can I do that? Let's just figure out if this little checkbox is on or not. Okay, let's start there first. So here is what I want to do. I want to loop at screen, of course, end loop. So looping at the screen essentially goes through all the screen elements. Okay, and over here, I want to say, okay, let's remove this message. And then what I'm going to do is, loop at screen okay loop at screen and then end loop what it does is every time this at selection screen output is hit when the user hits enter the loop at screen loops through all the elements on the screen how many elements are there there are four different elements right Material number, material name, material user created by, and then the checkbox, four different screen elements. So this loop goes through all the different elements on the screen. And in that, we don't want to react to every enter. We want to react only when the user has clicked on the checkbox, which is this little guy, P underscore CRTD. Okay, so if p underscore crtd is not initial, meaning somebody has done something on it, meaning clicked on the checkbox, and then I want to just end that loop and just put an end if there, just do a pretty printer as well. Okay, and over here I want to write the logic. What logic do I want to write? As soon as the user clicks on that checkbox, as soon as the user clicks on this checkbox, this guy should be deactivated and then populated with the current username. So in order to do that, first we have to do something called as modif ID or modifier ID. Okay. What it does is it assigns a unique ID to this screen element that can be referenced in that loop. You can just say CRT, okay, just three character CRT created by or CRB created by, okay. And that is used essentially to identify that particular screen element in that screen loop, okay. So when this checkbox is checked on, if, and before we do that, what we wanted to do was for the screen name, 
modif id okay created by okay crb just don't do quotations so crb modif id crb okay over here what we want to do is in the if statement if screen because we are looping on the screen right screen dash group one we're going to talk about it okay equals crb then i just want to put a message okay message test type i and if okay what's really happening here so loop at the screen so this loops at all the screen elements four of them and inside that i'm checking i don't want to react to all the enters right every time the user hits enter i don't want to react to it but only when the created by box is not initial checkbox meaning the user has clicked on that created by me checkbox then i don't want to worry about all the fields but instead only focus on the screen for the username and i identify that with this modifier id that's the use of this modifier id okay it's a three character id if screen dot group 1 i'm not saying screen dash modifier id i'm saying screen dash group 1 now screen is again a dynamic structure that's available to you when the program runs so double click on screen yeah save it I'm just double click on the screen parameter you'll see that there are so many components in the structure screen structure is like a type right types begin off something and then you put some parameters and then close the type it's basically a structure and the structure has these components group 1 group 2 group 3 group 4 which don't make a lot of sense but what these are are basically attributes of the selection screen for example input is a parameter that is associated with a screen element that you can use to activate or deactivate if you say screen dash input equals 0 then that screen will be deactivated okay we'll we'll look at it in a moment for now i'm just putting a message okay which will only be triggered every time the user hits why because it's written at selection screen output okay and we got to loop through all the screen elements because it's triggered for every screen element and underneath that we don't want to react to everything we only want to react when the check box is clicked on and underneath that we don't we are not bothered about all the fields but we are only bothered about the screen element with a modifier id of crb which is the created by and then we are not going to do anything just put a message okay let's execute this okay hit enter hit enter nothing happens right any number of times you hit enter nothing happens just click this on and hit enter you see this message right why is that why do you see this message only when this is clicked on if you click this off and hit enter nothing happens why because you have really put a tight loop in there and said only if p underscore crtd is not initial meaning when that parameter for checkbox is not clicked on react to the user input otherwise don't react okay so you have essentially narrowed down the choice of what you want to do in the pbo process before output okay which is triggered in that loop every time the user hits enter now inside this little loop let's just populate the username in the select option for arnav okay and how do you do that we've already seen that in the initialization section of the previous program so you got to look at the low you got to look at the option because it's a select option right if it were a parameter you can just say dash equals 
parameter p underscore something equals a psi dash u name, which is the username of, of me, the running the program or whoever runs the program. But because it's a select option, we got to go and say s underscore ernam dash low equals psi dash u name. Right, this is what we want to do. Because it's a screen option, we got to give it a sign. We got to do an option saying it's equal to. And in the low value, we're going to put a psi u name. Right? So let's see if this works. Enter. Hit enter. Nothing's going to happen because we have restricted it. Check it on. Check it on, and you see that my user ID, the current user ID that I'm using, is populated here because it's coming from psi dash u name, a global variable. It's always going to contain my username. The person who has logged my username. In this case, I'm logged in, so my username. If you're logged in, your username. Right? So that took care of most of the first requirement, except graying it out right we want to gray it out really we don't want it to be uh, manipulated by the user anymore because he has said because the user has made a choice by clicking this on and said give me only the things that i have created right and how do you do that okay we also say screen dash input equals zero okay and append screen and in order to do that here is what you have to do screen dash input equals zero so if you make the input value as zero essentially it grays out that screen element only that particular screen element because you have already filtered it by saying if screen group equals crb right so within that if statement we are saying screen input equals zero and then modify screen right just like the append screen okay now hit enter nothing should happen but as soon as you click on this see that the user name of the currently logged in user is populated and it's grayed out right so we have essentially achieved the first requirement the second requirement was if the user enters something on this screen element created by some junk user i should validate it how do i do that in order to do it i don't need a pbo event i need a pai event because i'm not going to really uh, change the way the screen looks I'm just going to take the input from the user based on what he has entered on the screen in the selection screen and then check whether that user really exists or not okay so you could do that in at selection screen okay at selection screen now you see there are so many different events here at selection screen output and then I said there is no end of at selection screen output it just is these lines in that block and then because i have used because i have entered another event at selection screen this event ends here only the lines that are highlighted are part of this selection screen output now whatever i write underneath this are all part of at selection screen until the next event starts okay so events do not have an end event instead when the next event starts the block ends the block ends okay what do you want to do here at selection screen so here is what i'm going to do if s underscore erram is not initial meaning that created by field is not filled in i want to just output a message Okay, let's see if that works. Execute and then hit enter any number of times or 
hit the execute button nothing happens right but i just put in some stuff okay like test okay hit enter or let me put in some junk you know some junk hit enter it throws that message in meaning that event is triggered at selection screen let me try to execute it okay still it's triggered right so my pai or process after input event called at selection screen is triggered whenever i hit enter on the selection screen or i hit execute on the selection screen either way that event is triggered and i know that because in that event i just put a message that's only triggered when s underscore ernam this guy is not initial meaning the user has put in something in the created by field and only then this message is triggered right so i now know when that event is triggered okay and it's a pai event process after input i don't need the message there instead i want to do a select statement right so where do users exist in the system which database contains the list of users it's available in many tables but one of the tables is usr02 okay so if you hit enter and put in the user in this case my user you should see a row over there right so what i'm going to do here is if the user has put in some user id then i want to do this select statement on this table user02 and the user name is b name right i don't really want to create an internal table here just for this line so i'm going to add it to the tables section user02 then i'm going to say select single star from user02 where b name in s underscore erna so here is what i'm going to do so this is select single what select single does is it only outputs one row keyword single makes all the difference in that select statement if you don't write single then you have to put an end select and all that stuff right in this case i'm not bothered about it because select single is only going to return one row the first row if there are more rows based on the where condition then the first row is returned that's it so it's basically used to check whether an entry exists in a table you're not really interested in the contents of that row but you're only interested in finding out whether that user id exists or not if somebody enters a invalid material whether that material exists or not can be found out using the select single statement then over here what we have is sy sub rc is not equal to 0 Well, so far we have seen equal to zero. Equal to zero means it's a success. The select single has succeeded in returning one row, meaning the data exists in that table. The user already exists in that table. But we are not bothered about that situation. We are bothered about the situation where the user already does not exist in that table. In which case we want to throw a message. So it's not an equals to. but a not equal to right the not equal to is like this two angular brackets facing each other so if sy sub rc not equal 0 meaning it has returned a non zero value which indicates that that select statement has failed and that failure means that that row for that user does not exist then issue a message typically this is an error message so let's do an error message like like so okay and then do an end if let's see if everything is okay looks okay activate it okay now execute now hit enter any number of times nothing happens now i want to put in a dummy user okay hit enter or execute what happens you see the message there user not found and it's a error message right 
system would not allow you to proceed forward. But if I put in, say, a valid user, which is my user ID, and hit enter, right, or execute, that error does not come up. If you put in a valid user who has created materials already, like so, hit execute or hit enter, the screen is validated, that material does exist, that user does exist in the USR02 table, and then the list of materials created by that user is shown here. Right? So that takes care of the second requirement. So we have talked about two events in this program. This is the first event or the event block and this is the actual event at selection screen output. I said this is a PBO process before output. So any kind of screen manipulations that you want like um, you know, the screen should be grayed out, screen element should be removed, or a new screen element should be added, or hidden screen element should be unhidden, that kind of stuff. The example that we have seen is the user clicks on the created checkbox, populate the currently logged in user ID into the created by field, and then gray it out using the field screen dash input equals zero. Now, don't worry about screen input. If you don't understand it, that's fine. I want you to focus on the event itself. Okay, this is the event at selection screen output. Now, the second event is at selection screen itself, which is a PAI process after input event, which is essentially useful for validations. Right? The example that we have seen is whether a particular user ID exists in the system or not. We don't want the user to enter some junk data and then go into the select statement and start pulling in data and then find out later that this user ID does not exist. Instead, right before starting off your main select statement to fetch the data for all the materials created by this user, first validate if that user ID is really valid or not. And we did that by using a select single from the user02 table. And if the select did not bring in any values, just output a message of type error. Error indicating that there's, there's something wrong with your select options, you know. Just go check it, right? Sometimes we could throw out informational messages like, hey, this is what you selected. Now I'm going ahead with your selection. That's an informational message. Error messages, typically on the other hand, are used to stop the user from doing it, mostly because the user has selected wrong data. Either way, the focus of this program is to understand two things, PAI versus PBO. And we have seen one example of each of these events, PBO event, PAI event. In the previous program, we have seen two different kinds of events at selection screen and at selection screen output. And this program was basically a second version of program number 16. Let's not even call it 17, let's call it 16. Let's call it 16A. And then in this program, let's call this 16B we are going to look at one more event, which is at selection screen on field, which is focusing the at selection screen on a specific field. And then two more events, which are top of page, end of page. Between these events, we are almost covering 80% of all the events in a classic report. So let's start to define our business problem. So in the previous version of the program, we had three fields in the selection criteria, right? Material, created on, 
created by then a little check mark over here so the logic that we have written against this check mark is if it is checked on then we wanted to populate this with the current user right and then gray it out and that was done at selection screen output and we have said that this is a PBO process before output so basically anytime you want to do some changes to the visual appearance of the selection screen like gray things out hide things show things we use this output but most of the time it's validations on the screen element so you're not going to gray out things instead you're going to validate whether the user has input the right data or not. We have seen one example of that. And that is, if the user has entered a wrong data, like a wrong user ID, right? What do we want to do? We want to check against the database and then verify whether that user is right or not. And the event we have used for that is at selection screen. So at selection screen output, this is a PBO. At selection screen is a PAI, process after input. Things that you do after the user enters some stuff. Now, at selection screen is a generic event whereby you can check for all the fields. If you look at the system reaction, say I enter a junk user, right? Some user and hit enter. What happens? You get a message saying user not found. And when that happens, all the fields are open for input, meaning you can enter any stuff that you want here. No problem. However, in some cases, you don't want that to happen. You only want that particular screen element to be available for input and the rest of them should be grayed out because you want the user to enter that first and then take care of the rest of the elements. For example, what if we want to put a check on the material field that says, unless you enter a malid material, I'm not even going to bother if you're going to enter something in the created by field or the created on field. I want you to enter a valid material first. Rest is all dependent on the material. I don't care. One good example of this is plant and storage location. For example, I have a plant in Sunnyvale, California and a storage location in Fremont and maybe San Jose, right? Two storage locations, one plant. You would not want to select a storage location first and then select a plant. It's the other way around. The parent first, and then you select the child after you select the parent. Right? So there is a plant. That's the chimney. <laughs> and then there are, let's say, two plants, three plants, and number of plants. And each plant is associated with a storage location or more than one storage location. Assume that for our purpose, the user has to select both the plant and the storage location in order to find out the stock associated with that storage location. Now, you don't want to give the choice of selecting the storage location and then the plant. You would rather want to go this way. Right? So, you make the plant as mandatory. Right? And then, once that is selected, you let the user choose a storage location. Because that way it's easier because if you want to search for this plant and then this storage location, that's not a valid combination, right? So you're just trying to keep tabs on what the user is entering. Just don't want the user to go wild. Now, if the user enters a wrong value in the plant, right, junk value, then I don't even want the rest of the fields to be enabled for input. I want them all gone, grayed out. Finish this job first, select your parent. Once that is valid, then I'll take you to the next step. Right? So how do we do that? 
we do that with a, an event called let me put it here an event called at selection screen on field in this case material okay so that's the first requirement let's go solve it so here is what we're going to do we're going to copy the version 2 and say version 3 okay copy everything local object as usual and change right so what do we want to do we want to ensure that when the material number is wrongly entered just gray out the rest of the stuff first let the user get the material right okay so instead of an at selection screen what i'm going to do is well i'm going to let that remain path at selection screen on a particular field in this case the material number selection right and here i'm going to write that select clause that validates whether the user has entered the right material if not force him to do it okay so essentially it's a select statement specifically a select single from mara check that the material exists if it does we're good to go if not throw an error message so how do i do that this is simple right first check if the material has been entered by the user and then select from mara where the material is that material that user has entered if nothing gets returned meaning say sub rc is not zero which means the select has failed issue a message saying the material is invalid right so look at this section which is a generic at selection screen where any field can be validated versus this section where you are specifically validating one of the input fields which is the material number selection criteria right this is the name of the user who has created it and this is the material itself so let's execute and see what's the difference between these two so in the previous case if we entered a junk value sap throws an error and says user not found right now what if the user enters a junk material okay hit enter do you see the difference now it does say that the material is invalid as an error message but you see the rest of the fields are grayed out meaning enter that material first correctly let's say m01 is a proper material we know that hit enter and the rest of the fields go from gray to being enabled so this is the difference between at selection screen event the generic event versus at selection screen on a particular field all right so that was one of the requirements and the second requirement is if there are a ton of materials right like so i've just executed a blank search a wildcard search and it has so many rows right you see that the list goes on and on and on there are so many different materials now this is not a very pretty looking report right it's just a list that goes on and on and on what if you want to print it or what if you want to view it in a better way you need some kind of a pagination right in order to do that you need to have a nice title on the page and then every 30 lines or 40 lines you need to put up a footer uh, that says you know something about that report maybe in the header either way the point being uh, you need some kind of a pagination you just don't want it to run for 100 pages without breaks in between so that's where the top of the page event comes in okay so i'm going to write this at the very bottom because the key criteria are the selections and selection screens and outputs and top of the page and bottom of the page or end of page are events that get triggered once all the data is pulled in and ready to be displayed okay so when it's time to start writing stuff onto the screen after you select so that's when you would want all this stuff to kick in right 
So let this loop stay where it is. But when it's top of the page, when it's ready to go, the first, but when there is pagination, this is how it should work. Top of page, this is the event, it's a separate event, right? And then I want to write a line at the very beginning, right? Like, like so. And then let's give it a nice color. Okay, we're giving it a color. Let's see what happens. Execute, execute. And you get a title here, right? Material list by user. But you already have a program title. Now, the program title could be different from what you want to put on the top of the page, right? You can have multiple lines in the top of the page even. Meaning, a page header could, could be three lines. But a title is just one line. So, we don't want both the title and the top of the page event to be triggered all the time. So, what I'm going to do is remove the printing of this particular line which is the title of the program itself okay so how do I do that I do that at the very beginning like by saying no standard page heading right everything is right there Okay, let's execute this again and see if the title is gone. Right, so your title and the underline right below that is gone. Now you just got the top of the page, something that prints at the very beginning of the report. Now you don't see that anywhere at the bottom, right? It's all scrolling down as one huge list. But we want to like kind of separate it into you know blocks of 30 or 40 lines so that on every page that it prints, uh, you want to have some kind of header and footer information. So in order to do that, the first thing that you have to do is, you have to define the size of that block. How many lines is one block for me after which I want to print or reprint the information on the header. And that is defined as a, as a global parameter at the very beginning of the report like how we just did. So right before this, I'm going to say line count. Okay. And then let's say each block is 30 lines. Okay. Save this guy. And execute it. Okay. Do you see that? Do you see the difference now? The title gets printed every 30 or so lines. Right. Now, so the advantage of this is when this list is printed on paper, huge list, every now and then you have a reminder of what this whole report is all about. So this is a report of material list by user. Now similarly, you can have a footer. You can put some information on the footer. Like what? Now you can also do something else on the top of the line. Like put the header information, right? So when you execute this, um, you have a line on the header, but you don't know what those columns are, right? The first column is material, the second column is created by, created on, so on and so forth. But there's no indication of that, right? So what I'm going to do is just make it pretty and put some headers. So first, let's start with an underline. And the syntax for that is uline, underline. Then I'm going to use a couple of write statements to write down the header. Okay. So what I've done here, I've put a line right underneath that title and the column headers. So these get repeated every 30 lines so that you know what are the columns that you're looking at. And then another underline. Now let's execute this and see how it looks. This looks a little more pretty, right? And then more information. So the more you scroll down and every 30 lines, you get to see that title and uh, the column titles as well. So that way you know that this is the material. This is the created by user ID and when it was created on. So irrespective of 
whether you are on the first page or the hundredth page, you know most of the basic information. On the same lines, you might also want to put something at the bottom of the page, every page, every 30 lines, right? Like so, end of page, end of page. And then what do you want to write here? Maybe put some disclaimer like, okay, so this is our disclaimer. Materials flagged for deletion are not displayed. Okay, so we just want to emphasize that and make sure that the user understands that flagged for deletion materials or in simple words, materials that are going to be deleted in one day, 10 days, 100 days that are flagged for deletion are not going to be displayed. That logic is not there in our program yet, but we can build it in, no problem, as long as we identify the flag that identifies that material has been or is going to be deleted, we can very well incorporate that into our select statement. Now, assuming that's an important piece of information, we want that to be on the footer of every page, just like we have the titles and the column headings on every page header. Okay, let's see this. When I execute this, I don't see it in the footer, right? The star, star, materials, flag for deletion are not displayed. I don't see that in the footer on the first page. And neither do I see it on the second page. Why is that? The reason is, we haven't declared a footer. We haven't identified the footer yet. At this point, the footer is non-existent. In order for that to exist, you have to also declare how many lines of gap do you want to leave for the footer. In this case, I'm leaving two lines. So I, I do that by putting a parenthesis and then the number of lines I want to leave for the footer, close the parenthesis right by the line count. Okay, now let's execute this. Do you see that? Materials flagged for deletion or not. Something that we want to put in the header, it's right there. Now, this is two lines. Now, if we don't want two lines, we can very well say just one line so that you don't want to really waste your screen real estate or print real estate. And this is more like it, right? So, and it's displayed in yellow so that it, it, it pops out. If you want the user to really know that these are materials that are not flagged for deletion or any other warning that you want to give to the user or like a disclaimer, right? So if this gets printed, so every now and then you have a top of page and bottom of the page event and a page is defined by a line count that you define at the very beginning of the report. So we've already seen um, add selection screen, add selection screen output. In the previous program and in this program we have seen add selection screen on a particular field we have seen why you would want to do that as opposed to a generic add selection screen both are PA events but they react differently and we have also seen that in a big report that spans tens or hundreds of pages when you have so many different columns, you would want the header and footer information to repeat every 20, 30, 40 lines so that the user looking at that big scroll of materials knows what the headers are and any disclaimer or extra information that you want to put in the footer. In order to achieve this, there are two more events called top of page and end of page so if you include the start of selection event like i said we have covered 80 percent of all the events start of selection add selection screen add selection screen output add selection screen on a particular field top of page end of page there are some more specifically around the add selection screen but we don't care about them at this point between these events, one, two, three, four, 
five, six between these events, and of course, seven is initialization. Load of program is something that we don't care about because it's rarely used. So these seven events cover almost 80% of all the key events in a classic report. 